May all that you stand for and that we stand for be preserved under the providence of God for the happiness of mankind. The trouble is caused by unthinking people who carelessly throw away ageless ideals as if they were old and outworn machines. But it is the values of individual liberty, equality before the law and the supremacy of people over the state to which we can always with confidence return as a powerful and uniting force. Australia is not a secular country. It is a free country. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Good Source election special. We're calling this Freedom Speaks. It's been three years since Scott Morrison won that election miracle victory that uh, was so-called uh, three years ago, and by all accounts, he was not expected to win, and it did look like he came from the impossible to deliver a government for his Liberal Party. But a lot has happened in that last three years, and... Uh, I think most people watching this show of the freedom in inclination would uh, be a little bit disappointed in what Scott Morrison didn't do, failed to do, promised and didn't do, as well as a whole lot of stuff that he did do. Um, so joining me tonight is uh, three fantastic representatives from uh, some of the main freedom parties. There's been a lot of freedom parties contest, and unfortunately, I don't have that many stools in my studio. Um, but uh, tonight we're going to talk to as many as we can, high-profile people. Later in the show, we've got Jared Rennick coming. Uh, we've got Alex Antic. We've got Campbell Newman. Uh, we've got Gideon Rosner from the IPA and Spectator TV coming. Uh, there's a lot of people who are going to be joining us throughout the night. Um, standing by to join us any minute is Alexandra Marshall, Ellie Melly, um, and that's going to be a lot of fun to uh, have a chat to her and see how things are, are going in her neck of the woods. Um, we want to have a look between now and when the figures really start rolling in, maybe in about an hour, uh, we want to have a chat about, I guess, the general philosophies and what should happen, uh, what we'd like to happen, what we predict is going to happen, and what has brought us to this point over the last three years. But let me start by introducing the panel. Immediately to my left is George Christensen, uh, well known to many of you, of course. George, welcome to Freedom Speaks. Thank you very much, David. It's good to be here. Uh, hopefully getting a win for freedom tonight because um, the country desperately needs it uh, yeah. after the last two years of absolute oppression. And I'll come back to you in just a second, but uh, let me introduce the rest of the panel as well. Uh, further to my left, John Humphreys. Um, John, uh, there's so many claims to fame for you. I, I've done a, a great interview with you, mostly because of the guest, not the interviewer. Um, and I want to do a lot more, but you're a lecturer in economics as well as the founder of the Liberal Democrat Party. Um, so thank you for doing that. Um, more important and necessary than ever. Back when I was a young man, yeah. much younger today. Well, today. welcome to um, Freedom Speaks. And Rob McMullen, candidate for Griffith for the United Australia Party. That's right. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Um, you know, huge issues around freedom in the last two years, and it's always an interesting question, to what degree does freedom scale? And how much are people interest, into it? So yep. I think this election is going to show us how much that. of the people value freedom. Rob, you've been out campaigning, obviously, all day today, um, handing out how to vote cards at the various booths around. Um, I guess allowing for the candidate disease of uh, extreme optimism. Um, how did it feel to you today? How were the voters um, going in, in taking you how to vote cards? Any kind of gut feeling on... Look, I was trying to be as empirical as I can. And uh, I think in the seat of Griffiths, very Labor green. You know, yeah. The Greens are polling it as their most winnable seat in the country. I could definitely see that support there. But what we found is um, people would make a beeline for the yellow. They loved it. They're like, yep, love what you're doing, following you, love all the guys, the party's great. So we had that some real gems just come in, really fervent supporters. Um, I think at the end of the day, I'll be able to take credit for helping a huge swing towards freedom parties, mm -hmm. uh, parties for Griffith. And I think I think that's the most likely outcome. And that even whoever gets in is going to have to take notice of that swing. And I'll be very proud of that. Yep. Could, could I ask Rob a question? Do you, do you, I mean, the, the mood on the booths, did you think that the Greens were out polling Labor in Griffith or was it evens or a bit less? It was hard to say. Look, I... I'm putting in a good show, though. 
they're putting in a good show. I think um, I think it's green. I yeah. think wow. I think they had so, the uh, the so, largest support, especially so, the volunteers. So if there was a significant number of the pro freedom crowd that were drifting towards United Australia Party in that electorate, did you have numbers on your how to vote cards, or was it um, blank like I saw in other? Yeah, we had numbers, yeah. You had numbers, yeah. Were the Greens below Labor? Last. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So, you know, the UAP yeah. could stop I, the Greens from, from getting that quite seat. Possibly. And you know what? Yeah. I'd, be, I'd be proud of that. Yeah. No, that's good. Yeah. And i got to say about the, the rise of the freedom vote, I think it's, it's quite likely now that the freedom vote is big enough for a Senate seat across each state and potentially two in Queensland, just on the, on the back of Pauline's personal popularity as well. I really hope so. I actually believe it's possible to the, block out the Greens in Queensland. Well, I don't know if it'll block the Greens. I, I think the when the Greens started consistently winning a seat so you uh, think it'll across the board, uh, well, hear me out, when the Greens started consistently winning a seat, they primarily did it at the expense of Labor's number three. Mm -hmm. It's now extremely rare for Labor to get a third person up because the left gets three, the right generally gets three, uh, and the left used to be three Labor, and now it's two Labor, one Green. That's just the norm. Yep. Right. So the Liberals or the coalition still consistently get three. I think what we could be seeing now is a shake up of a similar proportion uh, on the, let's call it the right for lack of a better word. Um, sure. Where you get uh, Liberals normally getting two. The issue for me, I don't know, we're going to see it later tonight because the Senate results come in uh, a bit later than the rest. Uh, but it'll be really interesting to see whether those preferences flow tightly enough. And we won't even see that tonight, actually, but whether the preferences flow mm. tightly enough uh, to actually lock in a freedom candidate. Uh, across all of the states. So, so we could easily see a seven-person crossbench that's freedom-friendly, which would be a, a great scenario. Of course, even greater if uh, six of them are Lib Dems. Yep. But um, uh, either way, it would be a great step forward. I'm just it would be fascinating to see if those preferences are tightly enough swapped. And if everyone's watched Topher's Marble video. Yeah, John, yeah. what I want to hear from you is what can we expect tonight? What should we hope to know tonight about the Senate? Yes, yeah, so the, the preferences are going to be... Uh, and imponderable for tonight. We're going to have to just guess at that. Right. Um, there's going to be some things when the Senate results start coming in, which is going to be a bit later. So we'll start getting the House results uh, probably around seven, I'm guessing, substantive uh, House results. Yep. Uh, and we can extrapolate that a little bit for the Senate because we've got so many people uh, running for the Freedom Friendly Minor Parties in the House. So you can extrapolate that reasonably well. Um, of course, a lot of people vote differently in the Senate, so you have to make some adjustments. But we're not going to see the preference flows in the Senate, but we will see enough to rule some options in and out. Yeah. So we, we will, if, if votes are too low, we just know that preferences can't get you there. Yeah. Hey, um, could I jump in and just say something very early? Can I come case? back to you? Yes, yes, you can. Uh, I just wanted to do a bit of housekeeping. We've got Alice McCabe got an important comment here. This show, already more honest than Channel 7 or Sky. They don't even recognise you guys, but the teals matter to them big time. <laughs> this is Freedom Speaks. Uh, you're watching The Good Source on uh, various channels. Um, welcome wherever you are. Uh, thank you very much to George for sharing your Facebook channel with us tonight to reach a lot of people. Um, my co-hosts tonight are George Christensen, um, Rob McMullen, and uh, in the middle of the two gentlemen, John Humphreys with a P-H-E-R-E-Y-S. <laughs> because I always spell it wrong, I have to uh, now do penance for that of some sort. Uh, if you would like to join the conversation, we would like to show your comments on the screen. So please do join the conversation. You can be chatting amongst yourselves and... Um, we might ignore the comments for a little while and then come back and show some of the perlers. Uh, so that's uh, that's really great. Please invite your friends and uh, let them know. The lying harlot media has betrayed you for too long. It's time to dilute them by switching to the Freedom Channel. Um, this is where Freedom is speaking tonight. George, what did you have? Well, just a, an early one, and I don't know really this uh, means a great deal, but um, I was speaking with um, Joel Fitzgibbons or texting him, uh, the Labor MP, who was a bit out of kilter with the rest of the Labor Party is retired at this election, former member for Hunter. And uh, I put forward my view that I thought Labor was going to retain Hunter and he agreed, but he did say that he was a bit nervous about it. Uh, I'm, uh, I, he still thinks they're going to retain it. But the interesting thing is I've had reports from coalition people that actually uh, Labor were packing up in Cessnock. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, two of the biggest booths they packed up with more than an hour to go now i don't know whether that's because no one was turning up because it was pouring down rain or whether they were giving up but um that's interesting so it's those seats like that where the coalition was hoping to win to negate some of the losses to the labor party which are absolutely going to happen uh, i would say in queensland 
the seats you're going to be looking at um, are Leichhardt, uh, Orion, a Brisbane, and Flynn, and in perhaps Longman, but I reckon that um, the majority, from what I feel and what I've seen in the last week, the coalition are going to retain. The other thing about Hunter, of course, is that the coalition are after it, but so is so is your mob. Yeah, uh, One Nation, Nation, and so is uh, Stuart Bonds, a, a former One Nation candidate That's now right. running as an independent, uh, with who's getting a bit of love from a lot of the, the freedom friendly minor parties as well. So that'll be really interesting to watch Hunter come in. It's a potentially a four way race. Yeah. Yeah, and so those preferences are going to mean a big deal. I mean, and, and you know, we talk about, uh, um, you know, putting the majors last, but at the end of the day, one has to go below the other one. So it'll depend on uh, whether people were more ticked off about uh, what the Labor Party did, although that's a state that's run by the New South Wales Liberal government. Uh, so it might be a bit difficult. But, uh, you know, we've seen in, in, in Victoria and in Queensland uh, absolute uh, authoritarianism. Um, less lesser authoritarianism in places like New South Wales, but we also saw um, uh, acquiescence and uh, and just doing nothing to stop the bad things uh, from the federal government. So it'll depend who people in the freedom movement consider worse. I found that in New South Wales from Perite there was some hesitation, mm -hmm. but then ended up doing the same things the Labor state state premiers did. Um, and obviously the federal government could have stopped it at any time yeah. and they chose not to. So all talk, no action. And I found that with my um, lovely lady, but I, I asked um, the little candidate in Griffith, yeah. you know, on what moral basis would you oppose mandates and lockdowns? She said, well, I actually manage a venue and it costs a lot to hire the extra security guards to check the mandates. I said, that's kind of not what I'm asking. No. <laughs> I'm looking for something a little bit more substantial than it adds a tiny bit to your budget. Mm -hmm. And I found this attitude uh, all across the Liberal Party. No real strong moral fibre there. No substantive no argument against it. Some hesitation. Fear of being called an anti-vaxxer. That's, that's really all. Well, that's right. To him. It's just that's right. Um, so all the talk, none of the action, and even the talk's pretty weak. There's not much talk, I was going to say. That's, uh... Okay, sorry. Whatever talk they did, it was pretty weak as well. It was weak. It was incredibly weak. You, you, you literally had um, Scotty the windsock um, saying one thing one day, backtracking the next, yep. and then boasting about he's um, the, the guy who brought in no jab, no play years ago this, as social service minister. So trust me, that's how serious I take vaccines. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, when, he, when he, I mean, when the criticism was raised to an LNP member, you guys didn't speak up for me for freedom and oppose mandates. They were able to technically say, yeah, we did. Um, but if you have an each way position long enough, you, you just can't have, be believed on anything. You almost have to respect Labor more for saying, well, no, we value exactly right. over freedom and that's how we're going to act. Exactly right. It's honest. <laughs> Sorry, gents, can I just tell you, we've got the first votes counted yeah. uh, coming in from uh, Bean, a very safe uh, a dead red seat, a very safe uh, Labor seat in Canberra, uh, and uh, Bean, I think, is the southern part of Canberra, and the votes coming in here, is it 60% um, Labor? It's a, a, a two party preferred. 11.41% swing. Wow, very small numbers, we should say, here. But, this but, is uh, 265 but votes. They do track them booth by booth. So mm -hmm. that 11.41% swing, why you think it might be, you know, it's a small number, but they've tracked booth by booth, so it is... Significant still, it'll probably tighten up. But that's well, a just huge say, swing to Labor. On that as well, the interesting thing: the, the independent is actually running first in that seat. So that'll be uh, interesting to see how that two-party preferred looks if we factor in the independent. The independents uh, on thirty percent, but for for our interest as well, uh, Pauline Hanson's One Nation's at six percent, and UAP uh, United yeah. Australia Party is on five point seven. So uh, roughly a twelve percent showing. For, so who is this independent that scored the highest? There, that's bizarre. All uh, right. I don't know them well. Jamie Christie. Let's look her up, him, him up or her up. While we're doing that, we're going to say hello to Dylan, who's joined us on the set in the hot seat, which will uh, come and go tonight. Welcome, Dylan. You are the host of the Freedom... Uh, what does it say? Your Freedom Has a Voice. Freedom yeah. Has a Voice and Facebook spoken page. spoken today, Dave. It has. It has spoken <laughs> today. Uh, so... Um, we're going to be uh, talking with Dylan in, in uh, after our next guest, who I'm about to introduce as well, and, and he'll be um, uh, bringing on Gaz from Gazcam. But uh, right now, let's um, welcome to the stream as well, Alexandra Marshall. Ellie Melly, thank you so much for um, for joining us tonight. It's uh, 
how is the weather down here? Because up here in southeast Queensland, it is been raining cats and dogs all day. Well, can you boys hear me? Because my internet's a little dodgy. I'm in the country. We can't hear. We can't hear that properly. Okay, just keep talking for a second. Can't hear me. Um, just keep talking. I might pop up. Yeah, I'm in the country, so I'm not sure if this will work. With, um, You're making sure the here. desk the desk yeah. is okay. We, we can't hear you at the moment, Alexandra. So just uh, you guys feel? hold hold fire, and we will uh, fix that. <laughs> Although we did get uh, one interesting, you, you found out who this independent was running in Dean. It's a it's a worrying sign for tonight. Yeah, it seemed like uh, well, not quite, but but a similar sort of style to a teal independent. So uh, uh, that's interesting. That's what you'd almost expect from Canberra. The number one vote goes to a teal independent. The number two vote goes to uh, Labor. By the looks of it, the and twenty percent from the Greens. If, look on the same. These, not, these numbers uh, probably won't hold, but if they did, uh, yeah. that would be an independent taking a seat from Labor. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, let's numbers. see if we've got Ali. Ali, can we at the desk hear you now? Can you hear me? I can hear you. We can, we can hear you. Um, apparently, there's a bit of a uh, lip sync problem, guys. Um, just yeah, that's out. that's my <laughs> fault. That's my fault because I'm in the country where there's no NBN and no internet connection. So <laughs> that's my bad. The, the, you, uh, the NBN that Turnbull had to bring in. Um, Ellie, tell us uh, your thoughts. Um, actually, what I'm really keen to hear from you is uh, your commentary on perhaps the, the last three years. How did we get here? The biggest thing that's happened in the last three years is that the freedom-friendly parties have decided to form a soft alliance with each other and go after the major parties. And that discipline between the freedom-friendly parties, which we've seen really come into the fore in the last you know, campaign we've got here, has made a huge difference to the confidence that the Australian voters have in voting for an independent that values liberty. And I think, well, at least we hope that we're going to see in this election a major swing toward those parties and hopefully some Senate seats that are going to sit there and oppose terrible policy produced by both Labor and Liberal. Uh, Alexandra, got a prediction? That's such a tough one. Point? I <laughs> Well, it's hard to tell if it's going to be SCOMA or ALBO, but I do think we are going to see independent parties uh, in the Senate. I think we're going to get some teals uh, in some normal seats, which is going to be a shame, um, and that in the Senate we're going to see One Nation, maybe some Lib Dems. Um, not sure about UAP, but I think definitely One Nation is going to pick up more than they've had previously, so we can hope for that. But that's as far as I can go. As far as it's ScoMo, Albo, I mean, who can say? It's such a mess and no one likes either of them. I've got to be fair, I wasn't even asking about them because that's you know, one of them will win. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm very interested in the, the success or otherwise on the freedom-friendly minor parties, as I think Topher uh, coined the term. Um, and I'm very intrigued by you saying that One Nation, you think, might be able to expand their presence in the Senate. I think Pauline's a shoe in, in Queensland. I've thought that for a while. Uh, I didn't think she, she didn't need the Liberal preferences. I don't think she, she needed George, although I'm sure you helped. I'm, uh, confident, I think she was gonna win. Uh, I'm confident she's Well, that's what I'm saying. I, I think she's in. Uh, that's easy. I've just written that in already. Yeah. Uh, but I struggle to see where One Nation uh, is in line for that second seat. Where, where do you think it could happen? Well, for a start, Sky News has finally acknowledged that the people they've got standing on the booths have found that there is a major swing toward freedom-friendly parties, and they themselves have been mentioning One Nation in the separate seats, which they were not expecting, and they're actually kind of furious about it. So we've got Labor people on Sky News complaining about the One Nation vote, which is good news for me and good news for anybody in One Nation. Uh, I think we've got a better chance of New South Wales than we originally thought. It seems that it was between uh, uh, the uh, Liberal Democrats and One Nation. It looks like we might actually be inching ahead there as far as uh, online chatter is concerned. We've got a good shot for South Australia. We've got a good shot for Tasmania. Western Australia is a bit, no one really knows what's going to happen over there. So we're just fingers crossed um, and hoping that all those freedom-friendly uh, parties and the sentiment toward wanting more autonomy uh, and protection from the major parties is going to flow through to One Nation. Yeah. Hey, Ellie, uh, in a very quick 30 seconds, uh, somebody in the comments has asked, who are the Teal candidates? What's a Teal candidate? <laughs> 
The teal candidates are billionaire-backed greens, basically. They're the worst possible green you can have. And they are inching in on the moderates in Sydney. So those inner-city blue ribbon seats by the water are being overtaken by their teal candidates. And the Liberals are worried that they're going to lose those seats. And I really believe that if they lose the election, the Liberals will have no one to blame but the moderate Liberals who have come up against the teals, and they're probably going to lose. All right, let's have a look at some of the comments. Um, Andrea Hardwick says, I wonder how quickly the new lockdowns for the monkey virus will be re-implemented after the uh, election. George, uh, what do you think about the monkey virus? Well, I don't know about the monkey pox virus, but I can tell you uh, <laughs> to go from one crazy thing to another. Um, no, I shouldn't say that because I love you. Are they going to have <laughs> Bob Catter looks to be overwhelmingly re-elected. The results come in small boots but he's got uh, an over 8% swing towards him. So at least freedom's reigning in the seat of Kennedy right now. There we go. Gents, if you want to send me a URL to put on screen, just send it through Signal and I'll um, I'll share it so everybody can see what you're looking at. Um, just do that before we, we swing to you. Um, Monkeypox, you didn't have uh, something about that? Look, And first off, uh, um, yeah, is that just... name going to have to be changed just as rapidly as Chinese coronavirus yeah, well, or Wuhan flu well, for th also being racist? I think it's species, really. I mean, it's just <laughs> absolutely disgraceful that we're attacking monkeys like that. I'm, I'm quite fond of monkeys as a particular species, uh, you know, so perhaps there needs to be a new name. But this is just the whole, the next bloody thing, you know. Yeah. And what we're all going to have ribbons now for monkeypox victims and uh, things on our Facebook and Twitter profiles about monkeypox. This just fear, this this nonsense just needs to stop because um, you can see what's happening at the moment. They're amping it up into something that's trying to be a big concern to everyone when um, actually if you have a look at the, uh, at the very specifics about monkeypox, uh, who it's mainly affecting, uh, and I won't go into that, uh, but this is not something that the general community has to be worried about. Yeah, that's my two cents. Can I just ask uh, Alexandra while she's still here? You said um, that the, the media has started having to acknowledge that when you, you have the category of independence, it doesn't just mean teal. So we touched on that a little bit earlier, how, how there is uh, sort of a, a non-major party revolution happening across the country, but there's actually two of them happening simultaneously. You've got the teals peeling off the... Um, what they call the moderate liberals, who are basically just green, you know, Greens voters who were confused previously. Um, but then you've got the this non-major party revolution going on at this table, for instance. Mm. Uh, and you say that the media started actually having to admit that. I, I haven't seen that yet. Uh, for anyone because of because they've only just started doing it in the five minutes before I came onto your show. They started saying that where they've got late. Labor used to have three seats and now they've been losing one seat to the Greens on a regular basis. They're now saying that Liberals have had three seats and they think they're going to start losing that third seat to a freedom-friendly party as a regular thing. So they started admitting that the polls are showing and the sentiment on the ground is that the freedom-friendly parties are becoming a serious movement that is going to impact how many seats the Liberals end up with and that it could be a permanent feature of our politics. And they're only saying that because they're worried and they haven't said it before because they, they've been keeping freedom-friendly parties out of the news. They don't want to talk about us. They don't want the public to think that we have this much of a groundswell movement. But today, now the polls are closed, they are talking about the freedom-friendly push. Yeah, well, I, I certainly agree with what you're saying there, that there, there could be a situation freedom-friendly minor parties taking the third coalition seat in the Senate. Uh, what I find interesting, like you say, is they've started saying it now. I notice the media has decided to admit this what was it, 10 minutes after the close of polls? So yes, only sure after the polls good. closed. Only after that. They wouldn't say a word about us beforehand. They didn't want people to believe that there was a movement or that yeah. this you know, compulsory vaccination and lockdowns had had such a big impact on politics. But, of course, it has. And uh, now they're coming to terms with the fact that it may actually show up in the polls. So... Can I just jump in? My former party, the National Party, here's the tale of two leaders. Early results in for the seat of New England and Barnaby Joyce, um, who I still greatly admire. Uh, yes, he's, uh, you know, uh, as the Deputy Prime Minister, he's had to uh, swallow a lot of the you-know-what, um, but his electorates rewarded him with uh, plus 11.82% 
swing by the looks of it. Um, currently, uh, two party preferred count of nearly eighty percent of the vote in that electorate. Well, I just will note Meanwhile, that fifty five votes counted. Right. So yes. Uh... But 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 I, I know what you're saying. But this is you got to remember it's booth by booth. So yes, it will tighten up. But the the AEC doesn't just count that based on the whole electorate. They counted on what that booth recorded at the last election. Yeah, so so it still is a swing at that particular booth which is significant, oh, I know, because I've been through it, I've seen it myself. Um, it will tighten up, though. That won't be 11.82% swing, swing at the end of the day. That'll be a rural booth that'll be very much pro Barnaby, no doubt. But um, in the seat of Maranoa, a same rural booth, a similar rural booth has come in, and there's an 8% swing away from David Littleproud, who's been very pro, pro climate change mm -hmm. and all the rest of that. So... I mean, Locked this in. tells me something, you know, straight shooters, 11.82% swing. Someone who's being That's a bit right. mealy mouth, 8% swing against. Yeah. It is remarkable to me that the National Party has a green wing. Yeah, okay. it's, it's remarkable to me too. Yeah. It's part of the reason I got out. I mean, I, I was there when the vote around uh, net zero happened and uh, a key reason why I pulled the pin, pulled the, uh, pulled the shoot to get out. I mean... Uh, uh, just bewildering that the party that I belong to that says it stands up for uh, miners and farmers would uh, go down that uh, that climate change route, but there we have it. Yeah. And what does Insane. it give you? An 8% swing against. Ellie Melly, uh, some final thoughts from you before we go to our uh, next guest in the uh, hot seat tonight. Well, I was just tilting my head to the side because they've got Simon Holmes, a court being interviewed right now. Uh, yeah. So I think yeah, I know, right? That he's, of course, talking about how much he's definitely going to pick up all these inner city seats. But you know what? I think he might be right, which is a, which is a worry. Uh, I actually, looking at what's going on, I think the Liberals could lose, but only because of these inner city seats. It's so tight that they can't afford to lose any of them. But, you know, the moderates are definitely going to be the weak arm in this election. It's not going to be because of the freedom-friendly parties. Their preferences are all flowing through to Liberal. It's going to be because of this uh, climate change indoctrination program that's been going on for so long and all those kids are now voting and they're clearly voting hard left. So my yep. thoughts are it's going to be a rough one. Yeah, awesome. Ellie, thanks for your thoughts. Um, keep sending us your intel and your updates through either in comments for us to put on screen or in the private message or WhatsApp. And um, if you're uh, still awake later in the night, um, we uh, might see if you're available for some more thought. <clears throat> Yeah, just uh, send me a text if you want me back on. I'm I'm going to be doing commentary all night, so just let me know. Awesome. Thanks, Ellie. Bye. All right. Um, <laughs> now we have a uh, new guest, and um, that's Dylan Oakley. And, uh, Dylan, I want you to talk about this comment from Chelsea Hagen. Uh, she says, I am normally a Liberal voter, but this election I voted for freedom. And, uh, and then somebody else, Philippa Collins, gave her an amen, said, Chelsea, me too. I voted for freedom. Normally a Liberal voter. Um, Dylan, what's going on? What's happening? There's, there's a, a big move to freedom. Uh, George said something just a, a minute ago there about the straight shooters. Uh, there is a, a, a demographic of people out there who are looking for those who were straight shooters about freedoms for Australians over the last two years. And um, I'm privileged enough to be part of the freedom community and the freedom movement. And I want to give them a shout out right now. The, the protesters that have been much maligned by the media over the last two years have made a massive dent in this election. And you've heard, you've heard the comment hammer time. It doesn't apply now. We're talking about spanner time. And we're talking about throwing <laughs> a freedom spanner right deep into the works of uh, yeah. oppression and segregation in this nation. And so... Those sentiments are reflected across the nation. I'm, I'm calling millions of people who feel exactly the same way. They, they sense that their political leaders, their political representatives haven't had their back over the last two years. It's yeah. not just those who have lost their job. I'm one of them. I represent many, uh, you know, tens of thousands, if not more, across the country who have lost our jobs uh, through these uh, vicious mandates. But we're talking about the families that have had the flow-on effects as well, Dave. Yep. Families that have, you know, their children are, are suffering, uh, family members, and then, of course, injury around the, the uh, injection as well. Yep. Um, and joining us is one of your um, uh, co-belligerents in the freedom movement, yeah. uh, Gary Howard, better known as Gazcam. Um, Gary, uh, welcome to the show, and thanks for all the, the work that you've been doing. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me. I just had to check the beard out on the camera because I've got some bearded brothers there. We've got uh, 
George Christensen and uh, Cos L Dylan. So I've got some competition for the beard. So thanks for having me anyway. Gaz, can I just say this? Gaz has been a tireless worker in the freedom movement a lot longer than I have. He's been around for at least three years in this movement. We are often mistaken for each other. I get called Gaz quite, <laughs> quite a lot. And then Gaz is funny. Bad thing. Fun enough to bring someone else on his channel today with a beard who someone thought was Gaz as well. So we've yeah. got to watch the, the bearded brothers. Hey, can, can I jump in just very quickly? Mm. My old seat, which I'm keeping an eye on, um, it's one booth uh, and there's nothing really to read into it, but One Nation has polled second uh, after the LNP, a distant second, I've got to say. The LNP is still holding uh, ground, in fact, with a 2% swing in the primary vote there. Uh, but One Nation is polling above Labor and their vote is 16.2%. And actually the combined UAP, wow. Catters Australia Party vote and uh, Great Australian Party vote is about 17%. Again, if that 17% went fully to One Nation, it's not enough to beat the LNP. But if they poll second, uh, that race is in the mix. Brilliant. We'll see. You've got to we'll shoot, me, shoot me the links when you Well, can it does show the, the, the strength of One Nation across that corridor. Uh, although, of course, right. Labor will be putting the, the Liberals. Labor is preferencing to the Liberals they over the, the freedom-friendly minor parties they are. in most situations. Not all situations, but in most, they are... And so it's it makes it very difficult. I, I, I urge caution. Though, that is a, a, a it would be a rural booth. And last time round, Labor polled fourth in some of those rural booths. So uh, there you go. So early numbers here in Cowper as well on the north coast of New South Wales had the the combined uh, UAP Lib Dems One Nation vote uh, at I think this was the order of fifteen percent as well. Which um, that, that's if that was maintained. There's nothing <laughs> special about uh, well, for the people living in Cowper. It's a very special place. But from our perspective here, there's nothing special about analysing those numbers except that they came up early. But if that was replicated uh, across the state and across the countries, that's a very comfortable uh, freedom senator. Yeah. And look, there's 22% in Maranoa in the early votes for, for plus 22% uh, to the um, uh, to the pro-freedom candidates. Uh, so, you know, uh, we'll, we'll come back with more. But let's talk to Gazcam, the one and only. Yeah. Hey. <clears throat> So, Gaz, how about you? You're out on the booths today, like I was, like many of us were in the rain, working the booths. Did you set? Did you sense some uh, dissatisfaction with the major parties amongst people that you were talking to out there? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I got around a fair bit. I was over at Oxenford. I went down to uh, to Burley there for a bit too. I spoke to, to Sandy Ropes, the candidate for, for One Nation for, for the seat of Fadden, um, and she was saying she was getting a, a great reception. Um, down that neck of the woods. Um, they were receiving her quite nicely. And, oh, you've actually got a, a blank screen. I don't know if you can still see me or not. but um, We can see you. We can see you. Yeah, we can see you. Uh, You're on full black screen. Here. But uh, what I did notice, and I noticed this through voting myself, you know, I was one of the, uh, the belligerent buggers that actually did film my interaction with the AEC. And I did go in and I did ask the question about those blank boxes above the line. And they did tell me that it was um, uh, those boxes were irrelevant, and uh, that whoever you know was in that original box has actually been withdrawn or been scratched. You know, um, so that's been uh, coming in thick and fast through my channel. Just exactly the same sort of stories. Um, the other thing that I've um, had uh, just in the last hour is actually uh, a couple of candidates for McPherson tell me that. The count actually started at four o'clock at a different location and very limited scrutineers um, having uh, opp an opportunity to be there as well. So I heard should... some news about that, um, Gaz, and uh, yeah. basically what they were saying was that because of the extraordinary amount of people, 50% of the population voted early today uh, mm -hmm. or this, this year, um, and so they basically, to count all those pre-poll votes, um, they were doing a lot of work in that first two hours to prepare. They weren't... Uh, my, They're my pulling a sort It wasn't a count so much. And, yes, they, they said up front that scrutineering would be limited at that time. Um, but uh, it was essentially trying to do some housekeeping. So I, I, I don't think it's too nefarious, but um, it's always good to keep them on their toes and, and ask tough questions. I think there's... Um perhaps, you know, a bit of a status quo that we can actually reflect on that's been happening around the world with these uh, these elections on this scale is that 
We might, you know, we, we're hearing good reports right now that some of our freedom candidates are, are getting up in popularity. We're, we're seeing some vote. I have, I've not watched. I, I don't know. It feels like it's a roller coaster ride to me. But I expect to wake up tomorrow, and, and it's just, just my opinion. I expect to wake up and see a major theft. And um, I just think we've got to be vigilant and keep our eyes open in the meantime, you know. I am definitely one of the people that have been sticking close to, to Steve Dixon and Rebecca Lloyd over this time. I was with them with the meeting um, in front of the Australian Federal Police yesterday, making their um, complaint against the AEC. And um, I think they've got a good case. And I think when you're talking about, you know, and I, I, I went to the um, to vote today and I acted like a, you know, a typical Aussie bloke, which I am with not a, a lot of knowledge on how to vote, which I didn't have uh, prior to this season. And I just played dumb. I said, and I asked the questions about the box. I'm just thinking, you know, the ease that we have with voting above the line as opposed to below the line and just a little bit of a, a sprinkle of disinformation to say that those boxes are, are irrelevant. You know, are we uh, doing our freedom candidates out of some votes? If I can add something there about the education around the voting system as well, uh, Dave and the panel, as a teacher, a teacher who can't teach at the moment in the classroom, but as mm. a teacher, I see a massive gap in vote, in teaching students how to, to vote. You know, you get people at the, what I noticed at the election booth today was there was a sense of dissatisfaction. People did want to do something about it, but they felt um, ill-equipped. They didn't, they were, you know, baffled by the, the Senate ticket and how to do things. And, you know, they're trying to trust somebody in the line, giving them a how to vote card. Yep. Then I, I think when I talk about a democratic revolution, it's starting. Mm -hmm. And I think we're going to see it from here on in, in mm -hmm. the sense that people will want to know more and more about how to vote, how to have their voices heard. This is called Freedom Speaks. Can, can, and, I, can I jump in? Sorry, Dylan, can I jump in with some numbers? Course, Just a, I've been tallying up what the early results are in some seats here. Now, this is huge. In the seat of right, come on. Scotty Bookholtz is, is the sitting member, thirty-three percent towards the Freedom Parties. So that's enough. I that's, mean, it depends uh, who it goes. West behind. Brisbane between Logan and yeah, Nish. yeah. The, well, it's it's even more west than that. I think mm. it's uh, sort of Gold Coast hinterland and the Brisbane Valley area. Yep. I'm pretty sure. Um, thirty-three percent with One Nation carrying the bulk of that at twenty-one percent, uh, and then I think the UAP after that. Um, and uh, you know, just other numbers here. Twenty percent like swing that. against. But, man, that's a, that's a huge swing. Like I'll I'll just bring it up. Um, uh, here we've got. Uh, I mean, early results. It is very early results, right? There's only been thirteen, about fourteen hundred votes counted. Um, but again, booth by booth, they analysed this uh, with. It's a three point three percent swing against the sitting member. So. Given that I've seen in other areas, they're getting eleven and twelve percent swings against them. He's done pretty good. Well, it's actually a seven point six percent swing against on two, <clears throat> two party preferred. preferred. Two party preferred. You're right. You're right. So seven percent still a bit better than the twelve and elevens that I'm seeing in other places, which seems to be the norm. I'm seeing twelve and eleven percent swings against against, the against against Liberal Party members. So that I, I, I would say that to me it's obvious that we're going to see a Labor win. But just want to get on this. Sounds like Th Freedom's going to shout tonight. Yeah, well, it'll be in pain. 3.3% um, swing against on primary, 7 point something percent against on two-party preferred. But that is very significant when you've got 20% um, plus voting One Nation, 9.25% voting UAP, Federation Party in there as well on 284 that's significant. The other one that's significant in Queensland is the seat of Leichhardt, which they said was one to watch. Um, current swing has a swing towards the sitting member of 5.73%. Uh, so that's interesting in itself. But when I tallied up, uh, he's had a near 7% swing against him on primaries. Where he's getting his preferences from, and this is one of the um, so-called modern liberals, right, um, where he's getting his preferences from, is the twenty percent of people that have voted for freedom parties in the seat of Leichhardt? Yeah. Um, so, 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 if he wins that, which it looks like he's going to, that'll be simply because the pro freedom crowd we should factor opted in for him other than Labor. The the two candidate preferred here is based on assumptions of preference flows. 
So yes. we don't actually have information on how those preferences are flowing yet. They just have uh, the AEC extrapolates from history, yeah, which can be a right. it's a better guide than anything else. So fair play to them, but it. it it doesn't really tell us what's happening at this election. John, John, are you sure about that? I mean, this here, they've, they've. Are you sure they haven't divvied up the preferences already? That this two-party preferred thing is just simply based on the last election well, flows. I, is it? I'm not going to put hands on my heart there and, and guarantee something like yeah. that. Then, I could get in trouble, then, but that's my understanding. That is okay. the process. The All procedure right. is that right. the AEC uh, tells the the booth supervisors at each count who they think is most likely to win on flow of preferences based on last year's results. Last election. Last election's results, sorry. And no. uh, and uh, then they count properly tomorrow, Monday and Tuesday. All right. It probably doesn't matter. I gotta say I find that difficult to believe because I don't think the AEC are in the in the in the habit of speculating. They just look at what the numbers mm. are in front yep. of them. I think that what we're seeing here when they've got two candidate mm. preferred results is the actual results that because it's a small booth. And they would have, you know, as I said, in that, in that, in that seat, <laughs> we're talking about 108 votes. So they've definitely separated that into two piles between um, the Liberal or the LNP candidate and the Labor candidate. But anyway, let's go on. Dylan Tessa Johnson says, Dear God, praying for freedom to prevail tonight. There are many praying. I had people mention to me in the in the line today outside the election booth that I've never met telling me that they were praying. They told me that there awesome. are people praying and fasting even today. Wow. This uh, whatever happens with this election, uh, people are awake. They're awake to the fact that they need to get active politically. And I, again, I'm talking as someone who's immersed in the freedom community now, the freedom movement, along with Gary. And he'll tell you there were hundreds of thousands of us down in Canberra, hundreds of thousands of us camping yep. together. It is a movement uh, and it's only growing and getting bigger. And I'll tell you something else I noticed, George. I don't know if this was every uh, electoral booth or not, but there was not one photo of Scott Morrison at the booth today from the Liberals. All the photos were provided courtesy yeah. of the Labor Party, uh, photos of him <laughs> frowning, and we had we yeah. had another guy dressed up with the Hawaiian outfit. It tells me something that, uh, that the Liberals are, uh, they know that Scott Morrison is a liability and there has to be some uh, responsibility taken with that. Uh, here is a man that many of us in the freedom community felt ha has not had our back. In fact, he's been complicit in what we've seen is uh, politico pharma oppression and medical segregation across the country. Yeah, absolutely. Here's an interesting one that's not good for um, the cause that we're talking about. Uh, I thought, well, this is interesting. The seat of Richmond, which the National Party, I mean, talks about, but is all but written off. Um, and they're showing on a two-party preferred basis that it's sitting with the Nationals at the moment. Well, that's strange. Then I go and look at the results, and this is an example of when you get into the two-candidate preferred divvy up that they do, that it won't be. On these numbers, anyway, if it's continued across the electorate between Labor and the Nationals, it'll be between the Greens and the Nationals. Labor is running third at the moment in this booth. The Greens are on 30.69%. That would be a Green victory. Yeah, you got to watch what it is. This might be Nimbin. No, but the, okay, the, if the Greens stay in front of Labor is what yeah, I'm saying. Yeah. Labor preferences flow uh, quite strongly. It would be a Green, green victory. Nationals at 21.45%. And Labor at 20.63. It's a 6.7% swing against Labor, and that's significant. But this could be the uh, the booth of Nimbin yeah, reporting in, I think. And I, just looking at across, uh, we've got to focus on the, the freedom-friendly <laughs> minor parties as we should, but just looking at the overall picture here uh, for this election, uh, and just looking in Queensland, it seems to be a pretty consistent swing, early numbers, but a pretty consistent swing to Labor. Uh, mm. A swing to Labor in Bonner, not enough to take the seat, but a swing nonetheless, a, a swing to Labor in Wright, a swing to Labor in Flynn, uh, a, a swing to Labor, a massive swing to Labor in, in Morton. Um, so if that keeps up, especially across Brisbane, it seems, uh, Brisbane is swinging to Labor on these numbers. So if, if that holds, it does look like it'll be Prime Minister Albanese. Mm. George, the easiest way to see if it's a Nimbin seat is if the legalised cannabis party <laughs> got a lot of votes or not. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't check that. I didn't check it. I'm going to say. Uh, Gaz, just before you leave, my brother, uh, you've poured your, your heart and soul into the last few weeks. I, I, I really believe this man. I don't know how many uh, how many hours you get in the day, but it seems like far more than me, and he's been everywhere in that car. In, in, I've I got to really credit Gary's giving yeah. the Freedom Candidates a massive platform in this, uh, in this campaign. Uh, filling a gap where the mainstream media have really ha have let us down. Gaz, where to from now? T election day is today. We'll find out the results. Where to now for freedom and for the community? What are you seeing? Well, I, I'd just like to 
perhaps wind it back a little bit there, Dylan, because I feel like we've maybe dropped the ball as a, as a freedom community. I, I think, you know, we've seen over the last uh, two to three years, we've had hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people marching in the street. We've known about this election uh, being on the horizon for quite a while. We should have been rallying around, rallying the troops around our freedom community candidates. Because many of them have actually been um, to all these marches. They have actually seen a need and seen that they can actually be the person that wanted to stick their hand up and make a difference in Canberra. And we have really dropped the ball. They should have had a small army around them. They should have had... Yeah. I'm just seeing so many of these freedom community candidates doing it so hard, operating out of the back of their car, travelling, you know, mm. the middle of nowhere, trying to get their name out there. And we have actually mm. dropped the ball because our political... Well, our freedom community leaders have decided by and large to be apolitical and not give them a platform. And, if, and, and actually, in many instances, they've decided to gag them. You know, we should have actually run with this. We could be doing so much better, I feel, anyway. So um, where do we go from here? Well, you know, it's hard to campaign on mandates and... Um, all that nonsense when they've wound back all the mandates. But if you don't remember, uh, you know, prior to winding back those mandates, you know, a lot of the states fought tooth and nail to actually get an extension and uh, more power on the, on the state of emergency. And then they wound them back and then they put the masses back to sleep. And it appears that the masses are actually voting accordingly. They're voting like they're asleep again. You know, these mandates they haven't been a removal of the chain. It's been a slackening of the chain. I can guarantee you if we have an Albanese back, you know, or a Labor back in power, it's going to be twice as worse and there's going to be many reasons to march the streets again. Unfortunately, you know, we have dropped the ball. I have to do this, sorry. Volunteers, thank you very much. They're watching tonight. They wanted to smile. Thank you, guys. Love your work. Really appreciate it. But yeah, I'm yeah. Don't apologise. No. Two words. If you're... These two words. Purity, spiral. Stop it. Because I'm telling you now, if you look at the personality <laughs> profiles of people, there's a personality trait called agreeableness and it's opposite disagreeableness. It comes down to... To what degree you need social consensus to form your beliefs? Agreeable people get along for the sake of it. Disagreeable people are more... In the freedom community, we're more disagreeable. It doesn't mean we're rude or unpleasant, but it means that we are more happy being individualistic about our beliefs. Yeah. And what happens, and I've seen this happen all the time. I went to Canberra. I drove down there. Mm. And um, I came away think, knowing that this would happen, is that it would fragment because every little group would fight over the last 5% of their way that they didn't get. You have to pick your battles. You have to band together over the 90% that you agree on so that you become a political force to be reckoned with. And that's what's got to stop happening. In the future, if you want freedom and all these things, you don't have to agree with everybody. Politics is the art of, getting, of not getting everything you want but getting enough of what you want. And I think that is a lesson that the freedom community needs to learn, possibly the hard way, mm. is that it's not about getting everything you want. Stop fighting over the last 5 10%. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, there's been a disdain, I think, that Gary mentioned as well for the political process, maybe absolute disgust in many ways with politicians and political representatives. And part of where we've got to go is overcome that and realise that the political process is something that we need to take hold of and we can make a massive difference. And so from here, I see that, that it, it, as Gary said, it was a little too late in some ways, but it's a start. We've started something and it's only going to continue. Yeah. And if we get that philosophy yeah. that you're talking yeah. about, we'll get somewhere quickly. We have started yeah. and my yeah. eyes on the future. Yeah, that's and right. there's so many things to learn. Yeah. There's so many ways in which people need to band together and things to understand so that it becomes a cohesive political animal 100%. in the future. And it can happen. It absolutely can happen. Yeah. But you have to reel in this need for people to agree with you 100%. Yeah. You know, you've got Ricardo Bosi yelling at people. That's going to turn people off. It's yeah, not yeah. going to politically scale. So, you know, you might agree on some things, focus on the things you do agree and turn that into a political 
weapons. Right now, we're going to bring in Topher Field, uh, the one and only Senate candidate uh, that you need to know when you're voting for freedom in the great seat of Tasmania. Uh, Topher, welcome to Freedom Speaks. Uh, thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate it. Hey, uh, let's start with this uh, one question. You've heard what we've just been talking about um, and about uh, how the freedom people who turned out in such great numbers maybe didn't turn out in as great numbers for the volunteering and the work that needed to do politically. Uh, one of the comments, I just can't find it right now, I'm sorry to put on screen, um, but I've seen you, I'm going to quote you now, um, it's basically saying, what's the chance of all of these freedom parties conglomerating and joining together and joining forces? Tofa, is that realistic and helpful? Over the long term, there is a chance of that happening, but there, there definitely needs to be a contest of ideas in the meantime. There is a reason why we're not all in the same party. There are some genuine differences, uh, I would say, especially economically, but also when it comes to things like uh, immigration policy and, uh, and export-import policy, etc. There are some pretty substantive differences. Now, what unites us is more important than our differences. Let's, let's not focus on our differences. Let's focus on what unites yeah. us, at least through this chapter in Australia's history where we need to be standing together. But there is a reason why we're not all already in the same party. Over time, however, I think there's an opportunity now uh, for people like the Liberal Democratic Party, uh, the, the party that I'm personally a member of, uh, to really start to make the case around their economic policies, which is where I, I think a real strength of, of our party, and to persuade and to win over more and more people, not for the, not, not for the purpose of out competing necessarily, but for the purpose of, of improving the level of economic understanding and the, the, le the number of people willing to stand up for freedom in every context, not just in certain ones and, and then others they, they perhaps like the government having control. We are a principled freedom party and I think that's a really important conversation to have. I think it's really important that it happens respectfully. I'm incredibly thrilled with the way that so many parties have come together and worked together in this election. I think if we hadn't done that, uh, the, the major parties would have just been laughing all the way through this election. Yep. And yep. Uh, I think, so I think what's happened has been really important. I think it's been really constructive, but I view it as a starting point. And now there are some really important conversations that we need to have. We need to have them respectfully, but we need to have them. We can't avoid them uh, about economic policy, about freedom in principle, and slowly over time, hopefully, what we will see is a coalescing of more and more people and more and more of these parties around a, a better and better understanding of what freedom really means. And if we can achieve that, uh, then I think in time, the freedom movement can become incredibly influential and incredibly powerful. What we can't have is people being tribalist at this point in time. We don't have enough friends to start dividing amongst ourselves. Uh, and so I think it's a really good thing what we've seen. And we need to carry that on. Uh, for at least a few more elections. But in the meantime, let's have those conversations and really try and improve the quality of each Australian's understanding of what it means to be a freedom uh, political party. Gaz, um, just before we let you go, have you got any uh, comments on what Topher said or even a question for Topher? Well, I don't know if I've got a question for Topher. I think you're absolutely marvellous, brother. I think uh, these marble videos... Mate, it changed the way. It, it actually illustrated to me for the first time on the importance of voting and how to vote because it was a, a mystical fairy dust thing to me um, prior yeah. to that. So I've got to thank you very much for that. But um, I, I just think it's a whole lot more urgent than, uh, than what people are saying right now. I don't think... Do we get many more bites at the cherry? You know, I was in the thinking that this is a do-or-die election. I was thinking that this is... You know, do we realise, you know, you should know this better than, than many, uh, Topher, you know, they were shooting our Australian brothers and sisters in the back with lethal rounds in the streets of Melbourne. They were pepper spraying um, grandmothers in the face on the ground. They were pistol whipping people. They were arresting mm. pregnant mothers in their homes for posting on Facebook. We're living in communist China right now, you know, and nobody seems to give us stuff. You know, and if we're going to go and put up with another four years of, you know, um, if you know, of course, if Labor gets in, it's going to be far worse. I don't know if we can survive because every day that this lunacy continues, you know, somebody else is dying. Somebody's having a life-changing injury because of this uh, gene therapy that we've been sub you know, submitted to. I, I, I just feel like I've got to apologise on behalf of the, the freedom community because, again, as I said before, I think we've really dropped the ball. We've dropped something that could have been a massive opportunity for some real change right now, not in future elections. So.
Can I can I respond to that? Um, I think one of the things that really helps to give to give me perspective is the time that I spent in Venezuela, uh, because I've actually seen I've seen the aftermath. Uh, not directly in terms of bodies on the street, but I've seen the cultural, economic, psychological aftermath of when the government used live ammunition on protesters uh, and where opposition uh, pe people weren't simply arrested and released on bail, they disappeared and were never seen again. Uh, I've seen how much further we can actually go. And the question you pose is, can we survive four more years of this? Well, I've, I've seen what happens in countries that have survived 40 years of far worse than this. Now, I don't want us to get there, but we need to understand as much as there is that sense of urgency, there is that sense that, oh, this this is it, this is the election. This fight, the fight for freedom, the, the contest between governments that want control and people that want freedom has been going on for thousands of years, long before I was born, and it will be going on long after I'm dead. And all I can do is play my part in it while I'm alive. While I'm the, the guy on the ball with the uh, on the field with the ball, then it's my job. And that's when I run with the ball and do what I can with it. Um, no, I, I don't necessarily buy into any sort of um, um, not apocalyptic. That's the wrong word. I'm 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 sort of labelling what you've said unfairly. Um, I, I don't buy into this incredibly high sense of urgency. I, I do think where we're at is incredibly important, but I also understand that we got to where we are over a period of fifty or sixty years. And the simple reality is, there is no fast option back. There is no fast way back. The only way back is slowly convincing people one at a time in a painful, painful process. Uh, and so that's the that's the task that I've put my shoulder to. And I would really encourage everyone, don't tell yourself that if we don't change the world today, then we've failed. Because there's a high chance that at that point you're going to stop fighting. And we need to be engaged in this fight for as long as we have breath. And that's that's what I've decided to do. So, so let, let, let's let's mention Fowler quickly because it's a glimmer of good news because nobody wanted Christina Keneally no. there. She is the censor of freedom extraordinaire. Isn't she tried true. to shut down CPAC, I think it was, it saying was, that yep. we're all right-wing <laughs> Nazis. Um, early results, very early results, but very promising results. You've got some uh, intel on that, have you? Fowler, I've got the Fowler numbers here indicate that uh, Daly uh, is up. She's a former liberal and a mayor, I think. And also right? a former Labor. She's, uh, she's, she, former she's liberal done, the, and former Labor. done the rounds after she got oh, kicked out of the Liberals <laughs> and she joined Labor for a while and now she's an independent. Uh, apparently, uh, one of us, though, in terms of freedom friendly, so belongs in one of our parties at some yeah, stage. It's very good. Uh, but the, the, all of the, the, the minor right parties are doing quite well there, USP especially, and that's 18% all up. Uh, uh, yes. Like that. And, and then you combine that with Dai Li's uh, primary vote of 24%. She's beating the Liberals on her own, but then you put her vote combined with the, the minor right parties. And yeah, and she's looking Can I just add one thing? The Liberals? You know, as the, can anybody hear me? Morning, uh, as, and uh, just we'll um, let Dylan say go anyway. anyway. But um, just on, on what Tofa was actually saying, you know, I understand there's been uh, plenty of examples around the world and in history of this side of, uh, you know, this degradation of uh, freedom and in human liberties. But the one thing I think that this time is different is that this is a global narrative, a global agenda and a global takeover. You know, there is a global timetable for this. It's, it's not just happening here in Australia. This is a, a transitioning and a, and a killing of an old system to bring in a new, you know. So that is totally different to what we've actually seen in history. This happens, you know, in history every now and again. But uh, what's happening right now, you know, we are worried about what's happening on the 22nd, the 28th of, of May with the WHO. You know, ScoMo sold us uh, down the river, lock, stock and barrel again. So this is something totally different. And, you know, one way we could have... Put the handbrake on for this was actually this election. I think we've missed it. Anyway. Well, well Gaz, let, Gaz is still in here. Brother, I love you and I love all the work you've been doing and I want you to uh, you, to Gaz. be of good cheer, my friend, and keep the faith. We do win. I'm going to say something here straight from yeah, the we do, brother. Isaiah 59 verse 19 is uh, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord lifts up a standard against him. And But by the grace of God, my friend, our country, it's not finished yet. And I think this is the start of something wonderful. We've learned a lot uh, from our mistakes and from our uh, omission, as George Christensen sometimes says. But uh, we've got this.
keep the faith, my friend, and thank you for everything you've done for the Freedom Community and for the love nation. you guys. I love all you guys over there. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks, guys. Uh, have a good night. Well, uh, this comment from Anne uh, is a good segue into uh, just a little ad. So good to see that we have an alternate election cover coverage instead of being stuck with the lamestream Amen. media, or as I call them, the lying harlot media, because they're maliciously deceitful and uh, commercially unfaithful. Well <laughs> done. Hashtag freedom forever. Um, we have around about 2,000 simultaneous viewers watching live at the moment. Um, so you might be watching in various channels. We've got... Um, nearly 700 on George's Facebook page and about a thousand on the Good Source YouTube page. I recommend you head to the Good Source YouTube page and join the banter and conversation there. And uh, of course, uh, when the show is finished, jump over to George's Facebook page, sign up and get a like. Also, um, Dylan from Freedom has a voice um, with us tonight. And um, uh, Topher is away from the camera at the moment. We'll come back to him in a minute. We're also expecting to connect with Senator Jared Rennick any minutes, but um, we'll just do a little bit of a whip around the table. First from me, seeing I'm holding the microphone, uh, Damien Curry, the Liberal Democrat candidate for the seat of Ryan, has uh, texted and, and said that uh, early info suggests he might be getting only about 1% of the vote in that seat. Now, that's a really, really tough seat. Julian Simmons is the incumbent LNP member there. Uh, by all accounts, he's one of those moderates um, that might be a teal Liberal. Um, and uh, Damien was really trying to hold the Greens out, uh, which was a really great thing. But he's saying that it looks like the Greens are probably going to win despite his valiant effort. So thank you to the Lib Dems and other Freedom candidates who uh, waved the flag in Ryan and gave people there a real uh, opportunity to vote for somebody other than the major parties or the extreme Greens. Um, but that's the, uh, that's the update there. Any uh, further update from... The tally room to well, my left. If I may, uh, changing the pace a little bit, we've got our first results coming in for the Senate. Now, these oh, are good. very early results, yeah, and, yeah, and the yeah. only place we've got the results coming in for uh, is the ACT, so it's not going to be very representative. Ooh, that's very, <laughs> of, very green of state. The, of the real country. <laughs> but it's a very interesting result because uh, David Pocock uh, is, is running there as a, an independent, yeah. uh, a very green-tinged independent. He's a, basically a teal. Uh, and both major parties have been worried about it. He's been uh, picking up votes mostly from the left, but uh, enough to worry that Labor might fall below a quota and that the Liberals might fall below a quota. And at the moment, they are. And this is very early numbers, but at the moment, both major parties are on about uh, 26%. Now, you need 33, 33.5% to, to get in to the Senate from the ACT. So they're both well below that. David Pocock, the Independent, on 15%. The Greens on 14%. And that Greens preference will flow to the Independent. So those two combined... I would put them in front of uh, Labor and Liberals. And a lot of the smaller ones, uh, Kim for Canberra, uh, that those preferences would be going to David Pocock. Uh, I imagine uh, legalised cannabis and a few of the Australian progressives. So at the moment, there is a possibility that there will be a, a teal in the Senate from the ACT. It would be knocking out the Liberal... <laughs> oh, I don't know who will be knocking out yet, but uh, possibly knock out the Liberal Z to Yeah. And if that was to That's happen, terrible. that would make the Senate uh, even more green in perspective yeah that's toxic tricky trudy's got a good comment um, just on the conversation we've been having a feeling of a sense of urgency especially in relation to this election comes from not understanding the history or the current landscape this war will last for generations so we must build and empower our community stick together and we will win see you all on the other side yeah amen tricky um absolutely something i've been saying to people is look past this election this is just the beginning we have to see past this election past the horizon to the outcomes that we can't even see yet and uh, make sure that we are, it's like pruning a tree. You've got to prune it for what it will look like in 20 years' time, not for the just the next um, fruiting season. So well done to Tricky on all of the uh, rallies he's been able to muster here down in Brisbane. Yeah, he's uh, a great freedom leader in mm. uh, the southeast of Queensland. So another update here on the numbers. The, the, the theme I was mentioning before that Brisbane uh, is swinging to Labor looks like it's continuing. Mm. Uh, and indeed, Dixon looks like it's on a knife edge. So uh, at the moment, uh, Dutton is in front there, but he's in front with a two-party preferred of 50.6. So that is extremely close. Uh, and even if he holds on, that looks like it's a swing, a 4% of swing to Labor at the moment. In Longman, there's a 3% yeah. swing to, to Labor. That one's at 50.1, two-party preferred. So that is uh, some very close contest. At the moment, Liberals are holding both of those seats, 
well, that sort a, of swing holds. Let's have a closer look at the primaries. Um, actually, uh, there's a 2% swing away from the Liberals on primaries, a 5.29% swing against the Labor Party. So the parties that have, uh, uh, you know, have picked up there, uh, certainly it's the UAP um, and the Liberal Democrats, and we certainly didn't contest the last election. But little bit's gone to the Greens and a, little, and a lot's gone to the uh, legalised cannabis party, which uh, uh, probably um, also fits in with the Liberal Democrats in a way too, doesn't it? Well, if only the voters would know that. I think that uh, <laughs> Longman might cover Woodford. Is that... Uh, I'm not sure. That, that I'm might not sure. explain some of that. Uh, anyway, the, the legalised cannabis party had to get a vote somewhere and that's where they got the vote. 6.59%. Um, so... Um, that one is definitely going to come down to the wire. And everyone expected it to come down to the wire. But the fact that even at this stage, Terry Young is still in the race with a small swing um, means that he might be in the race, you know, full stop. Uh, there's about 4,000 votes that's been counted in that seat. In Dixon, um, Dutton is down 6.41%. Uh, Labor is up marginally, 0.11. Um, so, again, I just want to quickly tally up the freedom vote in the seat of Dixon. Um, uh, we've got 1.7% basically for the LDP, 3.8% uh, for One Nation, 1.83% for UAP. So it's a very, actually, a very low vote, what I would consider. I'm not sure what the independence view is on these matters, so I won't include him. It's a very low vote in the seat of Dixon for pro-freedom parties. But you see um, Dutton has still retained a near 41% primary vote. Well, so. that is an 18% vote for the Greens there. That is, that, these huge. numbers aren't that early as well. That's yeah. 3,000 votes in. That is. Um, I think that on that, yeah, it's knife edge. It's knife edge stuff. You'd be um, biting your nails uh, if you're in Dixon or Longman. Well, it does seem to only show that consistent theme of a, a swing to Labor in, in Queensland, or at least in Brisbane. We'll just have a look at Bonner again, because that was one that wasn't really expected to be in play. And now it looks like it swung back to Ross Vasta. He's still got a 5.12% swing against him, but he's leading, according to the Electoral Commission, on 52.29% of the vote. There has been a 7.23% primary swing against Ross Vasta. Um, and again, when you tally up, the um, there's about 10 percent between Pauline Hanson's One Nation and the United Australia Party vote there, so he'll be hoping that that entire 10 percent um gets behind him because the Greens vote is upwards of 20 percent in the seat of Bonner, so that's why it's a knife edge. Uh, there's numbers in for McKellar, it's one of the seats being targeted by the Teals, uh, and it seems to suggest the Teal is in play. This is Sophie Scamps oh, uh, running. Uh, against the, the Liberal there is Jason Falinski. Uh, and on these numbers, the Teal Independent Sophie Scamps uh, is on 51.5%. <coughs> and this is after 4,000 voters. So. The, 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 can I just a bit of commentary? They made a rod for their own back, and it would be interesting when we get uh, Jared Rennick in here to get his views on this. Um, you know, Jason Falinski, nice guy, but he's considered one of these modern Liberals, these, um, uh, you know, Liberals that are on the left, who um, you know, we've we've uh, I've certainly had my arguments with them when I was in the coalition, um, but yet where are they losing their votes to? They're losing them to these teal independents, and it's a case of if you want to uh, pretend to be something else, people are going to vote for the real thing, and the real thing is a climate a climate independent, uh, a teal independent. They're not going to vote for a pale imitation, uh, that being this um, modern liberal. So uh, I think they've created the rod for their own backs, and the result has been for Jason Falinski, a 12.58% swing against him on primaries that could lead to him losing the seat to a teal independent. And if, heaven help, we have a hung parliament that is governed by these teal independents and the Greens, freedom is not going to be... Uh, uh, whimpering, freedom is not going to be singing, freedom is not going to be shouting, freedom is going to be screaming because um, that will be the worst thing for this nation. These people have a one-track mindset and that is we're going to do whatever it takes to sort out 
man-made climate change, and if that means an imposition on you, your family, or anyone in our country, they will do it. They yeah. will do it, as long as it probably doesn't affect them. I'm not sure that's true. I don't know how cynical to be with them, but uh, we'll, we'll find out how much they are just uh, cynical uh, players of tropes. Yeah, uh, but, sorry, well, well gonna, that's, you know, that's the hope. You know, and I actually put this to all the UAP people as well, the genius about these things that we're up against is their narratives, their whole thing is that your freedom is putting me at risk. Yeah, and it's the same with climate. That's right. So for you to be free, you're going to destroy the planet. For you to be free, you're going to kill grandma. It's a con it's a continuation of these same narratives. Yep. And so it's a lie. It's, well, it doesn't matter how empirically true it is, that's what they believe. And so this is the huge Sisyphean task that freedom has, is to break through these, these absolute um, yin-yang of incentives because yeah. people believe that for you to be free, you know, that you're going to impose a huge cost on them. Yep. There's no talk of cooperation. There is no cooperative way forward. It's one or the other. Mm. Sorry, another important uh, update here on a seat, the seat of Hughes, which is the, the seat for Craig Kelly contesting for the UAP, for mm -hmm. the United Australia Party. Mm -hmm. uh, long been a Liberal seat. Craig Kelly, of course, was elected as a, a Liberal uh, before he switched to the UAP. Uh, Craig is on 8% uh, oh on that seat. Uh, the, it looks like the, the Liberals will take that seat back. Uh, Jenny Ware on about 40%. Interestingly, a Teal Independent down there is getting about 15%. Uh, so that's... That's not a pretty outcome, but it looks like the Liberals are going to take that mm. one back. Uh, Eight percent for Craig Kelly. Eight percent would probably be enough uh, if Craig got it consistently across the state. Yeah, a spot in the Senate, but of course he didn't contest the Senate. Uh, well, that that is that is incredibly sad, John, because I served beside Craig Kelly across the floor with him. Well, he didn't cross the floor; he'd already left the party. But I crossed the floor to support a number of his bills, which were against uh, vaccine mandates, trying to stop it. I know that Craig believes what he says. He's extremely principled. Mm. Um, Craig Kelly's departure from the seat of Hughes is going to be a loss to the Australian Parliament and the Australian people uh, and, and the nation. And I wish, I, 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 I near begged him to run for the Senate because yep. I think he would have won in the Senate. But he didn't. And um, the result is, as we're seeing here, um, which is very, very sad. Um, but I don't have anything happy to say about this situation. Craig Kelly's absence will be. It also does seem to suggest that the, the, the polling, uh, that the polling that was done recently by the Oz when they did seat by seat polling, it seems to it seems to have been fairly accurate because it did mm. suggest a roughly similar outcome. Rob, that's your party leader. What do you think? Hearing that, that the party leader is likely to have lost the seat of Hughes. Um, I agree with you. Craig's a great, great man. He did, he did a great job, always had a great message. And so, yeah, it's absolutely a shame. Um, I think that as we go forward, the people of this country will have challenges um, because of results like that, that they won't be happy with. Yeah. That's what I think. That's what I honestly believe is that as we go forward into the future, there are going to be some very interesting circumstances and people might not recognise the connection, but they won't be happy about it. Yeah, so he's looking at about 7.42% currently, um, according to the tally room. Okay, yeah, how are we going with um, Senator Rennick? Uh, Abe, have we got uh, an answer from Rennick? Well, while Abe looks at that, yes. I can tell you there's some New South Wales Senate numbers coming in, uh, and the, the minor party, the minor right party that is currently doing the best, these must be rural booths, I strongly suspect, but it's the shooters uh, with 8%. Uh, I'm not sure that's going to sustain uh, mm. over the night. Behind that, uh, One Nation sitting on 6%. Mm. Uh, and, yeah. Well, that's so, so what are the Shooters, Fishers and Farmers Party position on this? I mean, I, I, they very much, to me, seem to be a New South Wales phenomenon. Mm. I see they're contesting um, the seat of Maranoa, but I haven't heard too much about them. I don't know what their position is on this issue. You probably have your finger on the pulse there, John. With, with not with the Shooters. No, I, I, shooters. I, I think... It is noticeable that the shooters have, uh, in recent history, done preference deals with the Labor Party, uh, and I think that has caused some some splintering uh, of their support or some contention within that party. Uh, I don't, I I don't know of them taking a stance against the lockdowns. Well, some people might. What about uh, some of our listeners? Does anyone know uh, about uh, the shooters, fishers, and farmers party? Please put it in the comments if you know what their position is. 
on this. I just see one of the commenters there told us that uh, Channel Seven was bagging me out big time. Well, uh, it's just uh, it's just another day at the desk. <laughs> it's a day, day ending in Y. <laughs> That's that's uh, yeah. Uh, these would be rural booths coming in for these uh, Senate numbers. Uh, it looks like, although early numbers in Victoria again a, a strong showing for One Nation, uh, which isn't your strongest uh, state uh, historically. I think Victoria is actually your weakest state. Yes, that's um, right. So I suspect these are rural booths. So, so, so I, I um, they're they're actually count going through and counting the Senate votes tonight. But this is small numbers we're talking about. They are right? so far. But it, so yeah. the Senate vote normally is a bit behind, but we will have enough first preference votes to have a, a rough idea. For the Senate, it is much more complicated to see how their preferences flow. Mm. So that will involve a lot more guesswork. So what do you expect yeah, in terms of uh, in terms of freedom candidates that are freedom parties that are going to get up across the nation in the Senate? For the Senate, well, I, I think Pauline's got her spot. For Queensland, I think it'll be interesting. I think it is the one state in play where there's potentially uh, two mm -hmm. uh, freedom candidates or freedom mm -hmm. parties uh, in play, um, although that'll be a tough one, the second spot. With the other states, as I mentioned before, it's going to come down to how effectively the voters chose to, to fill in their preferences. Did they watch Topher's Marvel video and did it resonate with them? Uh, if it does, then uh, I, I think one of our three parties uh, will be looking good in each of the states. Um, on recent polling, it does suggest One Nation has the lead in that race. One Nation, though, doesn't pick up any major party preferences uh, in the Senate outside of Queensland and Tasmania. So that that'll that'll might even the, the score a little bit. Um, beyond that, I, I hesitate to... Have you seen the early results for Queensland thus far? It's saying that the... I mean, it's very early. These are... Yeah, 370 votes that's been counted for the Senate. Well, when, when Labor's on 6.7%, I tend to disregard yeah, the numbers. Yeah, I would be too, because uh, at the moment it's saying that there's a plus 3% 3 3 plus quota to um, the LNP, which um, I find difficult to believe. And that One Nation certainly up there, they've got 0.46, oh, no, no, sorry, 1.3. 1, 1 so they've got a quota plus a little bit left over in this uh, on these numbers. Um, and well, yeah. I'm just saying who may have come second in the uh, in the Freedom Party stakes there, and indeed it looks like it might be the UAP on 0.38 or 0.39 percent of a quota. Well, we've got an, on the teal front, we've got some results coming in. I noticed you brought up North Sydney before. It looked like the teal in front of North Sydney. That's against Trent Zimmerman. The, the arch moderate of the the, the moderate yes. of the moderate wing of the moderate section of the Liberal Party. Uh, Zali Stegel looks like uh, she's currently in front of Catherine Deves. That's uh, obviously was a very interesting race to watch. That's not what we want to hear. Well, these are very no. early numbers. Uh, of, yeah. Well, actually, that's not that early a numbers. There's over 7,000 voted uh, in that seat. It does look like Zali is... How far ahead? Well. She's considerably ahead. Uh, it's 61% yeah. on two party that's, preferred or two candidates preferred there. Yeah. On the shooters and fishers, Deegsy answers questions. Shooters and fishers are a bit disappointing, even when you're a shooter. Sarah says, yes, they're pro-choice and pro-jab. Um, hey, what are, are they pro-jab or are they pro-choice? Uh, yeah, well, somebody else is <laughs> saying they're pro-jab. Um, so, yeah, we might be a little bit uh, split on that. Not, yeah. not conclusive yet. Um, so some people are pro-choice who got the jab and are, are labelled as pro-jab just because they... Had no choice. Well, these North Sydney numbers, uh, it was also there's 6,000 votes in, uh, and that has uh, Kyla Tink, the, the Teal Independent, in front of Trent Zimmerman on 56.4%, uh, two party preferred. It seems to be a three way race on primary votes between Labor, Liberal, and the Independent, but the Independent is in front of Labor, and that would probably propel them into the Parliament on those numbers. Um, not a great freedom vote in that seat, as you wouldn't expect, really, in North Sydney. No. Uh, rich people who've basically um, gotten to where they are on the backs of others and now want to uh, try and make the world a better place according to their own vision, as long as it doesn't impact them. Those people don't impress me. I mean, I, I honestly think that going forward, I mean, a word of advice to my former colleagues, you're going to have to ditch seats like this. You really are. I mean, you can't try to be all things to all people. Yep. And um, 
if these people want to continue on this sort of uh, push to, to shut down industries, uh, to put taxes on others, to uh, impact the lives of people they see as uh, less meaningful and dirty and, and whatever, let them go. Let them go. Let Teal Independents have them. Uh, try and win yes. votes in Western Sydney. Try yeah, and win exactly. votes in the regions. Yeah. Uh, win votes where, where, where there's productive people who want to enjoy their freedoms. And by all means, fight for those seats against the Teals, but don't change who you are and compromise no, your principles don't. to try and meet them left of centre, which is which is uh, utterly ridiculous. Let's um, bring in Lyle Shelton. He's uh, in the seat of North Sydney right now, and um, there's an interesting contest going on there between... Uh, a teal liberal and a teal independent. <laughs> yeah, g'day, Dave. Uh, g'day, Gannel. It's great to be with you tonight. Um, yes, uh, I'm in the seat of North Sydney. I'm at, actually at some friends' uh, place for dinner and to watch the election in the in uh, the suburb of Lane Cove. So we're one of them uh, those, forty ones, Kyle. That, that's right, George. Uh, <laughs> we're right here, and it, it has been interesting. Um, I've been living. Uh, on the north shore of Sydney. I'm, I'm from Toowoomba. I never forget my roots. This is um, a million miles away from where yeah, I Yeah, that's what Elbow says but, too. Yeah, I know, I know. Uh, <laughs> but um, it is amazing to see the number of Tesla vehicles getting around, uh, coal-fired <laughs> or coal-powered uh, like, vehicles, yeah. but uh, the that's people it. here don't seem to realise the difference. But um, it, it is amazing in this affluent part of Australia uh, the amount of support uh, visually for the Teal Independent, Kylie Tink, uh, for um, uh, climate change uh, activism. You see this here. And I think what we're seeing at this election, uh, if I might say, Dave, is the radical left uh, very well organised. If, if you think about this movement as a political movement, you've got the moderate Liberals, your, your Trent Zimmerman, who, who's under threat from a, a Teal. You've got uh, the, the Labor Party itself. You've got the Greens and you've got the Teals who all believe the same things on closing down uh, our coal-fired power, uh, closing down our economy to, to use unproven methods of power generation. And similarly on social policy, none of those people from the moderate Liberals through to the, the Greens through the Teals can define what a woman is. Yet this is the organised left of Australian politics uh, working towards taking both Labor to a more left position and taking the Liberal Party to a more left position at the same time. That's what we're seeing happen at this election. And uh, I think that's a real threat to the future of our nation. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, do you know the results uh, so far, early results for Eden Monaro at all? Uh, not Eden well, Monaro, I'm, not... I'm sorry, Lyle. No, look, I'm, I'm a long way from, obviously, Eden Monero, but uh, the, yeah. look, uh, I was standing by listening to you guys. I've been, like yourself, trying to uh, take in results, but uh, I, I heard um, your panel just mention that uh, Kylie Tink was ahead of Trent Zimmerman here in North Sydney. Now, look, that would be a good thing, even though, essentially, and this is what the voters don't realise, they're replacing like with like. Trent Zimmerman yeah. believes exactly what Kylie Tink believes about, about <laughs> destroying our economy uh, uh, through... Um, you know, unproven alternative power generation technologies, uh, also in terms of radical social policy. Trent Zimmerman, of course, having led uh, the Liberal uh, re uh, rebels in crossing the floor of Parliament to torpedo religious freedom. So you know, these people are very dangerous to our body politic. And um, that, but uh, I, I guess the point that I was trying to make earlier is that the, the Teals are are going after people who believe the same thing as them. So mm. you're replacing essentially a teal liberal with a teal if, if Kylie Atink does indeed prevail. The other um, thing that we have to realise is that if you look at a seat like South Brisbane, uh, sorry, um, a seat like Griffith in the southern suburbs of Brisbane, inner suburbs of Brisbane, where you've got um, Terry Butler from Labor under threat by the Greens, so you've got the Greens trying to cannibalise Labor's vote. You've got the Teals trying to cannibalise uh, the Liberals. But the effect of each of these moves is that you're making Labor go even further to the extreme left. You're making the Liberals go further to the extreme left. You can see that the, the left of politics is well organised and they're trying to move both of the major parties further left. And I think that's the phenomenon that we're seeing this election. I think that's very, very worrying for the future of our country because we don't see the same level of organisation on the centre-right of politics. 
So, so if some of these, uh, your argument is if some of these Liberals get thrown to the uh, scrap heap, it's probably better, Lyle, that uh, that left-wing element is out of the Liberal Party and sitting on the crossbench. I probably would agree with you as long as the crossbench is not in a position of power. My worry is that if that crossbench grows and we've got a hung parliament here and I'm looking, I mean, I can't, I can't work out who's winning at the moment in between Labor and, and Liberal National Coalition. It's, it's uh, this, to me, this election looks like a street fight. You know, I've, I see electorates like Lingiari, where bizarrely the, the, the National Party, or the CLP, I should say, is in front. That's unexpected. Seats like Bonner, which Labor's uh, winning. Seats like... Oh, I don't know what you think about this one, but uh, uh, what's Bridget Archer's seat? Um, Bass. 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 Yeah, Tasmania. Have you listened to this? So the uh, seat of, of, no, no, it's Braddon. It's Braddon, not Bass. It's Braddon. So on the well, seat. That's not Bridget Archer. Bridget Archer is Bass. Uh, right. That's Gavin she, Pearce's she, Braddon. She is too, on my mistake. Well, I saw some results for Bass, but they're, oh, yeah, they're here. They're here. It's not showing up. So um, Bass. It's got her in front uh, with a four percent, four point six percent swing, um, and and with a um, only a slight swing against her on primaries, uh, but two party preferred, huge swing. Now I know she was one of those that was targeted by the Australian Christian lobby and others. While um, that obviously hasn't worked, and uh, Teal Independents have beaten. Um, uh, there's other Liberals and others. So what's the uh, – wh why do you see that? Look, I, I think um, the effect of the Australian Christian Lobby's um, campaign and this is the organisation that I was with for 10 years up until uh, 2018 uh, was very much to try and um, show uh, the Liberals and show politics in general that they have campaign capability. I think it's always risky when you target key seats, um, because you may or may not make a difference. Uh, I saw one of the ACL's billboards um, on a truck driving past the polling place today uh, here on the North Shore of Sydney. When I was voting, it had the uh, image of uh, the Liberals who had crossed the floor, Dave Sharma, in that wrecking ball um, effigy of them wrecking um, Christian schooling. Uh, so look, I think the effect of that is to, um, to raise awareness, but uh, I think if anyone thought that they were going to actually move the dial i think that's a little bit optimistic but um what it's doing is showing the campaign capacity and putting parties on notice that if they annoy a key constituency uh, they do have the capacity to get mobilized yeah um just slight change of pace here but just uh staying in queensland yeah we're, we're all in queensland here a little bit biased to our, our home state uh but there's results now in for griffith and for ryan Wow. In both of those seats, there is a significant swing to the Greens. Wow. These numbers aren't yeah. that early, so they could be indicative if they hold. The Greens may take both of those seats, one from Liberal, one from Labor. So Griffith was a safe, very safe Labor seat. It now may uh, now so, may turn to a 35% Green could, vote. Could I just have a look back at, at Ryan there? I mean, the Greens are on 28. The LNP is almost on 38, so it's a 10-point difference. But you, the Labor votes, you reckon, will overwhelmingly come across straight to the Greens? Well, the Liberals don't hold uh, Ryan by a hell of a lot. So what it, what it comes mm. down to is will the Greens beat Labor? Because if the Greens beat Labor, Labor preferences flow uh, very uh, conscientiously along the head of vote cards. What percentage? Like what percentage of, of Labor voters just follow well, the head of vote the, cards? The important you know? part is uh, how, how many more percentage of Labor voters follow the head of vote cards than the Greens. So that the Greens are notoriously independently minded. Their independent mind normally yeah. gets them to go Labor, but actually it's only about 80, 85% go Labor. Whereas uh, Labor will be about 95% will go Greens. 95. Well, that, so that'll be enough to tip. So, so on these results, there's like nearly 9,000 votes counted here. There's over 9,000 votes counted. That's that's probably gone. And now Griffith, you were saying, so it's one from the Griffith Liberal column going Liberal. to the Greens. Thirty six percent a primary vote for the Greens in wow. Griffith. This is uh, West yeah. End beating well, Labor. Yeah, yes, comfortably yeah. here. So um, well, they have to beat Labor to win the seat, right? So wow. they, yeah. 
if they beat the Liberals, the Liberals' well, vote will go to well, Labor. They, they, they are beating the Liberals on these numbers here. The Liberals are sitting on uh, nearly mm. just under 30%. Well, the issue is who gets knocked out first. If the Liberals get knocked out first here, then the Liberal vote will actually keep Labor in. <laughs> I'd love to see them uh, feeding yeah. that to Terry Butler every time she stands up in Parliament. The only reason you get in is because of the LNP. But, uh, George and, and the... And the panel that that goes to the argument that I was making earlier. Labor are targeting these, uh, you know, uh, sorry, the Greens are targeting these Labor-held seats. Uh, they're trying mm -hmm. to move the dial further to the radical left, and you've got the Teals targeting, you know, not Conservatives like they did at the last election through Get Up, going after the likes of Tony Abbott's seats and Kevin Andrews and and uh, Conservatives that they try and knock off. They're actually trying to knock off like with with like. Uh, with a view to trying to move the body politic uh, further to the radical left. And I think that's the real danger that we're seeing this, this election. That's the trend that we're seeing from the organised left of Australian politics. And I don't see an equivalent counter move on the centre right. Just, so so to, to jump in, someone's just asked, um, are we going to see any good news tonight? Um, and it's a bit like that at the moment. Uh, well, let's uh, have a look at the seat of McPherson. There's a lot of uh, Freedom candidates uh, there, and um, I'm being a bit preemptive. Um, I don't even know what the result is here. So here's, I'll just give it a refresh. McPherson, 117,000 enrolled. Uh, Karen Andrews, the incumbent LNP lady, has a swing against her of 5.73%. She, she's the Home Affairs Minister too, Karen Andrews. Uh, uh, so that's so. pretty important. So um, Kevin Hargraves for Pauline Hanson's One Nation, up 2.77% on the last election. Australian Federation Party, first time can, um, showing in this seat, got 0 0.77%. Uh, the Queensland Greens got a massive whopping 20% or 19.16% yeah, yeah. in uh, in what should be a safe uh, Liberal seat. Andy Cullen, uh, been on this channel before, great champion. He's got 2.92%. Uh, Josh Berrigan from UAP, 7.9%, another great candidate. And uh, Glenn Pine for the Lib Dems, 1.82%. Uh, um, and uh, then we also have uh, Carl Unger from the Labor Party, uh, barely any more than the Greens in uh, in that neck of the woods. Yeah. So, um, yeah, the mm. Labor's not doing well. Green's doing surprisingly well in the seat of McPherson. Well, this, this boils down to a convo, and I'll, I'd like your opinion on this too. This boils down to a convo that John and I were having before we started the show. And someone said this to me the other day, that there really are only a handful of parties that we know what they stand for. Now, actually, they said two. I added the third one because I believe um, I know what the Liberal Democrats stand for. They're for liberty. They're for libertarianism. I know what One Nation stands for. It's populism. It's populist conservatism. Uh, I know what the Greens stand for. It's uh, green tinge socialism. I don't know what any other political party stands for these days. And I wonder whether this I is factoring in well uh uap uh, right free here, education uh, mining taxes <laughs> right. no 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 i'll explain it to you okay 30 seconds I'll yes the whole so, sorry i have i have I'm, I'm happy to hear it i'm happy to hear it but i do yeah. think that uap does lack an overall um vision yeah, beyond the freedom freedom Keep freedom thing seconds, so that, go tell us tell us all right so political theory imagine a a, a seesaw between caretaking and capitalizing Caretaking is looking after people. Capitalising is making money. You capitalise at the expense of caretaking. People think that they're going to... They, it triggers an instinct that people are being left behind, mm -hmm. which is what the Greens and Labor cater to. Mm -hmm. You caretake at the expense of capitalising and it triggers an, in, uh, an instinct that your society has become less competitive, which is what the right-wing economically parties um, cater to. The optimal going forward is cooperation between these two things. Now, it is actually a magic suite of policies because, as I've been saying to Labor and Greens, often falls on deaf, uh, deaf ears. But, you know, a lot of these caretaking parties will give with one hand and tax with the other. So what you find in the UAP suite of policies is a cooperation between caretaking and capitalising. There are caretaking policies, but you will never talk people out of their instinct instinct for those for those type of policies but what we've done is looked outside the box in terms of the super and the um tax in the iron ore to get the capital to do this caretaking policies while it's saying competitively capitalizing 
Yeah. So it's a cooperation between these two things, which ultimately is a cooperative, uh, unifying suite of policies. So Dave, you want to keep, keep we'll keep Lyle there in abeyance on this, but Senator Jared Rennick's on the line. Senator Rennick, Rennick welcome to uh, Freedom Speaks. Um, can you hear us okay? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Fantastic. Right. Uh, How are you? Thanks for joining. How's your day been and uh, how do you think we're going? Um, oh, look, my day's been fine. Uh, it's, it's, look, it looks like there's a swing against the coalition. Um, the Freedom Party has picked up both. Um, but, you know, it, it's hard to tell just what that final swing will be. It's a bit of a seesaw, um, isn't it, Jared? Yeah, it is a bit of a seesaw. Uh, you know, um, is there anything that's surprising you, though, mate? Well, what I've been looking at are the inner city seats. So in North Sydney at the moment, uh, Trent Zimmerman's behind, Jason Flimsky's behind in McKellar in um, uh, uh, North Sydney, you know, up in the Northern Beaches area, and both Julian Simmons and Trevor Evans are behind here in Brisbane. Um, Trevor Tim Evans, I haven't picked that one up. Bad. Yeah, I mean, behind like behind enough speech. to lose, mate, or, or what? Well, well, I mean, it's hard to tell, right, because a lot of the postals, traditionally, of course, I mean, the world is a topsy-turvy world nowadays, a lot of the postals and, and pre-polls often go, you know, favour the coalition. So, you know, it, it's, I mean, I think there's been like a record number of uh, pre-polls this time, 33%. So, you know, it, it, it's it's quite possible we could get to the end of tonight and there's going to be a lot of seats in doubt. So, um, but it's on. So i just got two questions for you. Um, one, uh, I'll start with just on what we've been talking about here. These are the so-called modern liberals. Um, that's a particular faction within your party. What do you think yeah. this says when those modern liberals seem to be losing out to either Labor or Teal Independence? Well, that's, assuming that they do lose, yeah. um, uh, or, you know, even a big swing, I guess, is still a message. Um it goes to show that appeasement isn't isn't um, a winning strategy, and that the Liberal Party doesn't win with left wing policies. Um, so, uh, you know, let's wait and see. I think it's still a bit early to make any calls yet. Mm. Um, but mm. you know, if if the early indications are right, then um, yeah, you know, going to the left, I don't think has ever um, done the, the you know the, the coalition any good. Um, yeah, you know, I'm hoping, you know, it would be good to see, you know, there's going to be a swing to the minor parties. It's a significant swing to send a message to the coalition. Because um, uh, what we, you know, what I wouldn't like to see tonight is that we lose a lot of seats to the Teals and the Teals pick up these seats. And then, you know, the, the minority parties, you know, only pick up two or three percent. And that's the Teals get all the attention as usual. Mm. Um, and, you know, I don't want to, you know, I know I bang on about this a lot, but it's a serious issue. Um, and things like vaccine mandates are left behind while we go chasing the climate change mm. dream again. Um, what, 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 what about that? What about what, vaccine mandate? What, what about what, what has this election said about freedom and about how Australians value their freedom? Because it seems that um, we're getting a lot of disappointment around the place, mate. Well, well let's see. I mean, the combined minor party vote on, of the Freedom Party at this stage looks to be around 10%, but it's hard to tell that because I'm looking at seat by seat. So, you know, uh, uh, you know, the Senate will give us a better indication, and I must admit we have, I haven't looked at the Senate yet, and you'll get a lot of people do tend to vote differently in the Senate because they'll, you know, they, they know that's the way it works in the lower house. It's compulsory preferential. Mm -hmm. So your vote always ends up with one of the main two if, if you know, um, in most occasions, if there's no independent or something in that seat. So mm. um, the Senate will be a better indicator of, yeah. I think, the freedom party. Um, but, you know, it, it's that combined vote. But, you know, I say it's the combined vote, but obviously when you're splitting it between four or five parties and say it's one party gets 2.5, another 3.6 and another 4.1, it doesn't sound as sexy as the Greens on 12, right? Whereas we had one Conservative Party, um, a minority, you know, Freedom Party, but it was one. Uh, yeah, I'll call it a Conservative Freedom Party. But it, and it was at 10 or 12%. It would send a much stronger message, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Um, so, yeah. Uh, not a question, but a comment. Wentworth results have come in, and uh, at the moment, Sharma is uh, getting massacred there. Oh, there's um, another one. So that mm. looks like three but, teals in New South Wales uh, to join the existing 
teal coloured independence. Oh, that's so scary, but, but, Jared. That's scary. You know, what, what, yeah. what, what's, what's interesting about this is it's, it's Get Up has rebagged themselves as teal. Yeah. Right. Now, Get Up had a bit of a stint to their name after 2019. It was a bit odious and people didn't like Get Up, right? Now they've rebadged the teal. So they've virtually sort of rebadged themselves as conservatives when they're you know, it's sort of somewhere between Marxism and communism and socialism, a bit of everything. <laughs> um, uh, and, and now people, I think, you know, these so-called... And, and the irony of it is they keep positioning themselves as this centre party, right? But these people are, are, are nowhere near the centre. I mean, these people are wealthy. You know, they live in wealthy, affluent suburbs. So, you know, Zoe Daniels, for example, you know, works at the ABC all her life. Allegra Spender, you know, she's the daughter of um, Carlos M. Patty. Uh, you know, she comes from a wealthy background. Yeah. Um, they're out of touch, but, you know, yet again, um, very cleverly, I mean, as much as I hate to say it, have rebranded themselves as this centre party that, you know, and, and I'll tell you what we've got to do on the right hand, you know, right, right side of politics. We've got to distinguish between the environment and climate change. You know, I, I don't think, I think we can honestly, yeah, like, I, I love the inside of, you know, I, I grew up sixth generation Australian farming family, um, you know, love, love to bushwalk, mountain bike, rock climb, all that stuff, right? So it's not like I don't care about the environment. Mm, I just mm. don't believe the science of climate change. I mean, you know, heat kinetic energy, the energy of motion. The idea that heat gets trapped is an oxymoron. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, you know, we and this is the thing, instead of actually debating the point um, with, with the other side, we, we sort of crab walk away and then sort of come crab walking back again Yep. Instead of actually arguing the point with conviction on actual science itself, rather than the indoctrination and intimidation. Well, mate, um, um, just to put an exclamation mark after what you've said, uh, with nearly seven and a half thousand votes counted, Katie Allen's looking to lose the seat of Higgins to Labor. Um, so, uh, wow. you know, yeah. across Victoria, I think Chisholm also looks like it's gone, and Deakin was even uh, looking line more. So that's not Gee. looking great was down there. By the way, just as you were speaking, you, you were asking about the Senate votes. I was curious, so I quickly put them together, combining One Nation, UAP and Lib Dems. It's early numbers still, but uh, in New South Wales on 10.7, if the preferences uh, are swapped tightly enough, 10.7 is enough uh, or should be. In Victoria, 13.1 would certainly be enough. Yep. Very close contest there. Who gets it? Who, who leads? Uh, in, who, who leads though? Uh, one Nation uh, for most of them. Wow. Uh, and in, in One Queensland, nation Senator for Victoria. It doesn't, doesn't seem to have a ring of truth about it, but anyway, I no, hope so. I, I don't think it will hold true, but we'll, we'll see did where you, that goes. Uh, and in Queensland, did you guys uh, just say that um, well, Deacon had gone as well? Well, it's not gone. It's I still just early. I just noticed that Labor was in right. front at the moment, but it's still early numbers down there. So mm. that's... J J Jared, you, you have been. Just Can we just uh, maybe warrior. just let let Lyle go? We've uh, also this is something else Lyle wants to say. Yeah, I don't want to um, say goodbye straight away. But Lyle, um, uh, final thoughts, uh, points uh, for you, reflecting on Jared, or any other thoughts about the teal battle in uh, North Sydney between yeah. um, the Trent Zimmerman and the teal independent. No, well, well, thanks, fellas. I will have to go after this. And, and uh, it's great to hear your comments, uh, Senator Rennick, uh, just on the line there. Um, look, as I said earlier, I just want to hammer this point. We're seeing uh, the, the uh, left of Australian politics now. It constitutes everything from the modern liberals right through to the Teals to Labor and, and the Greens. And they are very organised. And what we've seen tonight, and uh, if, these, if these trends of these early numbers continue, we are in for a Labor, Teal, Green government. And uh, I think this um, bodes uh, very poorly for the centre right of politics. And it's going to mean that the centre right of politics is going to have to stand up and speak publicly about the things that they believe in. And we've got to see the uh, parliamentarians of substance uh, having some courage to actually stand up and speak what they know in their heart to be right. Uh, this has been the Seinfeld election campaign. It's been the election campaign about nothing from both Anthony Albanese and Scott Morrison. Albanese hadn't, hasn't had to do the hard work because he's got the Teals and the Greens and the modern Liberals doing it for him. And Scott Morrison has just been uh, minding the shop, as you guys were saying earlier. And that's not good enough to uh, persuade people uh, with a narrative that will cause them to want to vote for your side of politics. That's why we're losing. So uh, I think we're in for uh, at least one election cycle, possibly two or three of real pain in this country with a very hard left government uh, that all believe the same things from the moderate liberals right through to the teals, to the greens, to labor. 
Uh, that's the ideology that's going to be running our country for the next uh, three to nine years. Those ones. Lyle, thank you so much for uh, joining us tonight. I appreciate your commentary, all your hard work uh, for a very long time, and I hope you enjoy a restful election night with your friends. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me. Too easy. Uh, Senator Rennick, um, we've got some uh, nice things. I'm, I'm sure you get lots of uh, hate as well as some uh, love, but uh, we've got some love for you in the comments. Uh, Ness says, Senator Rennick, you've been a hero of truth for the people throughout this pandemic. Thank you very much. And T.R. Johnson says, um, Senator Rennick, you are my absolute favourite politician. Thank you for everything you have done for the Australian people in recent years. You are amazing. So grateful. Thank you. Um, did we have one last question for Senator Rennick before we let him go from the panel? George? Uh, Rob? Yep. Yeah, well, the question was just on the back of that. Uh, Jared, you have been just an absolute warrior for freedom but within the government. If there were more people like you, then uh, we would we would be, uh, oh, well, you know, who knows what others on the panel were doing, but I'd certainly be still within the LNP, mate. Um, yeah. Where, where, where do you think things have gone wrong that has led to this fragmentation of the vote on the right? And it is so obvious that there's such a fragmentation. Well, I'll put it down to two things. Um, the first one was a change when we signed up the net zero. Now, there were two issues with that. Number one, you know, was the ideology itself. Um, because, you know, as I just explained, the science of climate change and the fact that carbon dioxide is going to cause the, you know, destruction of mankind on Earth is just, just absurd. Um, and when we, you know, and, and we've allowed the left to turn it into a, a debate about climate change, not the environment. And, you know, if we, if we were to turn this around and say, do you really want solar panels? Do you really want batteries? Do you really want windmills and, and all, the, all the garbage that goes with it and the recycling problems they're going to cause down the track? You know, we, we could win this argument back, back with a basic thermodynamics. Now, and, and the second issue with that climate change issue was we went to the last election and said we wouldn't sign up to it, right, Parrot? And and I'll just note that this week, you know, you know, I think um, there was an article in The Garden, Guardian by Fat Checker calling us out for being concerned about, you know, the, the WHO meeting next week in Switzerland um, and saying that there's no treaties don't mean anything, we're not going to lose our sovereignty, well, directly speaking, that's correct. But as you well know, these treaties, you know, you, when we sign up to them, we give them credibility, and then when we give them credibility, they get influence over us. And we yeah. know that mm -hmm. because the last three years, or six, or last 20 years, really, been a big hoo-ha about the environment. Last year, we had UNESCO up on the reef, you know, threatening to downgrade the reef. I know through my experience as a tax, you know, uh, you know, working on international taxation, tax treaties, you know, that means we lose billions of dollars a year offshore. Um, you know, the Franklin Dam decision was all about whether or not the federal government could override states based on it, on foreign treaties. Um, so anyway, we, we made a promise three years ago that we didn't keep. So that, that just for a lot of people has really annoyed them uh, for a lot of the base. And then, of course, the second issue is is that we, we basically walked away from our values with this entire COVID hysteria. Mm -hmm. Now, had we come out early on and said, look, you know, there's a, I mean, we were never going to sort of be able to completely ignore it because of the worldwide paranoia through the media, right? But we, we, we and I, I was happy to draw a line at closing the borders, but I could international borders, that is, yeah, not but not the domestic borders, yep. right? Not the domestic borders, not the lockdowns, um, and then the subsequent, subsequent, obviously, vaccine rollout. Now, a year ago, my view on the vaccine rollout was, well, look, I, I had doubts it was ever going to be that effective, or if it was going to be effective, it would only last for you know, maybe a season and, and then we'd have to go through it all over again. But I, I never didn't think this time a year ago that it was going to be as dangerous as what it turned out to be. Um, so, you know, we had the issue, of course, where we override people's civil liberties in the first instance with the border closures and the lockdowns, domestic border closures, the lockdowns, etc. cetera. Um, and then, you know, initially the rollout, I think we handled it okay in terms of the vaccine because we never really pushed it that hard. Um, you know, and that was sort of, partly keeping with our philosophy. But then we allowed the states to mandate it. And, of course, as the states started to mandate, it was about the same time we came out with the injuries. So mandating in itself was bad enough. But then when you had people being injured and then lose, and then being forced to lose their jobs as more and more injuries were becoming apparent, I mean, that, that was just cruel and unnecessary, right? So, you know, and, and this is the problem. While, I, you know, there's an argument to say that, you know, the states are doing it, and to a degree that's correct. You know, what we needed to, we could have stopped it in a heartbeat by just saying, 
um, well, look, we think the vaccine's dangerous, we're going to stop the rollout. Or you could have turned around and said to the states, well, look, we don't believe in mandates, we don't believe in what you're doing, we're not going to buy any more drugs, you know, vaccines for you. You can actually buy them if you indemnify the people and, and everything, right? Um, but we didn't do that, right? So, um, so they, that, 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 they were two reasons, I guess, why we were fragmented. But then, you know, there's been a gradual shift throughout our nine years in power whereby we never really stood up for the values of, of you know, conservatism um, and, you know, or, or libertarianism or, or, you know, in, individual uh, dignity, I guess. Um, you know, to, you know and, and the other angle there would have been, um, you know, for the conservatives for the religious discrimination bill. Now, arguably, we did try and push that through, um, but ironically enough, many of the people that cross are going to lose their seats tonight um, for yeah. doing it. Um, like which yet again shows that appeasing the left is not a winning solution. I mean, you don't, the Liberal Party doesn't win government, you know, pushing, um, you know, left wing, um, uh, or, or, you know, sort of the values that don't belong in that party. So, yeah, um, uh, yeah so, so look, we, we are fragmented. Um, and look, I mean, you know, it's probably no secret I was never the biggest fan of Scott Morrison. Um, initially, look, initially I had a bit of time for him uh, over that bush riding because I, I thought he was unfairly treated there. Likewise, yeah. Uh, so. Because, you know, ultimately emergency services is a state issue. Um, yeah, it's true. And, you know, and now, you know, I, I get if you know, but this is where we've got to recognise that, you know, that, that state issue now is not what it used to be, mm. you, know, uh, you know, 50 years ago. And, and I know that One Nation called for a Royal Commission into COVID. I've got to be honest with you, I initially agreed with it, but the more I look at it, I think, why put the ch- judges in charge of COVID? They, they've done nothing. They, they didn't, you know, um, support Clive Palmer in trying to keep the borders open. They're not going to, they're not supporting us now with mandates. Mm-hmm. Why, why, you know, basically then the fox into the hen house. My, I would actually rather have a constitutional convention where we sort out the roles and responsibilities of the state. Mm. And I think there needs to be a serious question, do we still want states or do we go back to super region? Now, George, you, you're a Mackay boy. Um, you know, do we give Mackay its own super region, maybe in, in conjunction with Rocky <coughs> or, or Townsville, um, uh, and, and say have 50 or 60 super regionals across the country and then reporting into the federal government with a clear line of responsibility between the two? I mean, look at Great Britain, for example. 66 million people, they don't have states. They have a national government and then they have their um, counties or their local council um, or, or what are those uh, boroughs or whatever, you know, mm-hmm. Park here or yep. Oxford or whatever. <clears throat> um, so, and New Zealand's the same as well. And I, I've been contacted by many people, you know, when New Zealand rolled back some stuff and, and the UK rolled back some stuff and they've asked me, are we going to do the same thing here? And as I've had to reply, I've said, well, no, because we've got six different states and two different territories plus the federal government. So even if you've got one state to roll um, some laws back, you, you, you know, you've got to get the other five states to do it. So, And I have to say, I'm disappointed in the Liberal Party of New South Wales for not rolling more back. Because the first you know, state that was to roll back these ridiculous mandates, and if you had people that were in another state that couldn't work in that state, nurses and teachers in particular, um, and to a lesser extent policemen, well, everyone would move to that state and, and they could possibly solve a lot of their issues because they'd have a, a great supply of, of qualified labour ready to jump on board. Yeah. Um, but this probably uh, isn't so, right. I actually want to bring Ross Cameron in now. He's yeah, been yeah. waiting uh, patiently with us uh, on, on the side there. Um, Ross, uh, what do you think about uh, what jared has been saying? Well, I think Jared uh, Rennick is a sage. Uh, he would be probably one of the seven sages uh, of the Liberal Party if indeed we could find another six. Um, <laughs> um, you know, I agree with every word. And, Alex Antic, um, I found one more. I found one more. Yeah, Alex Antic, he's there. Um, so you've basically got two blokes um, who's, um, you know, who, who still, um, their soul still strikes a chord uh, with reality. And you've then got this vast herd um, of, you know, of, of ungulates, um, of, of sheep and cattle who have basically been lobotomised. Um, in truth, you, you know, the point that Jared makes, which is so obvious, is that when we talk about the Liberal Party, uh, we're not actually talking about a unified organism. 
And uh, indeed, uh, Aristotle said in relation to a work of art, uh, its first principle must be unity, uh, coherence. Yet we find in the Liberal Party an organism which is fatally split. And what has happened uh, is that the organism in this election has simply fallen between stools uh, because it was not sufficiently coherent to occupy one or the other. And it doesn't, it's been divided between these wealthy, urban, coastal, progressive uh, representatives and what I regard as the ballast uh, in the ship, the uh, quiet Australians, the Howard Battlers, the uh, ordinary, normal, risk-exposed citizens um, who, who, whose income doesn't fall into the account every two weeks on a Thursday afternoon, ka-chink, ka-chink, regardless of their performance. I mean, these are people who have actually got to find a customer. These are people who have a hostile bank manager who say how far behind you have fallen behind in your payments. Uh, these are people who are facing the unfair dismissals action because they've tried to sack an employee who was stealing from them. Um, you know, these are the schools uh, which are walking on eggshells because they don't know whether or not they can employ or sack a particular teacher uh, because they have some nasty big federal bureaucracy breathing down their neck telling them who they may or may not employ. And the Liberal Party has simply been like the spectator at Wimbledon looking from side to side entirely... Mm. Um, unsure about what it stands for. And so the consequence is all we're seeing an absolute clean out of the so-called modern liberals. Um, you know, the modern liberals in um, North Sydney um, and, you know, um, Wentworth and Goldstein uh, and it, it would seem McKellar um, are just getting cleaned out. Because people are saying, well, if you want to give me a soft, wet, left, progressive, irrational sort of uh, politics as the godless uniting church, um, we are going to give you uh, the, the, the better alternative. And, uh, yeah. you know, if you want a daft green the left... Ideal um, limitation when you can have the real thing. That's, the, that's Yeah, exactly. Be. Exactly. So... As a result, you know, as Jared says, um, this little monologue will eventually um, draw to a conclusion. Um, <laughs> the point is that it's meant that those who have to appeal to the at-risk class have not had a message um, that resonates. And what it means is if you're in the at-risk class, we can't go to them and say, look, boys and girls, um, we are out of the Paris Agreement. Um, we can't go to them and say all of those pensioners who are shivering under a rug in front of a bar heater, they can only afford to turn on during certain hours of the day uh, because of energy prices doubling over the period in which the coalition has been in government. Um, we can't say to them there's any relief for you uh, because the daft Morrison government has committed itself to carbon zero 2050. So... They've gotten caught between a rock and a hard place. They have fallen between stools. They have to figure out what they believe because at the moment they believe absolutely nothing. So, J Roscoe, uh, Jared, if you, Jared's still on the line? Yeah, mate, I'm here. Yeah. So listen to this. Right? I can't believe this. I'm pulling up the Australian and, and we're talking about all of these modern liberals basically going to get wiped out by either Teal Independence, Greens or Labor, right? Everywhere, um, apart from Bridget Archer and Tassie. And yet you have uh, Simon Birmingham attacking Catherine Davies. Deves. Uh, Deves, sorry. Deves for um, losing the seat of Warringah, saying that the parties paid a price for pre-selecting her. Oh, my um, goodness. And uh, this is the reason why they lost Warringah. Well, uh, what Simon. does it say about... The other modern liberals, if uh, Catherine Devies is the reason one seat, which they didn't hold, by the way, which everyone expected was probably going to stay in the hands of the independent. And yet all of these seats, uh, Brisbane, Ryan, uh, North Sydney, where else have we got? We've got Kuyong, even possibly Kuyong, um, uh, Higgins. Uh, where else, John? 
for the independents. Uh, they look like getting four at the moment. McKellar, McKellar is actually line ball at the moment. Jason Falinski is, is now in Wentworth. front by 0.08%. <laughs> wow. Oh. Yeah. Can I, can I put a word in for Jason Falinski? Um, I know he's considered a wet. Um, I, I actually got on all right with Jason. He, he wasn't as wet as I think, he, you know, he, he's kind of been tagged wet because he's up I would there agree with that. that. Um, you know, eastern suburbs. But, you know, he didn't cross the floor on religious discrimination. Um, and, you know, I've had quite a few conversations with, with Jason. And, I, I, and you know, he's in one of those electorates where they go hard on this stuff. Um, yeah. And I, I know that he does it through gritted teeth. Um, you know, like, like he's one of the better guys, unlike, well, I've got to be careful how I say this because I'm in the Senate with him, but, you know, he, you know, unlike Simon Birmingham, who, you know, has to go catch the team, yep. um, uh, you know, uh, yes, yeah, some of these guys, um, I, I can sort of, um, you know, he, he, But Jared, he, Jared, you know, Jared, you know okay, yeah. let's say you're going to say, you know, Jason's a, a decent enough like to have a cup of coffee with. Um, yep. We are going into um, an... And people talk about a climate crisis, uh, the greatest load of garbage I've ever heard in my life. You know, you've yeah. got uh, the, the idea that human-generated uh, uh, carbon dioxide represents a, quote, crisis uh, for the earth uh, is obviously um, unmitigated bullcrap. Yet we find we've got an energy grid which is stuttering uh, and lurching towards implosion because like a game of Jumanji, we're pulling out the coal-fired power stations one by one to drop the stalls to get closer and closer and closer to the stall speed of the whole grid. And Jason Falinski's biggest contribution is to go to his electorate and say, well, I fought to stop the exploration of gas off the coast of New South Wales, and I am committed. Yeah, I can't argue with you, Ron. Yeah. You know, yeah. I just say, mate, you, yeah. you don't deserve to win. Um, if you have already given up on the biggest issues confronting the nation, then I'm sorry, I would rather pay you to stay home. You know, the, the truth yeah. is the voters of Australia would get a much better result if no member of the uh, Liberal Party of Australia, except for Gerard Rennick and Alex Antic, actually went to work. Uh, if they all just went to a, uh, a resort in Bali... Um, we, the Australians would get a better deal. And, you know, what we're seeing now is a consequence... Not, not out of not, labour, Ross, to be fair, not out of labour. Yeah, yeah okay. Um, if what, The Liberal Party's got to accept the fact that they gave up two decades ago. And so we have not had a Liberal leader who was prepared to look the Australian electorate in the eye as the most carbon, quote, exposed economy in the world... Uh, as the, you know, the whole of New South Wales politics has been defined by a coal seam stretching from Newcastle to the Hunter Valley. We've got the world's, we've got 40% of the world's uranium in one hole in the ground. Um, and yet uh, we are producing the highest prices of electricity in the world and then talking about an Australian manufacturing sector. I mean, the problem is liberal leaders um, from... Uh, both in government and opposition, have flirted, have played footsies, have compromised and has fed the crocodile, which today these Liberal members look like um, zebra crossing the Mara River uh, mm -hmm. in the face of a massive pod of hungry crocodiles who are just deciding which one of these dark bastards we're going to pick off in which order. And they deserve it. Because if you're not prepared to put, when we put a, Donald Trump put a red-blooded proposition to the American people in 2016. He said, we're getting out of Paris. And he won comfortably. The 2019 election, as Gerard says, Bill Shorten described it as a referendum on climate change. And guess what? Bill Shorten lost. Yet still, notwithstanding that, you know, we get our mate Dutz, Peter Dutton, you know, allegedly the hope of the side, this big conservative, well, he was the guy who brokered and negotiated the deal to bring the National Party over the line 
in exchange for elevating one, you know, ambitious National Party member back into Cabinet and about a $20 billion bribe, the whole of the National Party flipped in one go to save Josh Frydenberg and Trent Zimmerman, sorry asses in, you know, in, 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 in Goldstein and in Kew and in North Sydney. And these guys are gutless and they haven't had the, the conviction or the, the courage to advocate the truth and now they're getting belted for it. Yeah, now, Ross, just quickly. Um, yeah, George, I mean, I can't sorry. argue with that, yeah. Just quickly, Ross, you were a Liberal Party member um, for almost a decade for the seat of Parramatta um, and, and you obviously had the career in Sky News. Uh, but are, are you in a, a different political party now? Did you contest? Look, I, I have not contested any seat. I've spent the day in the car with Rob Cribb, the New South Wales president of the Liberal Democratic Party. Right. Uh, and with John Ruddick, the number one Senate candidate. And we've been going boot to boot around Sydney, a meeting with a terrific uh, collection of candidates and volunteers. The Liberal Democrats, I think, I mean, Rob Cribb may correct me, I think they ran in the lower house at the last federal election, I'm guessing 10 seats, 10 seats the Liberal Democrats won, r ran in. This election, they'll be running in 100 seats. So you've had a tenfold increase in the seats in which people have an option on a Liberal Democratic Party candidate. And I joined really um, on the encouragement and urging of my son, Dougal, um, who said to me, Dad, um, you know, after getting suspended from the Liberal Party um, for five years, I didn't get expelled. Uh, they said, we can do without your company for five years. Um, so when I was eligible to rejoin, I just thought, well, do, you know, I, I, I'm enough of a gentleman, not very much, um, but enough uh, to be reluctant to impose myself on a conclave if they're not really sure if they want me or not. Whereas I was very much welcomed, uh, notwithstanding my obvious defects and flaws, um, into the Liberal Democrats. And I have to say, I have found a very happy home um, among, you know, a party which still actually believes in liberalism and indeed in the UK Liberal Democrats who have gone off piste, uh, but nonetheless have a tradition that when a new leader is elected, he is presented with a copy of John Stuart Mill's On Liberty, probably the most influential document in philosophy of the 19th century. Um, and, you know, this is the idea that individuals are at their best when they are at their freest. And this is a very ancient idea indeed. This is uh, Aristotle. Um, that, you know, we, we are nothing if not free and that our real challenge is to retain the courage to protect each other's freedom to be ourselves. And I am a, you know, I don't have perfectly uh, smooth or straight edges as a human being and a personality. It helps me if people give me a little bit of space to be myself. My mind is not a perfectly ordered machine. So I want as much freedom as possible. And I find that absolutely, um, it's like a hand in glove in the Liberal Democratic Party, which is made up of lots of very different people. Not everyone in the Liberal Democratic Party agrees on every issue. Uh, but there is this sense, this bedrock sense that giving each other the freedom to be ourselves is actually more important than the result on the individual issues. So, George, that's uh, where I am now, a happy Liberal Democrat. I've got to say, Ross, we, we love having you in the party. It's certainly made it more entertaining uh, at our <laughs> regular meeting as well. So to, to, to just, I think uh, Jared has to run in a sec, but I was hoping to – I'll squeeze in a quick comment and then a question for you, Jared. Um, first of all, this probably isn't the right time to do, do a deep dive into philosophical discussions. In terms of your earlier idea about regional governments, can I just put it to you that there's nothing preventing those regional governments from actually being states. Uh, you can simply create – I don't know how many regional governments you said, 50 – so let's create uh, yeah. 44 more states. The benefit of that approach is they would have constitutional rights and that would allow them to mm. actually push back against the federal government. If these are regional governments, the federal government will walk all over them. Power will be centralized. Yep. Now, I'm instinctively skeptical of centralizing political power, centralizing any power, but especially political power. 
So anyway, that, that's the comment for, for the ether. But I did have a, a question. I, I'm just cognizant of the time and we've taken a lot of yours. I had a, feel free to comment on that, but a, a question for you. It came up earlier. I think um, Dave asked the question uh, about the need perhaps for these freedom friendly minor parties to at some stage uh, look to, to merge or coalesce Ooh. or combine in, in some form. Uh, and I think it's an interesting idea. It's one that I think is impeded by the number of uh, egos and conflicting approaches involved. Uh -huh. To my mind, the only way that works is if prominent people from the Liberal Party get out of the Liberal Party and offer themselves up to be a leader of a third movement. Uh, that's all of the other parties can fall in behind them. So, Jared, you going to do that for us? <laughs> Well, it's, um, we'll take that offline later on. <laughs> uh, um, We're there with you, Jared. We're going yeah. into the trenches, mate. Let's go. I've just got, um, <laughs> so we've got, I'm just looking at Channel 9 overall national numbers here, right? One Nation's on 100, and this is lower house, One Nation, you know, One Nation and, and co, you know, the minor parties get more in the Senate. So they've got 175,000 nationally. United Australia Party has got 145,000, um, and then others, and this doesn't include the independent deal, it's about 130,000. So that combined would then put us 170, uh, 160, um, 290, uh, and then that puts us up to 430, which then jumps us in front of the green. That would then give us a combined overall vote, you know, oh, well, here we've got 1859, nine, about 15% of the vote, if, if you had that. So going to your question, if you, you know, hypothetically had the minor parties, you know, freedom slash conservative parties combined, you're looking at about 15% of the vote, um, which with a bit of work um, and, say, sharing your poll, you know, on, on your booths, you were sharing resources amongst booths rather than conglomerating in certain booths, um, picking better, you know, picking the best of the three candidates um, and then running them longer, got that to 20, 25%. Suddenly in some seats, you know, and I'd be looking at out of, out of metropolitan cities. You, you, you've got a chance of getting into that top two, so that the preferences start flowing. Um, and and fifteen percent guarantees you a senate spot in every state in every election. So within two election cycles, they're sitting at twelve senators like the Greens are. So suddenly they've got the balance of power when the Conservatives are in power. Does that make sense? Um, so uh, look, I, I I don't know what I'm going to do. That's the honest answer at this stage, but um, that but, but that is a good question because you know fifteen percent combined is a good number. I mean, it would have been better to get twenty from the point of view of the minor party, but they can get somewhere, and they may even get twenty percent in the Senate yet. I'm yet to look at the Senate figures, um, but together because there will be leakage, and I know that from last time. It's very hard to keep the discipline on the card because if you don't get your orders correct. You, you could actually end up exhausting your vote before it, and it doesn't go to the people still in the race. Um, and so it's, it's, it's not as easy as just picking six numbers uh, and, and, and not being majors. You've got to do it in the right order. Um, so, uh, you know, there will be leakage there. So, look, it's, it's the question for the, you know, that is a, is a legitimate question. Can I just go back to the whole idea that you're going to centralise power in Canberra? That's not what I want to do. I'm looking at actually pushing more power down to the region so that, you know, especially here in... We've lost sound. Okay, guys. Well, look, I'll, Sorry. Ed, I'll let you go. Sorry, George, um, thanks, yeah. look, I, I agree with you about the idea of regional governments. I just put as a, as a thought bubble out there, if you do it through yeah. regional governments, uh, Canberra always has the whip hand. If you do it by just creating 40 new states, you achieve the exact same outcome that Canberra doesn't have the whip hand. All right. I'm not yeah, that yeah, yeah. Well, I'll, I'll, qualify, I'll qualify all that by just saying, no, you've got to have a clear role and role, role, you know, clarify the roles and responsibilities between the state and federal government. I mean, so that the, the federal government can't hold a whip hand over um, the state or vice versa. And, and to do that, you've got to fix, fix up the vertical fiscal imbalance. That's the biggest problem we've got. Um, Agreed. Uh, but look, um, yeah, that's that's a conversation that needs to be had. And anyway, have a good night. Uh, we'll, we'll no doubt we'll be um, analysing it in the weeks to come. Thanks okay, a lot for coming on, Jared. Thank Appreciate you, Jared. It. I'll just say too, I had this conversation a lot of times during the campaign. At the end of the day, the Overton window is fractured so much that we want such radically different things. 
that the most cooperative thing we could probably do in a lot of ways is peacefully separate. Mm -hmm. So the more that we can allow that with smaller polities, I think it's going to be a hugely positive thing because I'd say what out on the campaign trail, we don't see eye to eye. We don't have any value to each other at all. We can see this in the results uh, between different regions in Australia. It's right. uh, You couldn't get more different if you tried. Do we have um, Senator Roberts on the line yet? Oh, no. Yes, yes indeed. They are. Yes. Might be. And also the candidate for Dawson for Pauline Hanson's One Nation, Julie Hall. Uh, so uh, welcome, guys. Uh, results not what we uh, wanted it in the seat of Dawson tonight, but still an increase in the One Nation vote. And I notice a, a lowering of the uh, of the LNP vote somewhat. Uh, uh, how are you feeling? Do you want well, to answer that? Yeah, I'm, I'm proud of what I've done. That's, that's the main thing. Um, I gave it all I got. I gave, gave it 100%. And I could tell you I absolutely loved it and you haven't seen the last of me yet. That's really good news because we're very, very proud of it. The way she's campaigned... Uh, and we thank you for your support, George, as well, and your your mentoring. It's been wonderful. Uh, there's something else to remember, and that is that um, the Freedom Party vote in primary vote would be split amongst several several uh, major minor parties, if you know what I mean. And so, twenty seven percent. Well, this one sorry, of it. it's, it's almost it's about twenty seven percent in terms of the minor party that the Freedom Party vote rather in. In Dawson, by my calculation, so that's it's it's quite large. Well, we haven't got away from the camera, and we just had the the Mackay Mercury reporter in here, so we haven't seen any numbers. Uh, but that's very encouraging, and that's what I would have thought. So, number one is that um, a lot of those voters' preferences will come to Julie, so that means Julie's vote will be considerably higher, George, as you know. Mm. Um, mm. And, and certainly uh, the other thing that, that Julie's done is she's, she's planted a stake in the ground here very, very firmly, and she's planted a stake not just for, for uh, One Nation vote, but especially for people who are waking up to realise the damage that the Liberal Nationals and Labor Greens coalitions have caused this country over the last 78 years. And I'm not exaggerating, 78 years since the formation of the UN. They are now waking up thanks to the mis gross mismanagement between the Labor state government colluding with the federal Liberal Nationals, the gross mismanagement of COVID, the deceitful, dishonest mismanagement of COVID. They haven't managed the virus. They have control, they have used the virus to control people. And people are waking up and they're waking up to the whole mismanagement of our country and the ceding of our sovereignty to overseas interests from the United Nations and World Economic Forum. 27% of people are awake. We see a lot of people still needing to wake up to what's happening to our country. But Julie's done a remarkable job in, in doing that. Malcolm, uh, uh, and I'm going to stop because I'm asking all the questions here and the other people ask, but I, 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 I'm wanting to know, if you, you probably haven't seen the Senate vote across the state, but at the moment it's showing One Nation in third place, as we'd expect, with 12.37%. I've got to say it's only on about uh, a bit under 33,000 votes. Um, that's not quite a quota, but it's probably enough that uh, yeah. Pauline Hanson is definitely re-elected. Um, Raj and I miss out on that uh, on that effort there. Um, but uh, uh, <laughs> missed it by that much. Um, but... Uh, what do you think of that uh, result? I mean, I, I'm, I'm bewildered as what's going to happen here because currently we've got 2.7 for the LNP. So it says to me they're definitely going to get two in, perhaps a third. Labor, 1.2, they'll only get one in. Uh, then One Nation, obviously, what I just said, that Pauline will be returned. Uh, and then we've got Greens on 0.5. Legalised cannabis, believe it or not, is the next highest and then UAP. Uh, I expect that, I don't know what happened there to get legalised cannabis, uh, basically sixth on the list, one, two, three, four, four five, fifth. fifth on the list. Uh, mm -hmm. Anyway, um, a lot of people smoking what they're growing around the place. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? How did the LDP perform? Uh, they come in just behind um, UAP. UAP. So there's 5.24% of the vote for UAP and... 2.31% for the Liberal Democrats. 
So Clive looks like he's the next in running for if there's a second freedom candidate. Or, or ultimately, some more votes going to One Nation on preferences. Is uh, that possible? One Nation is behind. It, 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 One Nation isn't at a full quota yet, which means it's impossible for the no, second person to be that's elected. That's true. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So it, it, it will just be Pauline. I think Pauline was always a shoe in, quite frankly, and, and it looks like she is. Twelve point four percent is going to be well enough for her to get up, especially yes. if she's got good preference flows in, in Queensland. John, uh, just very quickly, uh, somebody asked earlier on what is a quota. So if you can just answer that in the, the super concept quick. of a quota or what the number is. The, the, the concept yes, of a quota both. is what percentage do you need to get elected? Uh, and the answer for that in, in the lower house, in the House of Representatives, is 50% plus one. So that's, the, that's what everyone's used to. You need to get 50% of the votes to win. Uh, in the Senate, the quota is a bit different because six people are elected at a time from each state. Uh, and because of that, you don't need 50%. You need 14.3%. So 14.3 is the magic number. Realistically, you can get a bit less than that and still get elected, uh, both because of preferences and also because under the new voting system brought in by Turnbull and the Greens, but I repeat myself, uh, under the new voting system, uh, votes can uh, expire. Uh, and so the last couple of people in the Senate can be elected on less than the full quota. So 14.3 is the magic number. Uh, but quite frankly, the 12.3, 12.4 12 that uh, Pauline has at the moment is well enough because she does pick up preferences. One Nation has good preference flows in Queensland. It's the only state where they do. Uh, and also that would even be enough for the last spot even without preferences. So Pauline is comfortably in. Um, the interesting question is, I think Pauline will be elected fifth. The interesting question is who gets the sixth spot? And it looks genuinely at the moment like it's a race between, uh, well, I mean, I assume Labor will eventually get their second spot. Uh, but. The, the Greens versus Clive versus Amanda Stoker, who uh, on the numbers you just showed me there, George, mm. uh, Amanda Stoker, the third candidate for the LNP, uh, looks like she's still in with a very serious shot. Of course, this was a very risky election for her. Running against Pauline and Clive and Campbell Newman at the same time is, is a tall order. But uh, we mentioned before about some of the good people left in the coalition. I would put Amanda in that, uh, in that category as well. So I, I think the other thing, John... The other thing, John the other, the other thing, John, yeah. is, and, and to answer George's question, um, is how does it look in the other states? Because Pauline and I have been able to pull off some quite remarkable things, and I'm not trying to brag here, but quite remarkable things uh, against the odds in the Senate with two of us, with, say, two, three, four, five, maybe six, if they're looking promising in the other states, that will give us a true balance of power in our own right. So yes, it sir. would be very handy to, to see in three weeks where we stand across the, across the nation in the other states. So you're on Just five. a quick note. There's some people asking, how come Malcolm's not running? Did Malcolm win? Uh, the Senate, only half people go up uh, every three years because a senator is elected for six years. And so we don't elect them all at once. We only elect half at a time every election. So Malcolm's halfway through a six-year term and we'll uh, need your support in three years. So to answer your question, New South Wales, uh, one, one Nation, your party is sitting on 5.5%. Um, that's probably not going to be uh, no. enough. It might be. Uh, it, depends how, it depends how tightly the preferences flow between the freedom-friendly minor parties. Because, of course, uh, the UAP, uh, the Lib Dems, One Nation have preferenced each other quite close to the top, within the top four, I think, with all of us uh, in the Senate. If people follow those how to vote cards, 5.5 could work. Victoria, you're on 4.9. It's, it's making it harder and harder as, as the vote goes down. Um, I'll just check Tasmania for you as we speak. Uh, Tasmania on 4.7. The difficulty in Tasmania, and I, I regret to be the first person to bring this news up at, on this live stream, oh, but no, Jackie Lambie no. is sitting on 8.9%. Now, of course, oh. Jackie Lambie herself isn't running, but she's running one of her staffers, uh, and 8.9% puts them in very good stead. To, to pick up that spot, which is a bit scary. But the One Nation ticket, to answer your question, uh, Malcolm, 4.7 in Taz, it may not be enough. South Australia is one, of course, you'd be interested in watching given your performance in the South Australian state election, picking up a, a member for the state parliament there, and you're on 4.9% there. Um, again, it depends if those preferences uh, are tightly enough swapped. But uh, in all of those other states, it's you're in the running, but uh, it's difficult. Whereas in Queensland, I think Pauline's home easily. So uh, we'll see how it goes. Well, I'm, I must say how much I've enjoyed. I must say how much yeah. I've enjoyed working with George in the last few weeks. Um, yeah. yeah, no, it's, it's just wonderful to have someone who's practical as well as highly intelligent 
and can speak uh, on just about any topic, but above all, speaks with integrity and and doesn't say things that just just for speaking's sake. So I've really enjoyed that, George, and I hope we can con continue can continue that into the future, in whatever it might role. Have been too long haul. Yeah, I know you are, you, because yeah, you're doing you this for the country. Yeah, thank you, George. But, but, and I want to say but, thank you as well, because um, I'm running for your old seat and you've been um, a really good help to me as well. So thank you, George. Well, thanks, Julia. Sorry we couldn't get you across the line. Um, can I just ask Malcolm in particular, it's looking like, I mean, there's a there's a news.com.au story up saying that there could potentially be a hung parliament. We might not know who's prime minister for a week or so. Um, I'd say it's more likely that there's going to be a Labor minority government. I can ask that for you right now. Yeah, uh, Albanese on. is going to be the next prime minister. Yep. Uh, there is there, there is hung no parliament. doubt in my mind. Hung uh, parliament, look, that, that's not clear yet. So uh, Labor needs to pick up 10 seats to, yeah. to be able to definitely uh, rule... Rule, rule that's the, might be the wrong word, might be the right word, uh, but to, uh, to run the country in their own right, 10 seats. Um, they've currently, uh, on the current count, have about eight, and we haven't gone to WA where both Swan and mm. Pierce are in play. Yeah, right. They pick up both of those or they get another close one over the line. Now, they may well fall just short, so I think the most likely outcome is that they fall one or two seats short, but the idea that we have already three left independents, add another five left independents, so eight left independents, it looks on these numbers at least two, maybe three Greens. The idea that eight left independents and three Greens are going to back the Liberals is laughable. It's, yeah, it's, yeah, let's rule makes... out the idea of a minority Liberal government. Okay. On these numbers, it's minority Labor or Labor. So Those this numbers. is the new reality, right? Uh, Prime Minister Albanese um, and either a majority Labor government just or a hung parliament and is going to be relying on Greens and extreme Green and Teal independents. Um, what... What do you say to that, Malcolm Roberts? It's pretty despairing to think of uh, the, the forces our country will be under, but um, in the Senate, it looks like it'll be fairly close to where it is. So um, that they'll have difficulty getting through the Senate, some of their idiot, uh, idi idiot, idiotic um, policies. Um, I think the Teals have got a very, very shaky base on which to build their policies because we know that there is no scientific data underpinning their their core uh, core policies. They're in it for themselves. They're in it possibly for um, uh, what's the hyphenated name again? Um, who's backing the Teals? Oh, um, Holmes Court. Mm. Holmes Court. Yeah. So um, name is a good name for him anyway. Just watch. He's very he's very litigious, Malcolm. I don't want to get Dave Pellow in right. trouble here because this is his, and, and, it, and it's my Facebook channel that's running through. So don't say anything defamatory about it. Holmes Court. We love you, Simon Holmes Court. <laughs> Please don't say you are a fantastic well, Australian, George. I can now say you're a liar, and that's that, that's defendable <laughs> defamation because it's the truth. You just lied. <laughs> I did. I did. I did. Uh, no, so, so it's a, it's a very, very it's bad very news bad for the country. <laughs> but but it's very bad news for the country. But that being said, um, we will, Pauline has always, and I have always worked with people to make sure we get something that's in, that results in, in, in looking after, putting after, putting the country in, in the, and putting the country's interest, number one. So we will deal with people who are truthful. We'll deal with people who have integrity and we'll deal with people who look after the country. I can't see that the Teals will look after the country at all. I think they'll continue to cede sovereignty in the country. I can't see that the Greens will change their ways from destroying the country either. So we're going to be in for a pretty rocky road, I think. But um, we will always put the country's uh, interest at, at number one. I had this running theory with Greens because I'm always trying to figure out what motivates people because, you know, when you're talking about politics, you understand people, it's going to be some sort of power, you know, where we can align ourselves with the population. And... Um, I, I, my open question to the Greens is all like, are you against, uh, say, climate change or whatever, or are you just in, against energy production in general? Mm. And I found my theory that they're more driven by inequality of status and money mm -hmm. than any coherent idea about, mm. any, any coherent scientific theory about climate change. When I talk to them on the ground, they're more just like, I don't like the fact that there's a billionaire out there. Yeah. That's more what drives them. There's one backing the Teal Independence, but anyway. Well, that's, well but if, if he's the one that's going to give them stuff, then he's the good boogie now. But that's uh, that's what I found is more what drives all of these people is this 
frustration at inequality of status more than a, a coherent scientific theory on climate change. I'd argue with you there, Rob, because I, I think the Greens can be summarized, summarized very simply in two words, anti-human. Their policies are anti-human. They think humans are a scourge. They think humans are rapacious, uncaring, irresponsible, greedy. Uh, and, and that is what drives the Greens. They want to punish humans, but they want to create victims, um, victims for all kinds of things. And, and that does enormous damage to people because uh, people as victims do not stand up, do not assert their own responsibility, do not uh, assert their own power there and confidently. So the human, the, the, the Greens are, are anti-human. They pretend to look after the environment. Their policies are actually hurting the environment. It, it, it's very easy to dissect that. But uh, the, the Greens, I, I disagree with you. They're, they're a mess uh, because they don't stand for anything other than anti-human Well, uh, that's philosophy. what I was saying, though. I find that a lot of them are against any energy production in general which means they're against civilization in general, which means Correct. they're against human flourishing in general. So, more than a science, you know. And you talked about um, creating dependence. That's what I was talking before about caretaking policies. Some people have this emotional need yeah. for caretaking, and it's run so rampant mm -hmm. now that they find new people to caretake. They create new demographics to caretake. But, but oh, they're, not, uh, they're not doing that because they care. They do that because that's the way to get more votes. Create Absolutely. dependency on people. That's it's what they're doing. Can I take this as a, as a slight segue here to, to, to give you something very depressing, uh, Malcolm? In the Senate, it, it looks like for Labor to be able to pass legislation, they, they needed to pick up, uh, they, they need Labor plus the Greens, which I consider to be basically in a coalition now. They have 35. You need 39 to pass legislation, as you know, so they need four more. It's currently looking like the Greens will pick up one or two uh, more Lambie will pick up one more, and it looks very much now like in the ACT. David Pocock, we're going to have a teal senator in there mm. knocking out a liberal. So it does look like a, a Labor minority government with a Labor minority Senate that they can work with as long as it's painted green and teal. Oh, that's about which the worst is way it could go. Not the outcome we wanted, but um, you're going to have your work cut out for you, Malcolm. Good luck, Malcolm. We'll be looking forward to that because they're very vulnerable, uh, as I said, in the areas. Uh, that George already raised in climate in particular. There's nothing there that have, we, we've got something lined up. Senator Malcolm Roberts, you're a warrior, hungry for the battle. Thank you so much uh, for joining us on uh, Freedom Speaks tonight. And thanks, Julie. Thank, thank you. you. And thank, thank you, you for uh, giving a voice to the, the Freedom Parties, Dave and George. Very well done. We've got to have an alternative to the Mockingbird Media. Yeah, well, thank you for your uh, constant support of, of the Freedom Voices uh, throughout Australia on, on all kinds of channels. Um, it's uh, appreciated, and you're absolutely right. It's the only solution to the lying harlot me media is to dilute them and replace them. Good, Good night, night, everyone. Good night. Bye. So just to run through those ACT numbers, uh, we've got Labor looking like they've just got a quota in their own right, so uh, that they were a little worried <clears> they need not be. Uh, David Pocock is currently actually beating the Liberal, the Liberal there being Zed Seselja, a former leader of the ACT Liberals and then went into the Senate for the Liberals. Uh, and it's got David Pocock on uh, just under 23% and the Liberals on just under 18%. And of course, the, the Greens, 13% will go straight to David Pocock, putting him well over a quota. So uh, that's, that's looking good for the Teals, bad for rationality yeah the glimmer of goodness in all of this uh it's been swinging back and forth but Di Lee in uh the seat of fowler is looking more and more like she's beating um christina keneally who is anti-free speech wants to shut down things like the conservative political action conference um <laughs> and i heard before from someone i think it was you john or rob that said that she was pro Freedom as well. She uh, had that viewpoint. So uh, that's good if Di Lee's uh, in there as an independent that's pro-freedom. But um, anyway, that's one little glimmer of, of goodness. Well, there's another one I, mean, I, I don't know how much I care about the Liberals picking up seats, but uh, on current numbers, it also looks like they're in the running for Gilmore. It's still very close. Who's the candidate there, though? That's Gilmore, a... the former Nat. John, let's bring in uh, Gideon Rosner oh. from the IPA. Um and uh, Gideon, welcome to Freedom Speaks. Thank you for all your hard work for freedom and uh, right oh, thinking in terrible. Australia. Well, Don't thank worry. you for having me. I wish uh, we had better results to discuss and by that I don't mean the coalition. I couldn't you know, care less what happens to them after everything they've done to the country. I 
care about the the uh, performance of the freedom parties. Uh, I really, we, you know, I've been calling for weeks now that there'd be a surge in the performance of the freedom parties. And while uh, it's good to see that uh, we've, and I say we as, as a supporter of the freedom movement, while we've increased our vote, uh, I'm not seeing the surge I thought I'd see. Unfortunately, it's a, a very sobering night for me. Uh, so uh, I'm interested in the performance of the Liberals, as am I. Uh, I I'm not actually fussed who uh, wins government, but looking at the other lower house results, I, no love lost for uh, for Frydenberg and, and Sharma and the rest, but the Teals look like they have picked up uh, quite a few. Uh, have you noticed the same thing? And I, I assume you share our dread for that. I think five new uh, left-leaning independents. Yeah, guess. look, well, firstly, I say as somebody who uh, worked for Josh Frydenberg once upon a time, I do hope Josh pulls through uh, as a friend and a former boss. Um, but I've always said through this campaign that I hoped uh, there would be two there would be two situations in which I'd be happy with the Teals, either if they won nothing, showing it was all a flash in the pan and they were full of the proverbial, or if they won a lot, if they won four or five, which shows which would show that um, the efforts that the Liberal Party went to, the way in which they bent over backwards to try to get on board with this climate business, to try to show that they were, you know, just doing a little bit of climate, just enough to neutralise the issue, uh, you know, just to, just try, you know, going to Glasgow, muddling through, that would just, you know, clear the issue and move on to show that you can't negotiate with political terrorists. I've been saying for a long time now, Scott Morrison could have turned the waters back, uh, the rising sea levels back with his bare hands tomorrow and somebody like Laura Tingle would have a go at him for depleting fish habitat or something. I mean, you cannot win with these people. No amount of climate action is enough because it's not about climate action. It's not about uh, uh, emissions targets. It's not about things like that. It is about uh, a very left-wing, very anti-human, very anti-progress uh, movement and nothing that anybody on the broad right, including you know what passes for the right, that is the coalition, can do will pacify them. Uh, so it's a lesson to the Liberal Party: don't kick your base in the teeth. Because uh, and what Margaret Thatcher said: standing in the middle of the road is very dangerous because you get hit by traffic uh, from both sides. Yeah. But um, a similar point to that is the the idea of trying to imitate the Greens. If people want that, they'll just vote for the Greens. And they they'll are vote for the Teals. That are basically the same as the Greens. It's pointless being a pale imitation of something that already exists. You need to be the best version of what you actually are. Yeah, no, that's right, that's right. And they have they've been their worst version for three years now. As I said, I could not care less what happens to the coalition. In fact, I think they deserve to be punished. And that looks like uh, yeah. that, that looks like the, the situation is happening right now. Bottom line is this: Look, I this is the first year in my entire life I have not handed out how to vote cards. I've been handing out how to vote cards for the Liberal and every uh, the Liberal Party at every election since I was fifteen. For Christ's sake, this year I have not touched a single how to vote card uh, because they have lost me. Um, but it. it it goes to show what happens when you alienate your supporters. It goes to show what you, what happens when you uh, alienate your base. I mean, never forget that it was the Liberal Party, not the Labor Party, that got us into a trillion dollar debt. Never forget that it was the Liberal Party, not the Labor Party, that is seeking That's to right. censor the internet right now through uh, Paul Fletcher's crazy misinformation policy. Yeah, never yeah, forget it was the Liberal Party that signed up to net zero, underwrote all of Dan's lockdowns. Uh, you know, you, you, you like again, people do not want liberal life, a labor life. They want vintage liberal, and that is just what we have not seen from the but, government. But Gideon, at the same time, we've got Simon Birmingham out there. Uh, all of these modern liberals have just been wiped off the map to Teals or Greens or uh, Socialist Labor. And, yeah, yeah. And, right. and, and you know, because as has been said before, if you're going to be a pale imitation of the real thing, people will just opt for the real thing. Um, but 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 Simon Birmingham has come out, and his contribution I've seen mm. on the Australian uh, newspaper is to criticise uh, Catherine Deves for losing the seat of a. Oh, for God's sake! Mistake there. Catherine, okay, yeah, let's blame it all on Catherine Deves. Catherine Deves, who put up a pretty good fight in a seat that the Liberal Party was never going to win. I mean, George, as you well know, as somebody who sat in the House of Representatives, once these independents get in, you never get them out again, unless they do something truly stupid like back in uh, Julia Gillard as Prime Minister as Rob Oakeshott. And um, who's the other bloke, the old bastard? Anyway, I can't remember his name now. Anyway, but you know what I mean? The Liberal Party were never going to win... Um, 
Uh, Warringah, the fact that we've done as well as we have in Warringah is a testament to Catherine Deves and the fact that she's struck a chord with people, even within the leafy suburbs of Manly uh, and so on. Uh, but this yeah. is the thing the Liberal Party has to do now. If they lose, and it looks like indeed they are going to, um, you know, th this is the thing. I, I do not want the next generation of Liberals, you know, young Liberals and so on, to look up at Scott Morrison the way I looked up to John Howard in my day. I do not want the next generation of Liberals to think the way to win is to say nothing, do nothing, uh, run away from every fight, wave the white flag on the culture wars, adopt net zero, spend trillions of dollars, and for any political problem in the cycle, just you know, wave the credit card around more than Paris Hilton on Black Friday. The Liberal Party has to go off into the wilderness now, and they have to have a battle royale. They have to have a battle royale. They have to have a wets versus dries battle 2.0, like they did in the 80s. Uh, the modern liberals and the moderates have to fight the true believers, and whoever wins gets the Liberal Party fair and square. But what is happening currently cannot stand, because as my boss said in the AFR, John Roskam, in the AFR not so long ago, the Liberal Party broad church is gone. What we have now is an interfaith dialogue. It cannot, it's not sustainable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so uh, but, 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 just a quick one, sorry, Josh Frydenberg looks like he's lost his seat. Yeah. yeah. What's your, what's your uh, as a former staff member, what's your response to that? Look, I I, I I never thought that Josh would lose Keong. I thought that he'd be carried on a pine box because for all for all of his foibles, he has worked that seat like nobody I've ever seen. I would go in mm. to his office with urgent cabinet briefs and saying, boss, we need this signed ASAP. And he'd say, hang on, kid, I'm just writing a, a note to somebody, you know, in the electorate and so on. He worked that seat hard. But a few weeks ago, I started to think it could be possible because it's like Warringah last time. I saw a level of bloodlust there that just needs a scalp. It's got to have that scalp. It needs to be abated. And unfortunately, Josh got steamrolled. But again, I make the point, it's not because the Liberal Party did not try on climate change. They, they again, they negotiated with the political terrorists. They waved the white flag. If they'd stuck to their guns, if they'd said no to net zero, they could have campaigned on high energy costs under labour, high petrol prices under labour, high freight costs under labour, the whole box and dice. They could have run won this election in a canter, but by trying to neutralise the issue and, you know, go to Glasgow and everything else, uh, you know, again, stand for nothing, fall for anything. That's the lesson of tonight. Indeed. Just to give those numbers to the people listening at home, it, it looks like uh, Monique Ryan, the Teal Independent in Kuyong, is on 53%, two-party preferred or two-candidate preferred to, to Josh's 47%. Uh, 53, a 3% lead. That's with uh, roughly 30% counted. That looks mm. like it's it's done. But the Liberals will catch up a bit uh, if, if history is any guide when you start counting the pre-polls. Enough to but win, it's, No, no. That's what I'm saying. So, look, it, these close seats, the line ball seats uh, that, that come down tonight within a percentage, uh, don't write the Liberals off if they're within a percentage tonight. But if you're 3% behind... Um, you're going to struggle. It's looking bad. And look, it's even looking even worse, by the way, in, in Goldstein, uh, yeah. where we've got uh, Tim Wilson, uh, your former colleague at the at the IPA, uh, back when he believed in capitalism. Oh, uh, all he, the good he's things. he's uh, currently on forty three percent to Zoe Daniels uh, fifty seven, uh, and that's with a lot of that seat counted as well. So that's looking like it's oh, going. Oh, that's got to hurt. That's got to hurt. Look, I feel for Tim as well. Look, you know, again. I don't like, I don't buy the whole package. It's, not, it's, not, it's gone. It's gone yeah, mm. gone. yeah, it's gone. Look, I don't buy the whole package with Tim in terms of his climate stuff lately, but of course he was trying to hold down the electorate of Goldstein. But look, Tim was somebody who spoke up in the party room, George, correct me if I'm wrong, for lower taxes, smaller government. Uh, you know, he, he said the right thing, you know, most of the time, I, I would say about Tim Wilson. Uh, you know, it's sad to see him go, but again, I make the point. The Liberal Party did itself no favours by trying to lurch to the centre. There is no centre anymore. Everybody's lost their minds. You're either a, uh, you know, you're either a climate fanatic, big government fanatic, or you're a lover of freedom. And my biggest regret about tonight is not yeah. so much how the Liberal Party is doing, although I'd hate to see some people lose. It is to see that the surge in the freedom parties, uh, I just haven't seen it so far. Maybe it's coming soon, but. Um, we have to recalibrate, friends. We have to think of a new game plan because we we, we we have to make Australians understand the value of freedom, I think, more than we're seeing tonight. You're right, Gideon, what, um, what value do you think there is in accelerationism, if you know what I mean by that yeah. short word? Yeah, look, I've become an accelerationist, I have to say. 
in the last little while. Uh, people think I'm crazy. People think uh, just you know, unpack I'm... it for us and define. Well, it for acceleration those. is the <laughs> idea that if bad things are happening, then it's in our interest to make them happen more quickly, so that we can, uh, you know, get on with it and then build a better world. It's a bit like uh, the last chapter in Atlas Shrugged. Uh, right now, Atlas is about to shrug. The world is about to drop from his shoulders. Uh, we are all in gold gulch waiting to rebuild. The sooner it happens, the sooner we can make hay with the chaos uh, and, and build the kind of freedom agenda that we want. Uh, right now, things have just not got bad enough for people to lose faith in big government. Things have not gotten bad enough for, for people to realise you can't keep paying the mortgage off with the credit card. Things haven't got bad enough for people to realise that this climate stuff is a uh, road to societal ruin and impoverish impoverishment of millions. Uh, things got, haven't gotten bad enough for us to realise that you can't defend a country like Australia if uh, school kids are being taught that that country is not worth saving. Uh, we are dancing on the lip of the volcano here, but people don't realise right now how bad it is. Uh, they're about to find out what the result we're seeing tonight, I dare say. The thing that worries me is that people don't understand the causality. Yeah. People do not go, we have this and this causes this this problem. Mm -hmm. So I've been running very much on the idea of explaining to people the government is like a social cause reseller. They're like a social cause retailer. And like any retail option, it's quite simple. You buy something at wholesale, you put a margin on it, and you you sell it, you on sell it. So the more that you are selling whatever you're selling, the more money and power you keep in the middle. The government's very much the same way, but people say, I've got this problem, get the government to solve it. Every time you do that, this redistribution is funneling power upwards. And yep. that's why it's promoted internationally. But the problem I have is, you know, I, I actually I voted Greens over Liberal and, and Labor. Because I agree. Now that's accelerationism. That's it's accelerationism. accelerationism. I agree with it. You know what? You want it, you get it. But the problem that worries me is that people don't understand the causality between wanting the government to solve problems and an oppressive government that is hooking you up, mm. you know, to the teeth, so to speak, and yeah. controlling your every move. And so what worries me is this, it's good to accelerate, but are we going to get to the end of this acceleration and people are going to sit there not understanding how we got there? And for me, this, this indicates the bigger picture, which is that we've lost control of the institutions that are responsible yeah. for adulting people. Hmm. The institutions yeah. have been co-opted by people who want to infantilise people. And if conservatives, I said this to Ian Plymer, you know, that I won't go off on a tangent, sorry, but if conservatives want to save the culture, you need to do what they did, which is retake the institutions, because that's where we adopt people to understand causality, yep. to understand the value of freedom. So what I'm saying is go out there and capture an, uh, an institution. We've actually come at freedom at the ballot box too late. They've already yeah. made up their minds. They don't understand. They already have a worldview. So it's the culture. It's the culture. It is Absolutely. the culture. We've lost the culture. We need they they retook the institutions of cultural production. We need to take them back because if we don't, we will suffer all sorts of horrible outcomes and they won't understand how we got there. Mm. So Gideon, I want to put two questions to you. Um and it, it's really uh, I guess to get some some hope in this. So first question is is accelerationism rational? Or, or is, uh, you know, somebody voting for Labor to teach the Liberals a lesson, obviously down the ballot underneath all the freedom candidates, but, yeah. um, and can't advocate this anymore because polls are closed, but uh, for the purpose of voter education and the long-term big picture, um, is it rational? Is it a, a rational, sane, um, disciplined thing to do, or is it vandalistic, reckless, and, and, um, and pro-Labor? Um, and mm. with the way that this election now has gone um is all lost or is this is there actually a silver lining to the cloud and and perhaps this is the path to redeeming the right wing uh, particularly the labor part the liberal party in australia well no it's not well to answer your first question no it's not rational uh, in some ways it's sub-rational i guess it's more emotive look it's not so much you know voting Labor over Liberal, I guess what the thesis I've come to is that there's not much of a difference anymore. Um, fundamentally, and this is what I've been saying for a long time, there's only one major political party in Australia, and it's called the Canberra Party. And again, I make the point, whichever way you vote, you will get net zero. Whichever way you vote, you will get more spending. Whichever way you vote, you will get internet censorship. Look what one. Paul Fletcher, the Liberal Communication Minister, George, correct me if I'm wrong, is trying to do with his hideous disinformation policy. You'll get, you'll get cultural vandalism all the way down. Um, he's almost wanting like to set up what they have in the US. I mean, we've been criticised. It's worse. It's worse. Well, it is worse. It is worse. 
Uh, it's worse. Because and in, I don't in the know US, what else the disinformation unit in the US are going to have in Australia, they'll start pinging, but they will shut down citizen yeah. journalism in this country. They can, under, yeah, under under the Biden proposal, the Biden Disinformation Governance Board, uh, they, they are just monitoring disinformation. Yeah. And the Republicans went into overdrive over there. They called it rightly the Ministry of Truth. In yes. Australia, the equivalent body has the positive power for the, communica for the Australian Communications and Media Authority to force tech platforms to take down anything they subjectively deem to be misinformation on a, variety, on a wide range of grounds I don't have time to go into, right? In the US, Republicans rightly went into overdrive. Here, the same policy was in, uh, introduced by a liberal communications minister. And if it was not for the IPA, nobody would notice or care. That What does that tell you? What does that tell you? The problem is Labor are going to go, going to go worse on this. I mean, we both know yeah. they were the ones that wanted to have a, uh, a press czar set up to uh, oversee what they yeah, thought Finkelstein. was the uh, terrible Murdoch media. Um, you know, uh, uh, you're right. It's the Canberra Uni Party. Can I make yeah. a case for um, this being not a bad election for Labor to win? Now, I'm quite disappointed that they might be able to actually control the Senate with the Greens and the Teals. But putting that aside, um, I put it to you that Labor was going to win eventually. The idea that the Liberals yeah. just rule forever is untenable. So the only question we can really ask ourselves, if you think the Liberals are generally better than Labor, but you accept that Labor will win at some stage, what sort of election would you like Labor to win at? Because you can't say they'll never win. Mm. What we can ask is what sort of election would you prefer them to win at? That's right. Would it be an election where the Labor leader tried to pretend he was Bob Hawke? Now, I think he's lying, but the fact that he was trying to pretend to be Bob Hawke, I think gets him a tick. That's the sort of uh, election that's better for them to win, rather than Bill Shorten, who went to the electorate three years ago, promising to uh, spend and tax us to death. Uh, so I'm glad Shorten didn't win on that agenda. Uh, Albanese, a bit of a lighter agenda, that, that's safer. And then Morrison signing up to... The, the, the old joke is no longer a joke, that if you want to know what the Liberals stand for, just look for whatever Labour stood for three years ago. Okay, yeah. And that will be your liberal agenda. Yeah. And so this That's is a, true. If liberals were going, I, I still think on balance, liberals are probably a bit better than Labor in terms of what I believe in. But if you accept that Labor is going to win at some stage, this is the sort of liberal government that deserves to lose. And this is the sort of Labor government that's less bad to have win. So yeah, uh, well, maybe this well, is the well, time to right. accept our medicine. And, and this is the thing that, you know, has been the, the narrative, which is, you know, and I, I've been very critical of Scott Morrison and people said, oh, you can't say that. You'll just help Albanese. You know, Albanese is the worst thing that will ever happen to this country. Maybe he is. But they said that about Bill Shorten. They said that about uh, uh, Kevin Rudd. They said that about Kim Beasley. They said that about, uh, you know, whoever the other Labor bozos were throughout history. As you said, John, the, the political cycle turns uh, regardless, as I said, it, it's better to turn now, I guess, in a way, in, in the sense that there has been there's very little difference between the major parties. Uh, really, again, we're, we're swapping Pepsi over Coke, so who the hell cares? Um, but more to the point uh, as well, uh, this is a, a poison chalice for whoever wins. This country has some serious existential issues. And again, I make the point, neither party is even willing to say that debt and deficit is a problem. Well, we have inflation yeah. at record highs, the highest we've seen since the bloody 80s, for God's sake. And both of them are spending money's money again like drunken sailors. Right. Um, so I guess if you really hate the Labor Party, you'd, you'd you know, bequeath them these terrible uh, issues that they're about to inherit. Well, it does occur to me, if you hate the Labor Party, you might actually give them a Senate controlled by the Greens and Lambie and, like, <laughs> dare them to do anything sensible. <laughs> well, they won't. Oh, well. But again, you know, well, we're going to get every, anything sensible about a, out of a fourth-term Morrison government? No. No. We would have gotten it, it may actually bite the, the you know, it, government it, ideas. It may actually bite Labor that they're able to pass legislation with the Greens and Lambie because try to think through what sort of legislation passes the Senate that Greens and Lambie control, well, and it's not going to be things that Labor that, can proudly take to the next election. Let's uh, well, watch the same part of legislation that was passed by Gillard and Rudd when they had when the Greens had the balance of power there. You know, we all lived through that. It was bad, but the sky didn't fall in. We had a yeah. couple of good years under Abbott, and then we resumed, you know, Canberra Party business as usual. You know, this is this is about whichever team, whether the red people or the blue people, get to ride around in white cars and step over blue carpet for the next three years. I couldn't care less. I care about freedom for this country. And yeah. uh, you know, if nothing yeah. else, I'm happy the Liberal Party has been delivered a, a, a kick in the shins that it deserved. What happened? Well, after hopefully, that? Okay, it'll be bad, but not that bad. Line. Well, can I ask George and Gideon? You guys know the Liberal Party far better than I do, uh, but Sadly, it, it I do. seems. It seems like we've got uh, at least five, maybe more liberal mods losing at this election. Not that many other liberals losing. 
is this going to change the internal balance? Uh, in so obviously Josh Frydenberg won't be able to. I was actually leadership. wanting to head to this question. But, uh, is, so that yes. only leaves Dixon because Mo uh, Morrison's going to go. That's clear. I mean, it's yeah. just untenable uh, that he would stay on as leader after this. So uh, if Dutton holds, I think that that is the only uh, way forward for the Liberal Party because Josh Frydenberg's no longer there. So under a Dutton-led coalition, um, there is going to be a move towards more conservative views, more pro-freedom views, I would think. And uh, because I know Peter and I know what his true beliefs are on a lot of these issues, and he'd probably be agreeing furiously with a lot of the things we're saying on this panel. So we'll see. Peter Dutton's currently holding at 52.2. There's been a swing against him. If he retains the seat of Dixon, which I think he will, he will go on to be the Liberal leader, and we might see a change in... Yep the Liberal Party overall. Well, there has to be, or they, surely they're not tenable as a party to just keep heading down this road. Yeah. Look, we, we, we will see. see. Well, I, I suspect, George, you, you're, you're right, um, and it all depends on what happens in Dixon with Darts. Um, look, that said, you know, I, I, my first election that I ever got involved with was when I was 16 years old and I had, or 15 years old, and I had that for... Uh, Robert Doyle's campaign in 2002. And I remember after that, everybody was saying, you know, it was a washout and everybody around party circles was saying, oh, this is a good thing because we're going to, we've cleared out the dead wood now and we're going to be right. Oh, they just went and pre-selected more dead wood. Um, yeah, never yeah. underestimate the ability of the Liberal Party to get it wrong. Um, so uh, they can take two lessons from this. Either they will take the lesson that you and I are saying, which is, you know, you didn't win anybody from the other side. Nobody who, nobody on the other side voted for you because you, you know, uh, bent over backwards to be climate lovies and everything else. And you lost your army of supporters. You lost your true believers. They can either take that lesson or they will listen to all the people, George, you know who they are. They come in with their lanyards on, uh, with their briefcases through Parliament House. And they sit in there and say, oh, Australians want climate action, you know, and, and they, they take the wrong lesson. They listen to the wrong people. Uh, what happens, uh, that's in the lap of the gods as far as I'm concerned. But I would hope, I would hope uh, that the Liberal Party uh, learns the right lesson. But if not, look, let's not forget, let's not forget what happened in 1944 when Robert Menzies, uh, who had lost his first term, torn down by his colleagues, the UAP was moribund. He started the new political party, uh, brought all the warring tribes together in Albury and went on to be the most successful Prime Minister Australia has ever seen. Now, there's one person who fits that bill currently, and it's Tony Abbott. And if Tony Abbott can start a new political party and bring the clans together and start a true conservative party, he's the only one that can save Australia. There I said it. Well, there is one more that might be able to do it. He's sitting in the room. I was asking you guys about the Liberal <laughs> Party. We do have a Liberal sitting backstage. I don't know if you're ready to click him in here. Let's. But, uh, uh, no pressure. I'm out of here, friends. Let's... I got. I got to run. Okay. Well, thanks, Gideon. Thank you, Gideon. Uh, you'll never know stay what that free, my friend. Stay uh, free. He has to say. <laughs> stay free. Thanks, Gideon. Bye bye. Cheers, friend. Senator Alex Antic, welcome to uh, Freedom Speaks. Freedom, freedom is freedom, speaking freedom. tonight, and it seems what to a, be... Uh, what a bunch of deplorables, I tell you what. <laughs> <laughs> never... you're, 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 Good to be with you, though. Uh, we just, we just said that you're, you're going to be the future, the saviour, the leader. You're the, you're, the, you're the hero for the deplorables, Alex. So, uh... right. Yeah, well, I, I am a deplorable. I'm, I'm proud to be one. And, uh, well, here we are. I mean, you know, it's... Uh, it's a, a strange time, but uh, it's an interesting night. I'm still, you know, if you'll excuse me occasionally, I've got my other screen opened up. I'm showing my yeah. uh, my lack of knuckle dragging doesn't extend to using a computer with two screens. So I'm trying to work out exactly what this all means. But I think it means um, what I, and I know George and others have been saying for the long time, and that is that the Liberal Party is at its best when it's true to its conservative roots. And I think we're seeing right. that. Tonight, um, you know, those that have been, I think, are being rewarded handsomely. And, uh, you know, we're not going to win those inner city seats um, if we continue to allow the narrative to be set on climate change. The thing that really struck me reading this was watching that teal appear on the map um, was that we've let them get away with this. We've let them tell us and tell the people of Australia uh, that there is this existential threat, which really isn't that, well, it's pretty existential, it's, but it's not really much of a threat. Um, and we've allowed this narrative to build to the point where people are going off and voting for someone else. So, look, the future of the Liberal Party, as far as I'm concerned, is, in, in, at least in the short term, is in the, um, 
the outer metropolitan suburbs here in South Australia, that, that's places like Macon and Spence, uh, where we've got lots of aspiration, lots of young migrant families who, frankly, are just not hearing from us enough. Can I say I go through the list of likely losses here? Uh, Wentworth, North Sydney, McKellar. Yeah, looks like McKellar. It's North closer. Sydney has lost. That's such yeah. good news. K Kuyong, um, Higgins looks like that's on the way out. Uh, we've also got Goldstein. Um, we've uh, Brisbane, the seat of Brisbane, the seat of Ryan, perhaps. I'm just going to pull that up, Alex, and just make sure that I'm not telling you a fib there. Uh, the seat of Ryan. Uh, We've been hearing that it could be going. Um, it's uh, currently they're not even giving a two-party preferred because the Greens vote is at thirty point six four percent in that electorate. So um, we could see the seat of Ryan gone. Um, all of those seats, uh, to a greater or lesser degree, the people who hold those seats would probably be described as the so-called modern liberals, wouldn't they? Well, look, I mean, as you run through them there, a lot of them prop up and they do seem to be. Um, and look, I think there is this problem with trying to be like Mike. You know, as I said, I, 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 we had this problem here in the state election in South Australia two months ago where for pretty much the last four years, the state government tried to imitate their best version of a blue, a blue green. Um, and this is what it gets you. We've seen it before. We saw it in 2016 under the old Turnbull government. Um, and... You know, history keeps repeating itself. Uh, I just, you know, I, I, I mean, the lesson has got to be there and it's got to, the penny's got to drop eventually. We won the 2019 election um, against the tide because of the quiet Australians. You, know, you can see that the, the tradies came out and backed us in and they did so because we talked about jobs and all sorts of other things. Um, you know, I just, we are a wealthy country. Um, we don't have time to be wasting uh, on you know, uh, you know, head scratching about you know climate change and whatever. We're coming into some difficult economic times, and we've got to give people a message. Uh, I think that that continues out, and that message um, at the moment is not being listened to in places like Sturt, potentially here in SA. It's probably our closest to North Sydney and Wentworth, yeah. uh, which is a very tight race, and it and it really shouldn't be. Um, is it really? Is it? Uh, I haven't been following Sturt. What's happening? Yeah, look, it's pretty close. I mean, it's about a six point nine percent margin to start off with, and the the swing is on at about eight at the moment. But you know, we've got postals to come and others, so it may well be a hold. But you but know, we've it's lost the same issue. What's the story there in Boothby? Booth, Boothby yeah. is looking a little more, little more troublesome. Uh, Boothby is, and uh, as I go back to it now, I'll tell you that exactly. Boothby is running at. Uh, uh, currently, we are looking at uh, a uh, 51, uh, 49 two party preferred swing back to Labor. So that's actually, in many ways, better than the polling was showing. But I, I think still probably, probably a likely Labor win. Um, postals to come, of course, which are intended to traditionally favour the Liberal Party. But, you know, across the board, well, that's another one. I mean, that hasn't been in Labor hands since uh, the 1949, I think. Um, and the yeah. boundaries have changed a lot. But, you know, it, it paints the same picture. We've got, to be, we've got to be giving Conservative voters a Conservative Party to aim at. Uh, and, you know, I think that's the real lesson for me out of, out of what's happening at the moment. Yeah, right. Um, questions, guys? Alex, um, there's a lot of, um, I guess, look, uh, I'm going to use the word melodrama. Um, no no offence, Kay, you're not the only person saying this is a disaster. Um, and I don't think we should be melodramatic. I think, uh, well, I mean, let me, be, let me be religious about it for a start. I, I think all of these things are in God's hands and there's things that he achieves for a certain purpose and allows, and, and the Bible is very clear that government is one of those things that um, that he does permit for certain reasons and nobody's there by accident. And that doesn't mean he endorses the bad, evil things that governments do with the authority God gives them. But taking it away from the religious and spiritual level, just down to the practical level, um, I is this something that we should be melodramatic about? Um, is the Australian government over the next three years with a, 
a uh, Labor Green coalition in the um, government and in the Senate going to be as bad for Australia as the Biden Democrats are for America, for example? Um, and, or is this a path to better things? You know, one step back, five steps forward, possibly. Well, I mean, it's a, you know, we, we don't know. We we always see Labor uh, in campaign mode, not saying the things that are going to come out the other end of the pipe. I, I mean, I'm probably a little more despondent about that than, than you are. I mean, we've, we've now got a Labor, well, potentially, I think if, if Labor do get across the line in some form of, form of coalition or whatever it might be, if that's to be the case federally, then here in South Australia, we're going to end up with a, uh, a Labor federal and state government. We've already seen in very quick fire time here in South Australia, the, the Labor government that was parading around warm and fuzzy, you know, with a sort of a photogenic leader, uh, you know, I'm a bit like the libs, but not quite. Uh, in the first couple of weeks, first month or so, um, introduce almost Dan Andrews style uh, pandemic powers into the Public Health yeah. Act, effectively bricked in um, the powers that, 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 you know, were kind of floating around in the Emergency Management Act there that can basically be switched on and off at will depending on when the World Health Organization tells us we're in a pandemic. So, you know, we, I, I think there's a, there's a I mean, I, I hope you're right. I hope if it's that, that's the case that we don't have to get too despondent. But, um, you know, Albanese is a pretty left-wing leader and he'll be um, getting some friends in there with the, the Greens and the Teals now as well. Uh, and we know what their position on climate change is. We know what their targets are like. And that is enough on that issue alone to alarm me. But... Maybe it is the case that this is the point where, where we rebuild. And I and I heard your comments about uh, uh, you know the, um, the, the 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 way in which the party was built under Menzies, and you know the comments about whether it needs to happen. I, I don't I don't know that it does. I just want to see, and I've said it on your show before. I just want to see conservatives get back into politics. And I know for, for all of you guys, that's a that's a strong issue. And I'm 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 happy to do that here. I'm trying to encourage. Uh, conservatives to get back involved with me. And if people are interested, they can get, get in contact with me there at that email address. Uh, and uh, I'm happy to show them how, because we need that voice uh, in the parliament. We need to be pre-selecting people for parliament that fill those roles and fill it with our voice, which is, I believe, the voice of uh, everyday Australians. So, uh, look, that's let, on the screen right now. now. Alex, Alex at believeinblue.com.au. Look, Dave, I'm actually not as optimistic as you. Um, no, I think either. that unless, I think of the phrase, it might not be your fault, but it is your responsibility. So you and, think this will be as bad as Biden's Democrats in America or yeah, worse? Uh, absolutely, could be, yeah, I, I think so. And you know what I've seen uh, from conservatives, from established, successful people? They say, I care about my family, I care about my business. I put my head up above and I get cut down. And so what I find is with the people who have the skill set and the knowledge to teach to inform, to guide, to lead, to take responsibility, they don't want to do it. And you know what? I'll actually, uh, I'll actually call out Clive Palmer on this because he said to us, you know, I know what he's trying to do when he says, I'll be fine. He's trying to, he's trying to offset the, the idea that he's doing this for a self-interest. But he says, you know, I'll actually be fine. I'm worth X. I, can, I have my life sorted. I'll keep my home. I'll go off on my boat. But the problem is, Clive, is that's actually not good enough because that's what everybody who has the ability to teach, to inform the culture, to take responsibility for the way the country's going, that's what they're all doing. Yeah. And then now there's nobody left. So I think that if you are a conservative person, if you have something intelligent to say, you are, you are going to destroy the systems that allowed you to be successful if you don't start taking some part in the responsibility for those systems, for your society, for your culture. And, and look, can I can I just say on that? I, 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 I mean, amen. I cannot. Say, I could not have said it better myself. Uh, in fact, I've been trying to get that very message across. That is exactly the point. I say it all the time. That unfortunately, what's happened in Australia and other Western nations as well is, while we've been sleeping, the hardcore left have been creeping on us. And mm. you know, Aussies, everyday Australians, don't have, I think, the time to be involved in politics like perhaps some of the left do. We've got people that are running businesses, that are looking after families, that are taking kids to school, and the left do that as well. But they find time for politics. They find time to get involved, at grassroots level, at party political level, to get organised and do it. And the reality is that the, the creep of the left and the, the long march through the institutions is 
is is far from merely underway. I, I reckon they're at the other end of the of the march, sitting there smoking cigars and drinking drinking whiskey. Um, that that's done. If we if we can't get people inside our bureaucracies to tell us what a woman is, uh, the health department, as we saw in estimates a couple of months ago, then rest assured, the time for action is way way in the rearview mirror. We, we've got to get mobilised. We've got to get people back in. And and I have to say, I think that the major parties have to be the starting point of that. People will continue to return to voting habits when they've got something to vote at. The minor parties, look, I I don't take anything away from from the work they do, but the reality is here, and if you look at the experience in the United States with um, the calls for Donald Trump to start a a new minor party, he didn't do that. He just went and pushed the MAGA movement through the Republican Party. That's what's got to happen here. Yep. Hey, uh, it's a good time to mention this book, and and I don't... (laughs) I don't know if it's uh, a week too early, um, Alex, for you to start plugging it. So I'll do you a favour and take you off screen while I plug it. But uh, there's this book called Deconstructing ScoMo. Um, and it basically explains uh, why Scott Morrison deserved to lose this leg- this election. It's an old adage. Elections aren't won. They are lost. Uh, and the erasure... Uh, that I am celebrating tonight of, of the um, moderates, the, the progressive liberals, the teal liberals from um, the, the Liberal Party. Uh, I mean, yes, it's come at terrible cost to the nation, but the Liberal Party should have done this themselves and got rid of them uh, a long time ago. Um, but anyway, they uh, keep pre-selecting people who better belonged in the um, Labor Party, even made one of them the Prime Minister uh, at the expense of a true Liberal. Uh, a real liberal, um, and uh, yeah, this book is basically explaining it all. I actually want to um, bring Rocco Loyacano in uh, right now. He's one of the uh, one of the authors of uh, Deconstructing Scomo. Um, Rocco, I mean, here's here's the roadmap. Um, this this book. Um, I, I guess why don't you summarize for us? Um, where have the liberals gone wrong? We'll we'll get you to um, review how the elections going in Western Australia, uh, your neck of the woods soon. Polls close there a little bit, um, uh, two hours later than, than here on the East Coast. But um, is this going to teach um, the the broad church of the Liberal Party that it's been way too broad and shouldn't have expanded well across the centre to the left? Good evening, Dave, and, and good evening, everyone. Um, look, it's interesting because I've just been watching uh, the sky uh, uh, election coverage, and I've seen uh, and heard Peter Cridlin and Michael Kroger uh, all of us start making the same arguments that I make in this book and that people I'm sure on this panel uh, have made for the not just the last two years but for quite some time. Um, and uh, I mean, this this book basically says, look, if you if you take the Liberals closer and closer and closer to the ALP, you are going to uh, alienate the base and, and the people that you you say you stand uh, stand up for, but you don't actually do anything about. And that's exactly what's transpired. I mean, I just Michael Kroger just two minutes ago said, "Look, um, we need to get something out there to, to get energise the base. Um, good management doesn't get people in the streets." If he's and these are his words, and I wrote them down. I've got them right here. He said. We need, if Scott Morrison or the team, as he put it, had gone out and said, look, never again will anyone in this country be prohibited, pandemic or not, from practising their religion. You know, they would, he said the coalition would have won hands down. Um, and these are the things that the Liberals have abandoned. I mean, you look at the, you look at the, uh, the party website, our beliefs, freedom of religion, freedom of speech, they're all there. But we've, we've had over the last few years a Prime Minister, I mean, he was Treasurer at the time, but he was in a government, and he said... Free speech doesn't create a single job, but he, he has little time for it. Um, when people were prohibited from practising their religion, he was absolutely silent and indeed encouraged the, 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 the orders that, that did that. Um, and Peter Credlin herself said, look, um, we, when you've got a primary vote down in the, in the mid-30s and in some places even lower, and with people going to, to One Nation and to Clive Palmer and to the Little Democrats and all these other, and all these other parties... Um, the people are doing that because they do not know what the Liberal Party stands for. They're preoccupied with these seats 
in, in leafy suburbs of Sydney and Melbourne when Tony Abbott was saying years ago the geographical centre of the Liberal Party had moved away from that and to Menzies' forgotten people, the middle class, the, the artisans, the small business people, all that those that the Liberal Party should stand up for and, and should try and, and should try in government um, to, to prosecute an agenda for. And, and they haven't done that at all. They've said they've made soundings about it, but when it comes to actually doing something about it, they haven't done it at all. And as Senator Antich said a few minutes ago, um, I was listening in, you know, the, 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 the left, the centre-right's been asleep while the, while the left spends every waking moment implementing its agenda, and that's exactly yeah. what's happened. And, yep. you know, when the right gets centre-right has got into government, it hasn't done anything to prosecute a, an agenda or, or an argument against any of that. And, the, and no, that is what I mean, that's that's what's transpired. That's transpired. The, the, re the reason the left will do that is because they will give up money to do it and conservatives won't do that. What do you mean give up money? They've got plenty of money. The left are very well funded. No, but your average leftist on the ground. Oh, they put they're their hand driven. in their pocket and donate to causes, yes. Yeah, but they're driven by moral conviction. And what I've seen com from conservatives is I've got money, I've got my retirement plan. Let me, I'll tell you, I've I've had conservatives say, well, you know, the way this is all going to go is there's going to be a depression or a war. And so I suggest you invest in gold and houses. Um, and like, cool, what, how, how does that happen for all the, the younger generations that don't have gold or house, you know, investment portfolios? It's good for you guys because you're not going to bear the cost of what you fail to take responsibility for. The left will give up money, houses, and, and all these things to go and act on a moral conviction. Conservatives won't. Yeah. And going back to the point made before by Alex about uh, the, the the effort that the left has done through the march through the institutions, you, you made the, the flippant uh, comment saying that the left also has families and jobs. Of course... They do, but uh, I wonder though, and I don't know if this is a whiskey fueled comment, um, th th whether the pointy end of the liberal, of the, of the not the liberal, the leftist spear, I have sometimes wondered uh, whether it is the people without too many kids that have enough time to play with politics that are able to uh, come together with plans about how they should be running our life. And, and they, there yeah. seems to be a lot of childless people. Uh, at the tip of the spear, running through the institutions. And why no, do they you, keep you, growing? I don't, I don't care if well, they're, they're, I don't they're care if this is whiskey fuel, mate. You're spot on the money. Yeah. Yeah. No, there's plenty of good, solid, decent leftist me, um, voters out there who have kids, but I, I, it's the tip of the spear of the people changing the culture that I worry about, it's not very, the average Labor voter. It's very true. They have less responsibility, so they can take more responsibility for politics. But I'm saying that regardless of what obstacles are in conservatives' way, we're losing the battle. Oh, I wasn't trying to argue with you. I was just, yeah. just making yeah, that comment absolutely. that I, uh, I, they do seem to have that time. They do. They do have the time. Absolutely. Can I, can I direct to Alex Antic? Alex, this, uh, I, I, I got to disagree with Dave Pello. It's rare that we disagree on, except on a few issues. Yeah. You like um, minimum wage. Uh, don't yeah. You? I support minimum wages Probably and he doesn't. He's, uh, <laughs> you know, just a laissez-faire, uh, <laughs> let it rip, whereas I'm uh, more of an agrarian socialist, but that's the only time you're going to hear the word socialist from my lips, Whoa. Um, yeah. but uh, unless I'm attacking them. But 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 seriously, Alex, um, mm. I, I fear for the next three years, we're going to have Anthony Albanese, who's tried to style himself as Bob Hawke, but he's no Bob Hawke. He, he, he definitely is a, a, a leftist. I mean, that is his whole career has been in, 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 in steeped in leftism so he is going to be amongst the most left-wing prime ministers that we've had probably apart from Gillard um, he is going to be pulled further to the left by uh, teal independence at least on climate issues and by the Greens who um, we already know are probably going to have a bit of more control in the Senate and it may be a minority government in the House so, so all the things that we were sort of worried about that the Liberal Party was doing, um, net zero, uh, digital ID, um, you know, drifting to the left on so many other issues, Alex, we're now going to have a major surge towards the left as far as I can see. Yep. Our freedoms are going to be under attack like they never have been before over the next three years. This is not a joke. This is quite serious. I fear right now for the future of my country, and I fear 
if the conservative pro-freedom movement doesn't get its act together soon. But you are one of the lightning rods at the moment. You're there in the Senate. You're going to be in the Senate for another three years at least. What are you going to do, Alex Antic? What are you going to do to turn around this ship? Well, I guess, look, first of all, I've got to start by saying I, I agree entirely with everything you've said. As usual, George, uh, you are, and should say, going to be a great loss uh, to people like myself and the parliament generally. So that kind of wisdom is yeah. exactly what we need at a time like this. But uh, I agree with you. I agree with you 100%. Um, it's going to be a difficult patch. Um, and it's unfortunately not something that I think we need in order to get people to understand how dire some of this stuff could be. But I think we're going to get it. Um, the issue, I suppose, is where does it come from? You've, you've nailed a couple of them there. The one really, really strong concern I've got is this growth of social credit, growth of surveillance, yeah. and, it, and it sort of culminates with that digital ID bill you taught. Now, that, that as it turns out, was a government bill. Uh, what happens to that if Labor take power? I assume they take it away and make it a whole lot worse. Um, and what do we do about it? Well, the first thing we've got to do is find out where the numbers sit in the Senate, and I don't know what they look like. Um, but from where I sit, I I'm going to continue to be a voice for uh, for freedom, uh, effectively, and, and I can comfortably do that with inside the Liberal Party, and I'll do that regardless of whether we're in government or whether we're in opposition. Um, now, I I'd be very surprised if there are numbers there uh, to do anything constructive other than, uh, other than talk about it in the chamber, which is going to be very frustrating. But... Look, I would see the role of people like myself is to continue to prosecute the case and prosecute the case for a conservative Liberal Party, a Liberal Party that uh, that speaks to these values. And look, I think historically we'll find that in opposition, uh, Liberal Party does tend to the Liberal Party does tend to become more conservative because it has to have something to push back on. I think there is, um, you know, um, some inevitability about that. Um, but look, I don't know. I mean, I don't think there have been any numbers coming through on, on any of the Senate uh, that I can see anyway, any of the Senate numbers. So I don't know what the makeup of my chamber is going to look like. Um, and look, let's just hope that uh, there are people in there who, who share those views, you know, hope, in my case, hopefully liberals, but uh, uh, we will see. Uh, I think it is going to be, and I, like, I want to say once again, I mean, we don't want to be too alarmist on this night. That sounds... We don't want to look like it's sour grapes or anything like that, but we've got reason to be concerned about where we head now. Um, and as I said, using the example of what happened in South Australia, we've a similar framework, a an opposition leader that was casting himself as being a little bit like the blue team, but, you know, red. Um, you know, in the case of Valbenese, a little bit like Bob Hawke, but not. And, uh, you know, we'll see the, the rubber hit the road in, in a very short amount of time. Um, you know, and a lot of the things that we hold dear, I think, will be under assault. I, say, it, it, I think it's in my interest uh, to, to join the, the concern everyone has saying things are going to be terrible. I'm not sure I agree with this. I, I think there is a dire situation, but it's caused by the state of both of our major parties. Correct. So the idea of being so worried about Albanese uh, kind of misses the long-term no, game theory of the situation. I'm worried about where, the country, job. Yeah, well, and, and the cause I, of that, I, I don't think, is the Labor victory. I'm in furious agreement with you. So it, yeah. it may be that the Labor winning now, everyone's saying this is dire, this is terrible. It may be that the, what else is going to jolt the Liberals back to common sense? Continue it's going to be a long is three years between now well, and then, Is it going to be? I'm, like, I, I, I'm not sure. I, I, I'm kind of a bit with Dave here. I'm not sure if he thinks he's with me on this one, if I'm interpreting you correctly. I, I don't think this is the end of the world. No, no, no. Um, Look, no. And I think sometimes you know these I things hope. have to happen. And if we focus on Labor being the problem, uh, which I sometimes hear, I think, implicitly in this discussion, I think we miss the real problem. And that is the nature of, I think Gideon summed it up nicely. There's one political party, it's called Canberra. Yeah, yeah. the uni party. It's true. I hope true. that this is the fire which forges freedom. I don't mean to alliterate on, on purpose, um, but I hope that this is the fire that forges the conservative movement. That I don't think Please we need go. to coalesce or, or become one party or anything like that. I think we need intensive voter education, um, that we need to know how to make our preferences work, um, and that we, we very, very deliberately um, become involved in politics for three years and not just for three months before an election. I think more than just educating on how to vote, why would people value freedom? Why? 
answer that question and you'll unlock a key. Well, because we're about to find that out because that's what I'm saying is yeah. is the trials that we're about to go through, yeah. you, you saw the last two years were rough. Well, you're about to see right. what that's like under a not only state Labor governments but under a federal Labor government and a federal Labor Senate. Um, you're about to get the why. I, I completely agree with you, but, like, I had a problem even with my own party's message at Freedom, Freedom, Freedom Forever. I'll tell you right now. This is the equation you have to understand. Freedom to do what mm. and at what cost compared to something else. Yeah. Hey, I'm going to add uh, another guest um, who's uh, waiting in the wings now um, and might not get a lot of turn for everybody. Before I do um, bring in Dr. Stephen Shavura, I actually just want to get an update on the Western Australian results. Mm. Um, word from the election people, uh, the, the volunteers, the scrutineers, etc. But uh, would you, um, Rocco Loyakano, I'm saying it less like a skippy and more like a wog. Um, if you would you um, <laughs> tell us, uh, I used to say Loyakono and he said I'm a skippy, not bad for a skippy. So, okay, I, I got into training. It's, it's Rocco Loyakono. Um, please tell me I got that right. Anyway, I've, what's happening? I've in, created a monster. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what's happening in, in Perth? Uh, what have the, uh, the, the volunteers told you? Um, well, look, the early counts in uh, in in Pierce, uh, it's mm -hmm. not it's, it's not looking good for the the coalition. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's Christian Porter's old seat. Fifty five percent to forty five at the moment. Yeah, yeah, and um, uh, my seat of Swan, which the Liberals had pretty much given away, is is not looking good either. Um, the word on the ground that I had today from from the various volunteers is that there was a lot of positivity for uh, for the Freedom Parties in terms of Senate. So um, hopefully the the pessimism um, that I've just I've been hearing hearing about the Senate isn't totally borne out, um, and that there is there is some kind of handbrake uh, in the upper house. I mean I'm not holding my breath, but um, what I've heard of, from what I've heard on volunteers on the ground, um, there is there is cause for hope, uh, and of course we won't know that for a little while yet. But um, there was there was. Uh, and maybe when Kate comes on a little bit later on, she'll be able to 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 give you a little bit more of an insight into that. But um, from what I heard from her and a few others, uh, there was there was definitely a lot of goodwill out there for um, for for the uh, for the minor minor centre right parties. Mm -hmm. I'm just looking at the results in WA. It's shocking. Um, really? I didn't expect this. That looks like the Liberals have even lost. I mean, I. I've got to be careful here because um, what's the time over there at the moment? Sorry, you're on the It's other nearly half past seven. <laughs> nearly half past seven. So, okay. Yeah. okay, so the results are, you know, the ones that are in are, are fairly good. I'm looking at the seat of Curtin. There's oh, that was always going to be an issue. Oh, <laughs> wow. Like, she, she, you know, it's saying that, uh, that the, and they didn't expect this. This wasn't on the radar. So no, it's really funny. It's funny because two polls came out this week on Curtin and both said polar opposite. Both said exactly the opposite. One said Celia Hammond was home and hosed, and the other oh, one said Kate Cheney was home and hosed. So she's, she's yeah. lost it but, on those results. So, so, yeah. so in the seat of Pierce, um, it looks like uh, that, that's Christian Porter's old seat. That's been lost uh, by the Liberal Party to Labor. It looks like in the seat of, uh, as I just said, Curtin, it's been lost. To an independent, um, help me, Alex. Here, what are some of the other seats that the Liberal Party held over in? in uh, uh, I think Kim White's pretty pretty okay in Hasluck. Um, he's no, currently behind no, by five percent. No, I'm not no, sure. 55, 45, he, he's in doubt. What about? Uh, can, I, I mean, I've only seen the the, the point zero five. I think, five, I think five Kenning's all right. Five, so. um, Ken, Kenning, yeah, Andrew Hayes is sitting on eleven yeah. percent, isn't he? So he, I think yeah. he really, he'd be he'd be okay. Well, um, Andrew Hayes is uh, you know going to be a great guy for the future, but he's been reduced to a marginal electorate now. Mm. Mm, well, that's yeah. interesting. I mean, it's, he took it from a marginal and he made it relatively safe, and now it's going back to marginal again. Isn't it interesting? Isn't it? What are the other seats over there that the Liberal Party held? Uh, the seat of Moore, 
which is 50 yeah. 50, literally 50 50 at the moment. Well, uh, Forest is the seat in the southwest, which you give down, which you give to the concert, it's to the Liberals in a oh, lot. No, 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 definitely no. held that. So, yeah, I'll take Forest an eight percent swing against them, though. So, that does indicate something's happening in WA. It looks like Labor is going to pick up three in WA, Pierce, Swan, and Hasluck. They, those were the three they were targeting, and then yeah. potentially a teal is going to take uh, Curtin. So, it, it, WA is turning red. And i got to say, um, Alex, you all agree with me on this. Sad to see that Vince Connolly has lost to Ian Arley. Vince Connolly was a great guy. Vince Connolly was the person who actually seconded my private member's bill, which I know that you supported strongly, Alex, uh, in the um, Human Rights uh, Children <coughs> Born Life Protection Bill. Um, Vince Connolly seconded that. Vince Connolly lost his seat because of the, um, uh, the redistribution, redistribution yeah. that went on. Uh, he's contested against Dan Ali. There were some hopes that uh, actually he could win that. It's a it's a it thumping loss. Was by not the looks close. Of it. Um, yeah, 64. Yeah. 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 Has luck's a real surprise. Kim I thought it was, there was definitely a talk over here that uh, that they shouldn't need, they shouldn't worry about that. Because well, was, these, these numbers might be early, but on, on the current numbers, the swing to Labor is 11, 12 percent in more, 11 percent in Hasluck. 12% in Pierce, wow. 13% in Swan. It goes on. It's a, a 13% in Cohen, which is uh, the seat you were just talking about, Anali. So, so it's clear it's going to be most likely well, my, my a majority numbers here, Labor government. No, my numbers here still have it, a, a minority Labor government, but very close. How, how is that? Can you talk us uh, through? Because I haven't been writing this down. You have been, John. Okay. Talk us through well, what this, the results are. This is a mess. What I've got here is... Uh, <laughs> I think, Labor looks that's, that's the call of the election. That's the comment. This is a mess. It's a mess. <laughs> it's a no. comment we've had. Labor needed to pick up uh 10 seats uh to, to have uh 77. You need um 77 to have yeah. someone in the speaker and still have the majority. Um, so 10 seats they needed to pick up. Uh, based on this, I, I have them picking up 11 but losing two. No, well, 11, uh, losing two. Yes, losing Fowler to the independent, so, Dai Lee, and so, losing Gilmore to the Nat uh, Const Constance, I yeah, think his yeah, name Andrew was. Constance, uh, I, which, I, I believe uh, he comes um, from the, the hard green teal wing of the National Party. That's but correct. nonetheless, he's in the coalition, at least nominally. <laughs> uh, so it, that that has them picking up eight or nine, and a few of these are, are line balls. So Benelong was early in the Labor column. I think it'll go back to the Liberal column. Uh, Sturt was earlier in the Labor column. I think it'll go back to the Liberal column. Do you reckon so Sturt, like Sturt's retained, Alex? What do you reckon? Yeah, oh, look, it looks like it. Uh, I think it's actually, I've been watching that closely all night. It looks to be, uh, I think, pulling away. I think uh, James is pulling pulling that margin back. It was it was early on, looking a bit dicey, but I, it, I think we've got postals to come and I think he'll be safe. But uh, there's, a, there's a, a swing on. Um, he held it by about 6.9%. looks to be about a 5.5% swing, so I think he'll hold on. Yeah, yeah so I have this as Labor falling one or two shorts. So they'll need a – they could rule – they could govern with the Greens because I've got the Greens having three. That would be enough. Uh, the Teals will end up with something in the order of, if you count some of the pre-existing Teals, like uh, Stegall and Haynes and Indi, uh, then the Teals will end up with something in the order of eight. So they'll certainly – Labor will be able to pass legislation e with either the Greens – or the teals uh, in the lower house, but I've I've got them coming in at about 74, 75. Um, I don't know if that's the same number as anyone else has. Uh, I haven't been watching the, the mainstream stations. I'd be very curious to know whether uh, what what their calls are at the moment. Alex, are you watching them? No, I don't have a fake news antenna, so <laughs> I don't uh, I don't watch any of those. Um, so uh, they don't go on on the antic house. So can I just say as well, just just while we're on the subject of. Uh, of uh, of South Australia, and it's a special shout out to my my little uh, my little ethnic mate Tony Passon from down in Barker, who is a yeah. a, a terrier of and, and George would know him well a, a terrier of a human being, but a, a, yeah. um, a frenetic local member who gets the job done, who speaks with conviction about conservative issues, and who has bucked the trend effectively uh, of the swing. He's had a too. minor swing. About two percent, and and he's on an eighteen percent margin. So he he's held the fort. Um, I have to say, a poster boy for um, good good local representation with good values, um, yeah. and that's what we see. So that is the formula. Mm. It does seem from your home state again, Alex uh, Rebecca Sharkey from well, Central Alliance, nominally the party. Yeah. She's basically an independent. 
Um, yep. She is romping it in, a, a big she swing is. to her there as well. So yep. that used to be a uh, Liberal Party royalty. And that's yeah, that was, uh, that was a Alexander process Downer. Held, held by Downer, Alexander Downer, and then uh, Jamie Briggs. Um, and, and, but look, the, the demographics changed a little bit out there. It's, it's quite, uh, quite a different seat than it was perhaps in the Downer era. Um, but uh, look, it shows the, the danger in giving up seats to independents from the major parties. They become very hard to get back. I want to uh, just take this moment to thank you, Rocco, for uh, joining us for that update uh, and that insight. And um, if you could uh, just uh, give us a shout out for that book, um, head to, uh, where is it, uh, deconstructingscomo.com.au, um, your website. And uh, if you haven't read that book yet, so grab a copy and we'll get it out to you. You can uh, figure out exactly uh, what path, um, the Liberals should not take again, which has, has totally uh, yeah. basically now destroyed Australia. Thanks, Rocco. Yeah, this is it was the companion of why the Liberals will lose, and now it's the companion of why they have lost. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, brilliant. Um, Alex, are you, uh, yeah. are you happy to um, stick around with this uh, for a little bit longer? Um, we've to. Got, love um, to. Okay. If, well, you, if you're happy to have me, I'd love to be here. I will. I'll bring in um, uh, Stephen Shavira. Um, did we did we manage to do that? Not quite. All right. Um, Campbell, Campbell Newman. Newman um, um, welcome, welcome to, to uh, uh, Freedom Speaks. Speaks. What's, uh, What's freedom, freedom, freedom had to say tonight? To say tonight. Sorry, David. You were talking to me. Yes. Yeah. 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 Well, I'm not yeah sure I didn't. I didn't. I didn't hear. Didn't hear your question, mate. Sorry. A lot of noise here. A lot of happy people. So the question, the question was, was Campbell, Campbell uh, uh, freedom, freedom, freedom Speaks freedom is the name of the show. What does Freedom say tonight? Freedom say tonight? Well, look, hmm, that's, that's an interesting question. I'd, I don't know if I could answer it in that way. I think, um, and I haven't heard all the things you've been talking about tonight, but what, what we've seen tonight um, across Australia is a complete fragmentation of the so-called conservative base due to the yeah. fact yeah. that the coalition didn't stand up for the values that they supposedly uh, are meant to represent. And, you know, you've seen a splintering of the vote to, to UAP, to One Nation, and uh, happily to the Lib Dems, and in some cases sort of conservative-type independents, and they have paid the price. They really have. Um, uh, I heard you saying before about what you were sort of questioning about what uh, mainstream media is saying. Well, the, a, a, the ABC are now calling it for the Labor Party. Um, and then I then look at what's then going on in specific seats with Frydenberg looks like he's lost. Uh, Wilson uh, has lost in Victoria. Uh, Trevor Evans in the seat of Brisbane. Um, Julian Simmons in uh, Ryan. Uh, in inner city Brisbane, um, Zimmerman gone. Uh, it sort of goes on and on and on. And it, it, it seems to me that the message of this evening is if you don't um, maintain the proper Liberal Party and maintain that broad church, but also stand up for things that really matter to the base, you get this fragmentation. And, and people have parked votes all over the place um, which haven't then come back. And that, that's the story of this evening. And it, it's sad, but it was predictable, but there it is. Uh, uh, Campbell, do Campbell, you think, you think the Liberal Party is, is uh, uh, possible from here? From here? Available? Available? Well, it is if they get the right lesson. But sadly what happens is they, they have a track record of getting the wrong messages well, or lessons from elections. I mean, at the risk of sounding self-serving, the lesson they took when we lost in 2015 was that um, that uh, somehow they needed to apologise for adopting policies of fiscal responsibility and reform, and that wasn't the case at all. They spent sort of seven years apologising, running away, hiding, uh, not being prepared to defend their legacy, um, and they had a great legacy, um, best performing hospitals, no uh, ambulance ramping, crime down by 15%. If you flip that round, crime across suburban Brisbane's up, ambulance ramping is rife, and the hospitals are 
aren't performing at all. Yet, because the LNP here didn't stand up for themselves, um, they took a lesson that they should apologise and run away from their record. They now have a primary vote at the state level, equivalent to where Morrison's coming in this evening, down in the the mid the mid thirties, you know, thirty six percent primary, and you can't win from that. You just can't win from that unless, and then this is the next lesson: if you can't actually create um, actually tight, buttoned up preference deals with these. You know, minor parties like UAP, like the Lib Dems, like One Nation, then you're not going to actually bring the, bring those votes back and get there on a two-party preferred basis. You know, some of their preference decisions in this election have been nothing short of bloody-minded and vindictive as opposed to prag coolly pragmatic and political. I don't know if John Humphreys wants to comment on that. He's, he's been at the forefront from our party. Yeah, i, I got yeah, to say it's... Say um, it's um, well, actually, I don't know if this is the right time to be talking about the, the, the preference deals. It, it is a point of constant frustration. The uh, What seems to me the Liberal Party's inability to recognise their own self-interest. Uh, but I, uh, you need to too much inside you need, baseball. You need to thing. enlarge on that. Um, well, the first thing, I'll, I'll just do that at the meta level then, because I don't want to get uh, in, in the details of the conversations back and forth, although I, I would suggest that Liberals urgently need to get a professional in to help them work out their preferences. They are the only player in the preference game well, let me tell you doesn't what... seem to know what's happening in the preference game. Literally everyone else knows what's happening and the Liberals are the mark. And everyone knows it except the Liberals because they still think they know what they're doing and the only person who can't learn is the person who thinks they already know it all. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's extremely frustrating. But at a meta point, it's extremely obvious and has been for a very long time that the Liberals need a, a minor right party in the Senate if they ever want to pass meaningful legislation in the future. 2004 to 2007, Howard had a majority in the Senate. That was an anomaly caused by the fact that the LNP didn't exist. The Liberals and the Nationals were two different parties in Queensland. That doesn't exist now. Mm. It is basically going to be as rare as hen's teeth for the Liberals to ever be able to pass legislation in their own right. So they're going to have to rely on who? Lambie? The Greens? Just uh, dumb luck? I mean, they obviously have a vested interest in having a minor right party in the Senate long term that is sustainable, that has a reason for being there and that, that believes in some sort of small government, conservative, free market, classical, liberal, libertarian, whatever it is, agenda. But this and they put self, no effort into building that. But this self-immolation started in 2016 when Malcolm Turnbull conspired with the Greens to set up the Senate voting system so that it eliminated all the potential candidates that would side with the coalition in the Senate and exclusively favoured the medium parties and the duopoly. There was a case to be made to change the voting system. The way they changed it very clearly benefited the Greens and was always going to benefit the Greens. Yeah. And the Liberals turn around now and act confused, but it was unambiguous. If you knew how to do maths, if you knew how to add up and do the preference deals, yeah. it was always going to benefit the, the Greens. But I don't think that's where it started. The, the Liberals have been pretty <clears throat> clueless at working out their own self-interest, especially in the Senate for a, quite a long time. Uh, and it, it is a point of frustration for me because it's, it seems like they're the only player left that doesn't know the game going on. Yep. Uh, and I, I don't know what to do about that because they still think they know what they're doing. They, they had a, had a, it's obvious, it's obvious. Campbell, Campbell was, was um, um, there anything there anything you as the Premier of Queensland that, 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 that I guess confirmed I guess John's, John's theory, theory, theory that, uh, the, the Coalition have absolutely no idea how to work with it. Oh, look, I, I'll defer to John on this. That's why, sort of, frankly, that's why I threw it in before because he has been at the forefront of the preference deals. But, I mean, you know, it, to be a bit more pointed, he was being, dip, you know, dip, somewhat diplomatic as well. I mean, some of their, um, I suppose, their decisions all have been very much emotional ones, in my view, in this campaign and, and uh, quite, you know, frankly, based on, you know, uh, emotion and also uh, a bit of vindictiveness, you know, um, and, it, and it's crazy. They, they have to find, look, they've either got to, they've either got to somehow build up the party um, by, you know, showing that they will stand up for the values that they espouse and win back people from One Nation, Liberal Democrats and the UAP, uh, or they actually have to get tight preference agreements where they know that it's going to come back uh, from from the minor parties that I've just mentioned. I mean, by the way, if I could just talk Lib Dems this evening, I mean, 
I think we've had a, a pretty good result here in Queensland this evening on the results so far. Um, there's been there's been you know varying results from from sort of around two percent through to about four and a half five um, in Queensland, and I think that's pretty pretty good given the resources that were available. But I really I don't know if it's just if it's a more early results, but just in the Northern Territory, Kylie Banani has got 10% of the primary um, compared to, you know, four or five-ish for UAP and one and one nation. What an extraordinary effort. And she was quite, you know, quite late coming to, to, to the party. So a big shout out to Kylie this evening. You know, you know, she, she's done very, very well. Yeah, yeah, just yeah, looking at the looking NT, NT again, again uh, uh, by the way, our, our, our Senate candidates there, there uh, Dr. 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 Sam McMahon and, and her team, are also scoring 10%. 10%. So it's 10% across the entire Northern Territory there as well, which uh, is, of course, in the Territory, you need 33 or 34% to get in. 10% won't get Sam elected. That 10%, if she was in a state, that would get her elected. Uh, it looks like she's going to fall short, but 10% is a very admirable uh, outing. So that's Kylie and Sam both did very well over in the NT. Um, yeah. Alex, do you Alex, have any do thoughts, you have any thoughts on, on the conversation, conversation that we've, that we've uh, had between Campbell and uh, and John? Oh no, look, not not anything particularly groundbreaking to add to all of that. I think the conversation about the preferences is really very true. I was just looking at some of the the early Senate results uh, as we spoke before, and um, uh, I you know I think there's a uh, at least a, a chance that we might see a One Nation senator from South Australia. Um, so that will depend wholly on, on this point on those preferences. We seem to have uh, two and a half quotas uh, to the Libs, two to Labor, one one almost to the Greens. They'll get there, and the next clear uh, in clearly in front is uh, is Pauline Hanson's One Nation. So. Um, that's going to be a very interesting space to watch. I don't know what the other states are doing. I haven't got my head around those yet, but the preferences, of course, going to be very, very important there. Yes. The, uh, the, it actually looks like the, the Liberals' third will be in the running against Pauline, uh, and yep. the, it'll be interesting to see the degree to which the, the Lib Dems' UAP preference deal uh, holds in South that's, Australia. If that's that holds, exactly right. That's 2.2 uh, plus 3.3. Uh, 3. 5.5 would put UAP in front of One Nation it uh, might, in South it Australia might. Yep. if those preferences flow. Uh, and, of course, people who vote for minor parties are notoriously independently minded. So um, th they are aware that yeah. preferences are suggestions and they can go their own way. So you don't want to factor that in too strongly. So, guys, we no. called it a while ago pretty much, but uh, just to let you know that both the ABC and the Australian are reporting that... Uh, uh, Scott Morrison has lost. Uh, the coalition will not have enough numbers to form the next government. And Anthony Albanese is going to be the next Prime Minister of Australia. May God have mercy on us all. <laughs> <laughs> of course, Anthony Green was just copying my lead there. So I think we called that one an hour ago here. But, uh, 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 Alex, will there be a uh, by-election in, uh, in the seat of Cook now? Oh, look, I, I don't know. Um, I, I, I just, I mean, I think those are always possibilities, but I don't have any, any sort of fore, forewarning or foreknowledge of what the Prime Minister's uh, intentions are there. Uh, history would say, though, that, that there's a strong possibility, I suppose. Um, we will wait and see. And we know that elections always throw up by, by elections in relatively short spaces afterwards. So I, I think, you know, we, we will see what comes of it. There may be vacancies in the Senate too. Who knows? Was that a hint about your own career? Me? <laughs> vacancies in the Senate? Cook? No. <laughs> what, a, what about a future tilt at the uh, seat of Perth, B, uh, Alex? Oh. Uh, come down and uh, become leader of the Liberal Party and, and make Australia <laughs> great again. Make Australia You're great in the way of my plan here. He's supposed to come and join the, the, the great breakaway party here. <laughs> no, look, I, I think I'm pretty comfortable up in the Senate. It's, uh, there, there is a degree of movement in terms of, um, you know, the voice you do get. It's a very good place to be, and I'm, I'm pretty comfortable up there in the, in, the, in the red chamber, so I might leave that to someone else. Uh, uh, Campbell, I'd like to, I guess, ask you... Um, how the results are going for you um, and 
and what next, uh, if if anything, uh, if you've got any future involvement with the Lib, Lib Dems, if uh, the, the final counting and preference flow doesn't uh, work uh, super well for you right now. Is, is, uh, is it too early to give up hope? Oh, sorry, uh, just give me one second. Sorry, Campbell. Uh, uh, again, sorry, Campbell. Again, sorry, Campbell. Sorry, say that again. Say that again. Sorry, sorry. Just have you on mute. We've got to bring both of our mics out. We've got to mute mine now. Go, go. So I was just saying, I, I haven't seen any results. I've been too busy uh, having a good evening here at Bean Lee Multi uh, Sports Club with everybody uh, who's been working on the booths today. So um, my focus has been elsewhere, to be honest. You tell me. Well, I can give you, well, a, can give you a, a couple of... Couple of I'm just, just going through some of the things that we have to have have some 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 candidate, 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 as you would know, and a lot of the Lib Dem supporters, she became one of the... The favourites around the country, not just in Queensland, but a lot of people were following her campaign. About five percent for Diane, uh, which is a, a pretty good effort for for, for any minor party. Um, Toby Sutherland, uh, I believe you were out on the Huskings with, with him today as well. Yeah, three uh, percent uh, in in the seat of Ford. Uh, look, he is a, a stellar candidate and a great a great option for the future. I, I hope he sticks around in politics because he really does have a lot to offer uh, the, the political front. Um, another 3% for Mich Michelle Jacques, uh, Adam Blair. So I, I haven't gone through all of our seats uh, yet, but that's uh, some of the results I've seen coming in. Um, look, I tell you, one of the things, and I, I hope Campbell agrees with this, one of the things that's come out of this for us is there's been some great people coming through the system. Uh, some people that's really going to be there for the future. Uh, and You've been working with them a lot more than I can. Uh, so uh, how did you find your yeah. team? Oh, look, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's that's the, the, the nature of our celebration this evening, that uh, we've basically been uh, talking to people about the fact that this was just first step in trying to build a real alternative here uh, in terms of a party that is you know, libertarian, that has... Um, uh, those all those values that uh, the Lib Dems you know are, are famous for, uh, and th this is just the first go. And so tonight we've actually literally in the speeches has been winding up um, the campaign. We've been talking about the need for people to to sort of double down and actually have another go, and to build the branch structure and you know the things that we need the wherewithal for campaigning. And there's a huge amount of enthusiasm to do that, and so. I think it bodes well for the future for the for the Lib Dems. Sadly, um, I think it um, you know, will we'll see further support eroding from, from the Liberal National Party. I mean, I don't know, going back to what you asked me earlier on, I mean, I haven't seen any Senate numbers myself this evening, but um, I, I'd put it like this. If it was up to members of the Liberal National Party, um, so I'm talking about members of the political party, um, I, I think I'd get up. Now, that... That's because they've been actually sending me copies of photos of their, uh, their their ballot papers today in the last few days that they've actually been voting for me in quite significant numbers, people, people who are office bearers and even uh, uh, sitting politicians. Then again, they're not, you know, they're, they're just members of the, they're members of the party. They're not representative of the, the, the bulk of LNP. Who are the sitting MPs, Campbell? Come on, drop some names. <laughs> <laughs> Never you mind, mate. <laughs> but uh, it's uh, it's been very encouraging. Like that. So I don't know how Campbell. I don't know how it's going to go, but um, we shall see. But I, I think it's just it's it's more testament to the fact that there is an absence. You know, uh, to be rather pointed about the LNP in Queensland, there is an absence of leadership. There really is. Um, and you know, when you've got office bearers in the party wanting to support someone who's you know, last political gig was seven years ago. You know, you got a problem. Um, so it's 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 nice for me, but it also really more what I'm saying it is to more reflect on the sad state of the LNP in Queensland, the lack of leadership. If you've, uh, if you've, uh, you've heard these coming through, Campbell, but it looks like the teals have picked up 
it looks like five at the moment, uh, an extra five left-leaning independents in the House, and it looks like a chance that they will uh, share the balance of power with the Greens in the lower house. Uh, putting the, the Greens have got an extra seat in Ryan. Basically. Well, I'm counting two seats for the uh, extra seats the, for the Greens, Griffith, the Griffiths. The second ex- Griffiths. But Griffith, they, they, well, they're fine. taking that off Labor, but uh, and they're taking Ryan off the Liberals. Uh, so it looks like uh, Greens will be up to three. I think Labor will be about two or three short of the majority. But so putting aside, because obviously we're quite focused on the freedom friendly minor parties and the Senate races. Um, but looking at the, the country as a whole and the outcome here, Albanese is PM, maybe in a minority government with a, a whole horde of teals and a gaggle of greens. What's your thoughts on how the next three years play out for the nation? Well, it's going to depend, <clears throat> going to depend a lot on, on the Senate makeup, isn't it? Because it's, if, if it's the way you just painted it, um, I think uh, it gets pretty scary. Um, you know, in this situation right now, I'm hoping that Albo gets a majority of his own right because I think there's, there's plenty of pragmatists in, in the right of the Labor Party and I think they'll be obviously far more sensible. But if, if they're beholden to these, um, you know, um, supposed independents slash the Greens, then, then we've got big trouble. We really do. Um, yeah, it, it's it's, a, it's, it's a, hopefully not going to be the case this evening ability that Lambie might uh, get her staffer up as a second Lambie senator uh, and that they might have balance of power in the Senate. So I, I don't mean to scare you or, or to ruin your night with that thought, uh, but that is a, uh, I, I find a bit of a scary thought for the future of Senate negotiation. Absolutely. But Alex. But Alex. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. Campbell, we'd better let you let get you back get to back. your party. Thank you so much for uh, the, the time you've time given us, given us to, And, and uh, uh, I don't know if you were uh, high, 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 All the best. All the best. Thanks, mate. Thanks, everyone. Cheers. Have a good night. Thank you, mate. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. I'll just say, you know what I've been telling my supporters through this whole process is, is you, you draw out the sort of people you want to keep in touch with. You know, that you draw out your tribe. And I think no matter what the future brings, that is a powerful resource. Mm-hmm. And I think we should double down on tribe, community, and people who share our values. Yep. I think that's 100%. very, very important. Yep. Very important. 100%. We need to keep people fired up. We need to keep the Absolutely. freedom movement alive. Absolutely. As fragmented as it got yep. and as... as as, as bitchy as it got in some respects, um, you know, we need to try and keep yeah. people in this, in a bigger tent, Yeah. Um, whether it's Lib Dems, whether it's the One Nation types, whether it's UAP, whether it's you know, even Australia One, absolutely, whatever, uh, we need to keep them all in the tent of freedom. I agree. And you need to create a story around freedom. You know, if you talk, look at the Greens, they have they have a a, a story, a religion almost oh, around not saving, almost. So, oh no, <laughs> quite literally. Yeah. But I didn't want to offend people by making a religious comparison. No, no, it, it's a it's a religion. It it's a, a religion. It's a perverted, idolatrous, pagan religion. It's a false religion. Absolutely. Um, but it is. But it is one. Nevertheless, it is a story. It's a compelling worldview that is cohesive within their parameters yeah obviously it's not maybe cohesive to reality but within their parameters that which they're um indoctrinated into it is cohesive and is persuasive yep so we need to find that for freedom yeah if you want to sell it you need to find whatever that is uh well on the phone right now we have uh dr stephen shavura Uh, we haven't been able to make the uh the the video connection work but uh hopefully the audio is fine uh, can you hear us okay, Stephen? I sure can, David, and hello to everyone there. Steve, how just how pathetic um, is the Liberal Party right now? <laughs> <laughs> what a question. <laughs> present, present company excluded. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, the, the numbers speak for themselves, and, and you know, people within uh, the Liberal Party have been warning them of this for nearly three years that you know, the more they gravitate towards a centre-left position, the more they abandon 
the, the, the quite conservative ideals of the lower middle class who were you know, once upon a time Menzies forgotten people and then in the 90s uh, reimagined as Howard's battlers. Well, the more that they ignore these people, uh, the less reason there is for anyone to vote for them. And that's exactly what's happened. Um, I mean, the, the Liberals were in a sense in one way lucky to win the 2019 election they had a they had a very very unpopular opposition leader of course that was bill short a very weird man that no one really connected with and so they managed to get that election and uh with that they should have really um uh knuckled down on distinguishing themselves from labor on issues like climate on issues like religious liberty uh, but really uh they didn't and consequently no one has i mean the right have no reason to vote for them and of course the left were never going to vote for them so an utterly right. pathetic party riven by factions riven by insipid wishy-washy uh, centrism at best and, and leftism at worst uh, which really has no reason to exist right now uh, and, but, but what I would say, David, is that we, we need to see all crises as opportunities. And this could be the opportunity required mm -hmm. to cleanse the party of the very people. And by cleanse, I don't mean anything Maoist or Stalinist like that. But uh, it's basically being cleansed in this election. And to get uh, genuine uh, conservative liberals uh, uh, in, into pre-selection, uh, get them interested in attending branch meetings again and spend the next three years uh, not just um, whining and, and moaning, but actually reforming the party and, and, and creating a party, recreating a party that's worthy to be voted for uh, in, in, um, in the next uh, federal election. Any thoughts, gentlemen? Any? Uh... Sorry, I've just been uh, engrossed in updating the Senate numbers here. Weren't paying um, attention. <laughs> well, I mean, someone's got to be looking at the numbers here. It's no, no, good, good, good. Uh, Alex, um, uh, I, I don't want to dump you in it, but uh, I mean, have you got yeah, any? Go on. Dump, dump, dump away. Um, <laughs> reflections. Uh, I mean, I, I think you, you would naturally be agreeing with what Stevens. I guess, called for, and that's greater participation in the Liberal Party um, yeah. to renew it because nothing else is going to, to save it. I mean, we're, we're seeing the, the WA Liberals basically blame the people they ignored for their blood loss in the, the, the hemorrhaging of votes and support in Western Australia. Is, is there any different um, going to be outcome in the, in the Federal Liberal Party um, debrief? Oh, gee, we got this really wrong. We should listen to the right wing. Or oh damn the right wing. Well, look, I, mean, I, I, I hope it's uh, I hope it's listened to um, rather than damn it, um, of course. But I, I look, I, I think as we said earlier on, very about an hour ago, I um, you know I can only reiterate what I said before. And the, the Liberal Party is a conservative party at its heart. And point somebody made earlier on was about the We Believe statement. The, the, the constitution of the party talks all the right language. Um, mm. It's just that it's got to do that stuff when it hits government. It's not enough just to do it in opposition when it's easy. I mean, everyone can be a hero when there aren't promotions on the line. Um, the difficulty arises that when we've got the levers of power in our hands, we've got to follow through with them. And look, I mean, you know, there are divergence of views on the subject and, you know, people don't like him and they don't whatever. But the person that showed exactly how you can do this is President Donald Trump, who, mm. uh, when given the opportunity... Uh, did what he said he was going to do, and uh, and and continued to do it through the entire term. Stayed true to the to the to the, con the constituency that elected him, um, and you know to hawk back to hark back to that phrase that was used by President Ronald Reagan. You got to dance with the one that brung you. Um, that's the reality here. I think that's what we're seeing. We we can't afford to try to be like uh, the Labor and the Greens. It doesn't work. It's never worked. It's not going to work. Uh, and I think the Conservatives do have to be listened to inside the Liberal Party. And I think it is absolutely right. And once again, this is not to deride from anything that's being done by the minor parties, but the reality is all of those, um, if could be brought back into the Liberal Party, uh, we would have a very um, reinvigorated Conservative Party, which, you know, I think could, could do that. Um, that's effectively what Menzies did, really, wasn't it, back <clears> in the <throat> early days, is he got, yeah. he got them all together and he said, listen, we're, we're better together than apart. Menzies um, started his own party. I'm, I'm sorry, the, this isn't the right time to have too many debates, but the, the idea of join it and change it from the inside 
has become a meme. You know, you don't like Al Qaeda, join them and change them from the inside. You don't like the Greens, join them and change it from the inside. People have been trying to join the Liberals to change it from the inside for decades and decades. Major parties have to follow the polls. We criticize them for it, as we should, because I don't want them to follow focus groups and polls. But if a major party doesn't follow focus groups and polls, they very quickly become the opposition and stay the opposition. But surely the exception to don't follow the polls constantly is polling day. But what the, so the, follow the, this poll. Follow this poll. Your moderates have been wiped out because you're irrelevant. You you haven't differentiated your product. Yeah, but John's on to something. It's a, it's about um, always wanting to pitch yourself into the in the centre and therefore yeah. uh, the Liberal Party becomes a pale imitation of but the it, Labor Party. But I just want to point out that I, I don't particularly blame the Liberal Party or the Labor Party for doing it. It's exactly the incentives they're given. The nature of the game is, is that their, their incentives, voting. well, we should definitely get rid of compulsory voting. It was a part of the Freedom Manifesto, ldp.org.au slash freedom. Uh, but <laughs> the more to the point, I actually think that people who end up changing politics the most uh, are the disruptors. And two of the best disruptors, put aside what they stand for, uh, and I don't, I don't agree with both of them on everything, or with Bob Brown on anything, but Bob Brown and Pauline Hanson changed Australian politics. And they did it by disrupting and shifting the Overton window, and it forced, Bob Brown forced Labor to change. Pauline forced the Liberals to change more than anybody joining and changing it from the inside did. Uh, so I, I'm i not sure if that's the way forward. I, I think the Liberals will improve when people like Pauline and George and Campbell uh, and Craig Kelly uh, force them to change. And then they will change because the focus groups tell them they have to, not because they believe in it. You know, I, 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 Sorry to chime in on top of you, probably Alex, but I'm in agreement with that. I mean, I wasn't in the Liberal Party, I was in the National Party, but I was in the Liberal National Party in Queensland, which is a strange beast, of course, um, and a branch of the Liberal Party, mind you. And and so, uh, you know, I spent 10 years changing it from the inside, trying to change it from the inside. And it just eventually, it's like it's not going to be changed. I just know it's not. The point which I see. The state council of the Liberal National Party reject a motion that's opposing net zero. You know that there's a problem, um, and so so uh, that was it. it. It was done for me. So I, I'm not sure. Look, I wish you all the best. I do hope. I really do that people like yourself and uh, Tony Passon and others that are rock solid conservatives that remain within the Liberal Party that are pro-freedom, people like Jared Rennick, depending on what he's going to do, um, that, that, that you are able to get the upper hand here. But 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 I worry that you're not going to be able to. I mean, look, I, I'm sorry to bang on here, but I'll just look at this ABC report. Um, Simon Birmingham's asked uh, on some panel here about... Um, what the message is with all of these losses to the teal independents and the greens and these once safe liberal seats and he says it's a clear problem we're losing seats that are heartland seats that have been defined that have defined the liberal party for generations and so if we lose those seats it is not certain that we will but there is clearly a big movement against us and there is clearly a big message in it and we need to heed that message now, it doesn't say what the message is but i bet the message for simon birmingham is we need to move more to the left. We need to be more like the Teal Independents. And this, Alexander, is what you are going to be facing and you are going to be fighting against. I say good luck to you. I'm just not sure that it's a fight that can be won. Alex, well, before I, you respond, I actually I, want to yeah. ask um, Stephen to, to just uh, weigh in here. He's obviously still on the phone with us. Um, Stephen, before we let you go, I mean, what, what's your two cents? I'm probably with Alex here. And I'll chip in after he he responds. But um, is the Liberal Party something we should give up on, or something we should infiltrate and redeem? This is another option. Well, it doesn't actually sound like we're that far apart from one another. It's it's not a question of either the Liberal Party, based on pure principle and good heartedness, just reforming spontaneously from the inside or uh, it's completely dying. I mean, what we basically seem to agree on, well, this is, this is what I would say, is that you know, it needs a strong motivation to reform internally, and that strong motivation is the likelihood of never getting back into government. And so do I believe that the, the Liberal Party can internally reform? I think it can, 
but it's not going to be because of some just you know angelic saintly change of heart it will be because of the prospect of just continuing to lose government time and time again and it's happened before it happened with the labor government between you know 1949 and 1972 and and labor did actually reform but so it, i don't know that our views are entirely inconsistent um you know what, what would lead the liberal party to reform or basically being unelectable if it didn't uh, reform. And one strategy, one other strategy may be, is simply to give up on certain uh, seats which have basically gone the way of, of teal independence and start focusing more on some of the working class seats in the, uh, in the working class suburbs and, and bringing to, you know, and really exploiting the tremendous impact that uh, perhaps the Labor Greens climate policy is going to have on everyday Australians. So it may be, the, you know, the, just the time to really um, reimagine the future of the Liberal Party uh, in terms of more a, a uh, sort of a, a lower middle class, working class party uh, picking up um, after the debris of uh, energy prices, uh, unemployment in areas that are going to be smashed by uh, leftist policy. So uh, I, you know, I just don't know that we're really that far apart from one another. Okay. Um, I think Alex gets a right of reply to all of this. Alex, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, let's... Uh, let's your well, turn. look, I mean, I, I, think, I think Stephen's right. I don't think we are in, in disagreement at all in many respects. I, I, I think one of the things to observe here is that we're not talking about some Damascene conversion inside political parties. What we're talking about is people who share our values becoming members of the Liberal Party in order to ensure that they are pre-selecting people like themselves or, uh, you know, somebody else who carries that, 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 those values. Now, I mean, in itself, that is a very simple proposition. It's one that just simply I don't think has been explored. I'm encouraging people to do that here in South Australia and have been for some considerable time, and I can tell you it's already working. Now, it's a long road. It's like the old question of when's the best time to plant a tree? Well, 10 years ago. The issue is that this stuff hasn't been done earlier on, and... You know, once again, at the risk of sounding like a broken record, there it is. Anyone that wants to do that, to be part of that movement, get in touch with me and I'll tell them how. The other thing I want to make, the uh, point I want to make about this is that I, I think that there is enough of the quiet Australians to go around to join whichever of the parties they think they want. This is the point, right? This is the point we made very early on. It's, it's not about changing the party miraculously by snapping your fingers just because it hasn't happened. And it's not about everyone joining one particular political colour. The quiet Australians are just a group of people who need to get re-engaged with politics per se, not just letting it, you know, go by day by day. I mean, I, I say to people, if you're whinging about the state of your country, if you're whinging about things that are happening inside your country and you're not a member of a political party, pre-selecting people that speak for you before they go to the election, because sometimes people can't vote for someone that shares their views because there isn't one, then you're not doing enough. It's as simple as that. Don't whinge about it anymore. The time for whinging's over. The time for political engagement is upon us. I, I agree, um, and and yeah, I, I don't think the the time to quit on the Liberal Party is yet. Um, I, I'd be interested to hear from these three gentlemen what the point is of joining a minor party. Can I come be, into this? Um, let me just I... finish this thought. Um, I think the only I want to uh, vote for donate to and volunteer for a minor party or at, actually let me just say that at every election i want who i vote for donate to and volunteer for to be up for grabs and won by the best candidate running but if i wasn't in the media and needing to be truly independent i would join the liberal party for that purpose of being salt and light for changing it for influencing it not out of support not out of endorsement but out of it is the best hope for forming government and, and actually achieving policy while still being a, an undecided voter at every election and giving my support to the actual person. So what's the, what's uh, what's the, the point incentive? of joining the other parties that actually helps them get better as opposed to joining the Liberal Party? Because that's I think that's your either or. I think people need to participate fully. But, like, can't oh, I just... I was just about to come in and uh, put out the olive branch here to the, to the Liberal Party, but that line there, you say you, you join them to change it from the inside. Like, look, given the track record, Roger Douglas in New Zealand, uh, Bob Hawke, uh, admirably, they, um, Peter Walsh, the person actually behind those reforms that doesn't get the credit in the Labor Party, why don't you join the Labor Party and change it from the inside? I mean, they've got a track record 
at doing some of the most important microeconomic reform in this country's history. So uh, if we're joining a major party and changing them from the inside, you don't obviously join the Libs. Now, the, the olive branch I want to give is I, I don't think everyone should just give up on the Liberal Party. I don't think that's the answer at all. I think we need to understand the nature of the game. Major parties have to get 50% plus one or they're not in government. That, that's the game they're in. Right? Yeah. So I, I don't want everyone to just give up on either major party. We just need to recognize that game. If you want to shift them, you actually need to, I, I, I would argue, you have more success shifting them from the outside. Not giving up on them, not making them disappear. But then what role should each person How play? How do you affect them what, from the outside? Because like, I'm on the outside. Well, I would I suggest Karl Marx them? changed the world more than uh, nearly anyone in the 20th century, but he didn't join a political party. I would suggest J.S. Milt uh, changed the world significantly. Keynes changed the world significantly. Milton Friedman changed the world significantly. None of them were ever elected for a minor party or a major party. Uh, in Australian politics, what more recently, Bob Brown changed the world significantly. Pauline Hanson changed the country significantly. They weren't in a major party. So, but the, the, the olive branch I wanted to give for the Liberals is what role should you play in politics? I think Alex hit the nail on the head. Get involved. Exactly how you get involved isn't the important thing. Get involved. And if you're the sort of person who just gravitates towards major parties, get involved in the major party. Because when the tide turns, when the Overton window shifts, when the political climate, the intellectual climate shifts, you need there to be good people. You need Maggie Thatcher to be in the British Parliament. Yeah. You need Ronald Reagan to be there to get elected. Now, I don't think they could have existed unless the political winds changed. Yeah. But when they change, you need them to be there. So if you're the sort of person who likes major parties, if you like playing the sort of the games of young liberal, young labor, go and join your major party of choice uh, and be there ready for when the winds change. But I would say if you're one of the people who want to actually change the winds, you actually need to change the ideas on the table. Yeah. You need to put new ideas on the table. And that's what minor parties do for the country. They say yeah. things that major parties can't say yet. Yeah, sorry, uh, whoever was um, saying that John was holding up Marx as inspirational, no, he was holding up Marx as influential, uh, not personally inspiring. And also Keynes, I'm not inspired by Keynes. I'm saying that Marx changed the world, not that I wanted him to, yep. just an objective reality that he did change the world. So did Keynes, and again, I'm not a fan of Keynes either, but he did change the world. The problem is that not all changes I actually just want to let Alex go. We, um, yeah. Alex, thank you so much for all the time that you've uh, given us tonight. Final comment from you, and then we'll go to Rob just to comment on, on that thought that was in his head when I interrupted him. Oh, look, I, thanks for having me. Uh, first of all, it's good to be uh, good to be surrounded by like-minded people on this uh, on this night and to review it all. Uh, look, I, I think what we've said, this will all become more clear as the days go on as to what the detail of all of this is. But I think the points that have been made here tonight are really accurate. I think everyone's contributed on pretty much the same course, which is what we need people who share our values to be involved in politics full stop. Just we need them involved. And listen, the other thing about this is not always about party politics. We need them to be involved across the board. We need them on school boards, on local governments. Right. I mean, professional bodies, some of these professional bodies that are, that are, that are holding so much sway now, like the AMA, the law societies, the left has infiltrated all of them. And we need people to yeah. say... I'm not. I'm not. I'm not just a political person, but I'm going to. I'm going to have my view um, heard loud and wide across all of these sorts of bodies. So um, let's get involved because I think the next three years are going to really, really require it. Yeah, Alex. Awesome. Before you go, can you tell me? Um, I'm a small business owner, award-winning small business owner, and my read of the whole COVID pandemic was: look, my whole analysis of this thing has been. I want to feel safe and you can pay for it. So it is a redistributionist mindset, which is a continuation of the dominant morality that we have. I, it's all been cost, no benefit for me. There's been no win. I've had COVID. It was the biggest nothing burger of my life. My business was shut down with no support whatsoever, just so that I can provide emotional uh, comfort to other people who want to feel safe. So... The, from my perspective, the Liberal Party has, has given me platitudes, but the action has been zero. So tell me, you know, I, I want to be involved in politics. And you know what? If the Liberal Party was going to represent my values, I'd even probably sign up and I'd probably be one of the best candidates they ever had. So tell me, why should I do that? What is in the Liberal Party for me? Well, what I'd say to that is that if, uh, you know, here in South Australia, for example, we had another uh, 500, 1,000 of you, um, the party's tech changes very dramatically. And it changes mm, simply by, right. by uh, adding your voice into the machine, pre-selecting people like you or you 
Uh, and by making sure that the various state councils are pulling in the right direction, setting policy from inside the party and, and all those sorts of things. I mean, you know, in many ways, it's not about, um, you know, it's not about uh, what the party is doing now. It's, it's a sum of its parts and politics is a numbers game. So, you know, I think it's time that the party attracted people who share those values again, uh, got them back involved and, uh, and, and brought things back to where they should be. So we, we agree that if you want to see a change, and you know what, I've had this idea for a long time, you will get what you defend. You will get the world and the civilization that you are yep. prepared to put in effort to defend. Yep. And so I guess we both agree, take control of the institutions at some point, at some level, whether it's your local school board, school board, local council, federal, state, politics, whatever it is you can do, even in your family, take responsibility for your values. Yep. Defending your values. Very good way of putting it. I just say, yeah. Before Alex goes as well, thank you for what you're doing in the Senate there. It's, uh, there's very few rays of hopes left, uh, and it's great to have you. Like, I, I, I like to, to rib you a bit about uh, changing them from the inside, but I'm glad you're there. I'm glad you're somewhere. So thank you. Oh, look, thanks, John. And, and look, very nice of you to say that. And, uh, yeah, look, uh, everyone should keep up the good work. We need all the good guys on this fight, and um, uh, you, uh, you four are four of the good guys. So uh, much appreciated. I'll just say too, I, I love everything you've done. Like I was, you know, I'm getting passionate, but it's not at you. Like you've done a fantastic <laughs> job. I really appreciate all the speaking out that you've done, especially in South Australia. It's great. Oh, much appreciated. Thanks for that. Appreciate it. Thank you, Alex. Uh, good night. Thanks, guys. We'll see you soon. Thank you. Cheers. Uh, you've probably got more people lined up, but uh, just letting you know, it does look like Curtin is swinging to the teals now. So it does look like potentially six new teals uh, elected at this election. Wow. Six new teals. So th that alone you would know have the end of the Morrison government. You know what? Uh, uh, maybe I've already said this tonight, but for those people who've just tuned in, um, I celebrate the replacement of a teal liberal with a teal independent. At least we... We've still got a teal, nothing's changed, but at least now we've got somebody who's not pretending. We've got somebody who it's easy to vote against. And hopefully this time, those electorates will pre-select a real liberal so we can replace a teal independent with a real liberal. Well, two, two things on that. One is once these independents get in, they are hard to dislodge uh, often because people just like the idea of having an independent. And once they think they can have one, they often keep them. But one little glimmer of hope here is I wonder the seats these teal independents are representing used to be dyed in the wool blue. They are the sort of seats that are going from blue to green, but That's they're going right. from blue to green because rich people like to virtue signal about how much better they are than the rest of us. Yeah, right. Now, the, when, when those seats are given an option to significantly increase tax, yeah. I don't know if those teal independents will wave through tax increases. I suspect they won't. Mm -hmm. So that, that is money. slightly better than having a green there in terms of the economic yeah. policies they'll back. Yeah. The highest green vote that I had in the electorate of Dawson was around the Early Beach area, where basically what we had was a lot of wealthy retirees from outside the electorate had come to settle. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, it was also the green vote that went to me the strongest in the electorate. So these are wow. wealthy people that have made a lot of money. Again, as I say, I'm probably on the backs of others, but maybe at their own hands. But they like to wash their hands by voting green, but then they vote LNP number two because they don't want to pay much tax. <laughs> That's these you know people. The funniest but thing? They, they, they inhabit northern Sydney. They inhabit these inner city electorates. You know, the funniest thing is that at the polling booth, the pre poll, I made friends with a few of the green people. I, I like them a lot. They're one of my favorite green. I always do too. Yeah. They're, they're lovely yeah, people. That's right. But he said to me, Oh, you're the candidate. What do you do? I said, Mate, I'm a local musician. I said, you're a musician. I said, yeah, what, you know, working for UAP. What are you? Being a Greens volunteer. Well, I'm an ex-investment banker. <laughs> and I trade trade stocks on the share market. Yeah. I said, that's that hilarious. Works. The muse I work for the UAP, the provision and the ex-investment banker work for the Greens. Said, that is funny. Hey, you ever thought that the Greens policies would impede your ability to trade the stock market? Oh, I don't, don't see how. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> but yeah. you're right, that's though. He's got in there. He's survived the cesspool. He's got out with his money, and now he's saving his soul. Yeah, yeah. Look, we're um, getting close to the end of the evening, guys. Um, we have had uh, roughly 2,000 people watching simultaneously across all channels uh, most of the night. Um, there's one person, I think, on one of the supporter groups which had 27 people watching all by itself, and, 
and they thought that that was the limit of the audience for the night. But no, it's been a little bit more than that. Um, obviously, tonight hasn't gone exactly how we wanted, but hopefully this fires our bellies and, and helps us to actually focus that, uh, you know, the, the fight for freedom, the fight for justice, uh, the fight for truth in our culture is not an election cycle. It's a generational warfare. It's a generational battle and we have to be in it. And hopefully now you, we all understand that politics is interested in us, even if we're not interested in politics. I'd like to welcome now to the show uh, one of the uh, one of the uh, crusaders in new media who's uh, doing fantastic work uh, in helping just expose the underbelly of wickedness, uh, especially in leftism and wokeism throughout. And uh, that's uh, Joel Jamal. Joel, welcome to Freedom Speaks. Great to have you on board. Hey, Dave. Thanks for having me on on such short notice. <laughs> no, I was very, very hopeful that we could get you on. And um, and uh, I knew the end of the night would be where it would be possible, if at all. But, uh, yeah, thanks for jumping in. Tell yeah. me, what's, what's your thoughts on um, Freedom Speaks Election Day 2022? Mate, so many thoughts. And I, I've been listening to the panel and a bunch of other panels. Wow, there's good news, there's bad news, there's disastrous news, but it's, it's actually really interesting. So as you know, um, there's a lot of MPs which we're actually quite happy to see go from the Liberal Party. And George Christensen was alluding to that. You've got a lot of the MPs that voted against religious freedom. They're MPs that uh, the Australian Christian lobby, um, the, the Turning Point Australia had a vote cards all preferenced against. So it looks like we're seeing Trent Zimmerman go, Fiona Martin go, Dave Sharma go possibly the seat of Bass as well. This is this is actually really good because it's it's forcing the Liberal Party to work out and reconnect with their Menzies style um, declaration, which is this is who we are, this is what we actually stand for. And I, I'm, I'm actually really happy to see Josh Frydenberg go in Kuyong. I don't I don't want to see a situation where, you know, the Liberal Party limps on under the weak, watered down conservative, you know, which isn't conservative at all, leadership of Josh Frydenberg. Um, and I'm glad to see other members of parliament go as well, like Gladys Liu from the Liberal Party, who has very questionable ties to the to the CCP. And, um, and yeah, so look, there's a lot of good results there. Um, in terms of the lower house, I'm not really surprised that we're seeing a hung parliament and probably Labor forming government. That seems like it's the consensus. Um, I'm here for it. But what I am really upset about is that the Senate vote, I don't feel like uh, us as a freedom community or freedom parties have done, did, it, did enough. Um, the way the Senate's looking like it's panning out, it's looking like it's going to be about 28 seats for the Liberal Party plus one from One Nation. And then you've got uh, the Labor Party, the Greens, and probably Jackie Lambie, um, who, who doesn't really have any balance of power at all, um, essentially passing all the legislation. So we're going to see this country go so far left in the next mm. few years. It's going to be absolutely excellent for content creation. And that's the, only, <laughs> that's the only good thing I can see about it. And this, this is the thing, guys. There were, the world, <laughs> <laughs> there were some, there are some really major lessons which we need to learn from this. All of these teal independents you see across the country, you need to remember that we tried to warn you. There's a lot of people that tried to warn you. Mm -hmm. um, I love, I love the guy that made the um, put the majors last uh, program, Jeff Grimshaw. He's an excellent guy. We go back to the Australian Conservative days, but one of the problems with the system was you were putting the majors at the bottom and the teal independents automatically above them. So every single person that used the put the majors last system in a seat where there was a teal independent running, you helped them get elected. And so what we're seeing right now is a lot of hard lessons happening. Um, and we're seeing a lot of different people stand up and actually take responsibility in their own, own way. But what, what's the good news from all this? We're seeing a lot of new new media actually rise up out of this and grow. Um, the Turning Point Australia audience is, is bordering on 300,000 people in the audience. And we had well over 200,000 downloads of our How to Vote cards, which is really good. And I think that when we move into the next phase of this culture war, because this is a long battle, guys, we're going to see a very interesting situation where we see who are the voices that are defining conservatism. I think we're going to see a situation where the liberal, I know it's too soon to say, but I think Scott Morrison's going to have a leadership challenge. I think that what Alex Hawke, the Hawkers <laughs> and the moderates, what the, what, the, what the moderates have done 
has been absolutely detrimental and they are worse off before it. It looks like Peter Dutton's holding on to his spot. So we might see Peter Dutton as the opposition leader under, and, and I'm, what I'm hoping to see is the Liberal Party absolutely decimating all the lefties, all the moderates in the party that brought the party to this position where they can't win an election. We need to bring it back to its roots when Menzies was around and uh, replicate a win that we saw with Tony Abbott. But uh, I'll shut up now. Just to ask Joel, do you reckon that that's going to happen though? Because as I said to Alex Antic before, here's Simon Birmingham on an ABC panel, um, you know, bemoaning the fact that they've lost all these seats that are well, once blue ribbon seats to deal independence and saying there's a message uh, out of this. I don't think the message that he's thinking of is a message that, oh, we need to stop being like them. I think his message is we need to lean in harder because people are moving away from us because we're not going left enough, because we haven't done enough progressive things, because, uh, well, progressive and inverted commas, because we're not doing enough climate changey stuff. Um, what say you? Well, I think that if they do that, they'll lose. I mean, let's not forget the civil war that's going on in the Liberal Party right now. We saw a situation before the election where the Prime Minister, Dominic Perrottet, as well as um, uh, a former, I think, party leader ended up doing a cap doing captain's picks in something like 15 seats around the country where the rank and file didn't want them, where the state executive for New South Wales didn't want them, but they picked them anyway. So this is, uh, this is a very, this, this, what we're seeing across Sydney, what we're seeing across Australia is perfectly understandable. If you look at the civil war that's been going on, um, where, where does the Liberal Party go from here? I think that the Conservatives and the Liberal Party must be relentless in absolutely cleaning out the left-wing elements of the party. And that, because this is the thing, guys, um, the, the major parties have so entrenched themselves into power to yeah. the point that the Liberal Democrats now have to change their name. They have got more public funding. They've, you know, watch them change the public funding laws of elections. I, I reckon they'll do something on that in the next few years. Can I just, that, that's, a, that's a really nice segue there, pointing out a, the, uh, the, the Liberal Party is requiring us to, to change our name, declaring themselves to have a monopoly on the word liberal, which they don't even believe in. But uh, a little interesting segue there, the, um, the, the seat of Tangney in, in WA, uh, held by uh, Ben Morton, the, the architect of the legislation that knocked out our name. Uh, it looks like it's going uh, to Labour. So uh, I had nothing to do with it, but uh, that's... Uh, <laughs> That, that's disgusting Maybe. legislation, though. Like, and I said so actually in 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 the parliament, or in the, at least behind the scenes, to the people who are pushing it, including Ben Morton. Not only did it knock you guys out, it knocked out the Democratic Labor Party, who'd been around for yonks. I mean, they were the ones that split. Well, just the Labor Party. The, it would have knocked them out, although they ended up getting knocked out because they didn't have enough active members. Uh, yeah. But yeah, it, it would have done the same thing. You, 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 you're quite right. Um, but the. the the point is here. So the Liberal Party's got pulled up in this election for having a green coloured sign mm. that said uh, put Labor last. And uh, there was a court injunction, I forget what seat it was in, about this sign. And they basically said you can't do it because it looks too much like the green posters. Um, well, that's like having a bit each way. We want to stop you guys from calling yourself yeah. Liberal Democrats but we want to have a green poster on a polling booth telling people to put Labor last. Now, uh, I, I I think that both should be allowed, right? Greens don't have a, a monopoly on the colour green <laughs> yes. and the Liberal Party doesn't have a monopoly on what is uh, pretty much an adjective in the word liberal being in liberal Democrats. You guys are libertarian. You believe in classical liberalism. You should have the name. I don't understand. Can I, well, if it's supposed to be truth in advertising, the Liberals would lose the name. But, yeah, uh, that's, that's, right, that's, true, right, that's right. Have I got some, uh, like a pillow or something? Because go, go. Ah, okay. I actually, I actually agree. Pick a new name. Look, at, well, we, we may have to anyway. The, make, the, make look, it like the, the point of whether different. our name is a good name or not is separate to the point of whether a major party you... should be able to pass legislation unprecedented in the world and through history to say that they can claim a monopoly on a word that describes a political philosophy. Look, it, it'd be like if another party that's rocked up the polls with the same colour yellow as UAP. It's like, mate, that's a you can, we, we had yellow for 15, 18 years of our history and you guys showed up with yellow. We didn't try to knock you out of the polls. 
Did you? Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> Joel, what do you reckon? Should the Lib Dems change their name to the Libertarian Dem Democrats? Honestly, I don't know why they're not paying me to run cover for them. The amount of times I had to explain to my audience that they're libertarians. They want their guns back. They're not, they have no affiliation with the Liberal <laughs> Party. Guys, honestly, that was, uh, it was a big headache for me. Like, oh, these somebody, I, can somebody in the crew please pass me my gun? <laughs> I, I take your point there. There may be a good argument for changing name, but that is a separate issue to whether a party should be able to pass unprecedented yeah. legislation to claim a monopoly on a word yeah. they don't even believe in. I mean, it would be one thing if they believed in liberalism. Does anyone honestly think the Liberal Party believes in liberalism? No. The authoritarian Liberal Party. So it's, uh, anyway, that, that's... Look, it's yeah. too late we can day. fix it. The illiberal party. Mm. <laughs> Joel, where, where's, where's Turning Point Australia going to go from here, mate? Uh, oh, we've, we've got... We, we're we're doing, uh, we've got a very big plan. Socialist government. Isn't it just perfect? Three years' worth of content guaranteed? <laughs> Well, we've got we've got some big plans um, going ahead. I can't wait for some national tours to start later on in the year. Big names coming out. Um, we've also got a situation where we're going to be training up people in the universities as well. Um, we've got animation series coming out to help educate the people. Um, I start work again on getting the country back in order in about a week's time. I need a bit of a break. It's been a crazy last few months, very little sleep. And um, we've got a lot of the things we've experienced the last two years didn't happen at a federal <laughs> level. Um, they they happened on a state level. Um, Maybe when you hit your thirties, you'll get your, uh, your your um your stamina back. <laughs> may, 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 maybe we'll see how we go. But I'm 25, so I've got plenty more. I've got plenty more time. But um, we've got we've got Victoria um, state election happening in November, and unlike the federal election, we can't muck it up. It's, it's a make or break for the Victorians. Um, and and so, and, when, and then on top of that, we've got New South Wales um, uh, state election in uh, March next year as well. So the work for Turning Point goes on. We've got a lot of things to do to empower people. Um, a lot of people are probably going to be absolutely disappointed tonight. I think they were given expectations about the lower house, which were completely unrealistic. Um, when I told people that I thought Craig Kelly was going to lose their seat, lose his seat, and he'd been there for 11 years, they were like, no, mm. come on. And I said, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And if Craig Kelly can't win his seat back, how do you think you're going to win your seat back over here, here, and here? Um, it's looking like there's only going to be one senator from all of the freedom parties that gets elected, and that is Pauline Hanson in Queensland. You know, I, w what we're seeing, you know, with the senators is my worst fear. We, I, I kept trying to tell people, if we don't get the balance of power in the Senate, the Greens will get it. Last election in 2019, they got one senator in every state. This election, it looks like they've got four or five. So now they've got 11 senators, and we're going to see a situation where Greens are going to go in some kind of coalition with the Labor government, and there will be no opposition in the Senate. There will be no opposition in um, in the lower house. In fact, it's only going to spur it further. And this it's going to turn this country so far upside down it's going to actually force people to work out who they are. And that's actually not a bad thing. As Jordan Peterson would say, we've got to, at times you do have to do, burn the dead wood off um, to work out what's actually underneath and what is it that survives from that. Um, so look, going forward, we're going to see an interesting situation where people need to adjust their expectations on what's been going on the last 30, 40 years um, in, in being disconnected from politics. People have to reconnect understand what's going on, recognize that if you check out, then that's when the bad guys come in and that's when they start passing laws that you don't agree with. And so, George Christensen, I'm hoping you uh, do run again in the future. I'm hoping you hang around. And um, I'm really hoping that we see a situation where we see greater success in the state elections. Um, but, yeah, work, again, work for me starts again in a week and um, I can't wait to, to get cracking. So, Joel, I mean, there's a, a whole bunch of people. A whole bunch of people. Um, that are saying fraud, election fraud. It's America 2.0. Um, we had so many people turn up and, and vote uh, and protest. You know, we saw all the numbers. There was a million people in Canberra. Um, so surely this has been rigged and there's this massive fraud there. Um, what do you say? Can you hear us, Joel? Nope. Sorry, guys. I can't, I can't actually hear you. Okay. All right. Well, uh, to the panel. Going here. to the fraud question. Do you, do you uh, have you heard anything on the ground? People mumbling about the election being stolen. 
I don't believe it because my experience on the polling booths and pre polls re reflects that Labor Green support. I think we have a cultural issue. Um, once again, I think we are seeing the effects of losing control of the institutions. This comes down to what you think people are. People have to be guided into adulthood, and they're not. The powers that be are stunting them in their growth for fun and profit, and I think I saw that on the booths, and I think we're seeing it politically now that we are, have an infantilised population who don't understand the value of freedom, the value of long-term incentives, it. the value of owning a business, the value of production. They don't understand these things. And we've all throughout all the institutions, they do not adult people into that final stage. I tell you what, I've been witnessing something that's upset me for probably six months, maybe 12 oh, really? months right. on our side, and, and that is a right-wing echo chamber. Absolutely. That there's a whole bunch of harsh realities um, which we are not wanting to face or hear about our own side. Mm -hmm. um, there's a whole bunch of things we want to be true and we're just so fixated on them being true that we can't hear any kind of of adjustment to that two things here. reality two things here one is i want to appreciate i appreciate you bringing jordan peterson onto the panel i i think that added a lot of uh, <laughs> your, your comments remind me a lot of that's oh, a compliment it is it uh, secondly, it was... <laughs> secondly I, I suspect we're, we're going to agree here um there's going to be some mumblings about elections being stolen i don't think that's true i know a lot of people follow american politics closely and they they worry about echoes the Australian political system uh, is fairly robust. We, we have a, a different system. Whatever your thoughts are about the American system, uh, our system is, is fairly robust. Uh, I suspect what we are seeing uh, on the AEC website and on your TVs and watching here, I think this is actually reflecting the reality of how people voted. They might not have voted how we wanted them to, but I, I don't think anyone benefits from us declaring this a fraud. Except in one respect. Our elections could be completely and utterly improved in terms of integrity if there was voter identification. I'm, I'm not against that. I just don't think this election was stolen. That's all. I, I agree with both of those. But you know what there was this year, which I didn't hear announced, was digital rolls. Did I miss that announcement? Uh, but what we had was phone in voting. And I've got to say, look, I don't know how phone in voting works. Uh, and maybe it, uh, I'll caveat so we don't get shadow banned or taken down. Um, maybe it's all secure, but the idea of phone in voting bewilders me, and I'm sus about it. Mm. I, I, I just don't know how it works. Maybe it is all secure, and it's all fine, and everything's above board. But that sort of stuff. I mean, before I resort to a conspiracy theory in any respect, I try to think: what are the incentives? What what is it that's driving people? And if I can see their incentives unfold in front of my face. I don't feel the need to fill in the gaps with something like, okay, there might be voter fraud or anything like that. You know, and I, I see the incentives for the average people lined up that they they go, yep, life's too expensive, vote green. And there's a whole bunch of causality there that they don't see. Without a doubt, though, we still need to improve election integrity in this <coughs> country, and that means voter identification mm. needs to happen. I think we should never, ever accept electronic voting. No, I agree. Said to me sure. that, that should happen. Sure. Electronic should rolls, yes. Electronic voting, uh, no. You, know, uh, you might no. like this funny story. I was actually, there was a Greens poll booth volunteer next to me, and uh, she saw people with their IDs out, and she said, you know what, if you need to show your ID, and uh, my, my polling captain there, is, he remembered it. She said, oh, the Greens is going down the line saying, oh, love, you don't need ID to vote because it's not a fascist country. You see? What? We live in a free country. Oh. So <laughs> if you had to yeah. show your ID to vote in this country, that would be disenfranchising you from your democracy. Well, that would be fascism. We're not a fascist right. country, so you don't need ID to vote. And I said, hmm. how can you justify vaccine up. mandates? Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. Come That's yeah, yeah. not fascism, but an ID to make sure you don't vote twice is fascism. Yeah. But this is where we're at. And that's why I don't believe it was stolen because I've seen these people with my very eyes. Yep. That's where we're at. Joel, have we got you back now? Yeah, I'm here. Sorry about that, guys. AirPods. Oh, that's up. okay. That's why you never buy Apple. Can I just be given this uh, election coverage? Um, just a quick rundown about the situation we're in nationwide. So, Labor's forming government, we all know that. Um, Labor was on 67 seats before this election. They needed 77, so they needed to pick up 10 to be able to uh, 
govern and fill the speaker's chair. Mm. Um, so they needed to pick up 10. It looks like they have picked up 10. Just to run through these quickly for anyone at home. Uh, in South Australia, they picked up Boothby. Uh, in WA, it looks like Tangney, Hasluck, Pierce and Swan. That's four. Uh, in Queensland, they picked up uh, Brisbane from, from the Liberals. Uh, it's another, Evans, moderate uh, season, another moderate another moderate tree. Uh, in Victoria, Higgins and Chisholm. Uh, and in New South Wales, Robertson and Reed. That adds up to, to 10 seats. So if that was the end of the story, they would hit their uh, 77 and go home. That isn't the end of the story. They've also lost two to people from, say, the right of centre. They, they lost Gilmore to, I thought it was a Nat, but apparently it's a Lib. But uh, anyway, Sorry, someone, yes, from, uh, someone from the the wet mod faction of the Libs in New South Wales, but nonetheless a Lib. So they looks like Labor's lost Gilmore to a Lib and Fowler to an Independent, which means Christina Keneally. Looks yeah, like she's yeah, out of... Yeah, uh, and you've missed one. What about uh, Griffith to the Greens? Well, I, that? that's a different one because that's the left losing it to the left. So uh, it, 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 there's two that Labor's oh, lost sorry, to the I right. And then there's two potentially they've lost to the left. One is Griffith, mm -hmm. which I think they've lost to the Greens. Mm -hmm. The other one, uh, and I don't know if anyone's been following this too closely, but Richmond is in play. Yeah. Richmond used to be a NAT yeah. seat. It's now gone into a Labor seat uh, until recently. Now it looks like Labor may be losing it to the Greens. Sorry. So there might be two Labor seats going green. So that would mean Labor picks up 10, loses two back to the right, and loses two back to the further left. So they only pick up six, which gets them to 73 on my account. I, I noticed ABC gives them 72, close enough. Well, 72, the, 73, they'll need a few people. The Australian are giving them 73. So that's, oh, they're very smart people at yeah. the Australian because that's the same number I give them. So that's <laughs> 73. They'll need four more. Uh, and on these numbers, there's potentially four Greens. So yeah. that's it's worrying that they could pass legislation. Anytime they want to pass something stupid, they can do it with the Greens. Um, um, I, I, I sat through uh, a Labor Greens government. I was there for the horrid three years that we had the, uh, the last lockdown government. And I can tell you, it wasn't pretty. I mean, we saw things done that they promised would never be done, like the carbon tax. And... Uh, uh, I reiterate that 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 stark reality that you've just outlined here is going to land the country is going to pay over the next three years without a doubt. It's not going to be a pretty well. It, it, it's not Good certain yet that the, the Greens will have enough to hold the balance of power. It may come down to the teals, uh, which it's will be interesting. Thing. But I, I want to push back on yeah. something that I think Joel was it's saying. The, it's the meme from the office. Well, it's it, the same thing. It, okay. <laughs> Good, good banter for a live audience, but I'm not sure if it is on economic policy. As we were saying before, like the, the, the Greens uh, and the Teals uh, are in lockstep about not understanding how electricity works. But they're not in lockstep about uh, income taxes or company taxes, I think, necessarily. So that, that could be interesting. They may, the Teals may lose their seats if they go to commie. Uh, yeah. So that might be an interesting thing to watch. Here's the thing. What I wonder about the Labor Party, though, is I'm not convinced the Labor Party is as is as dumb as we're all implying here. Uh, they, they are aware that the politics is one in the centre. Just like the Liberals, much to our chagrin, are aware of it, and that's why they keep selling out. Uh, I don't know if, if Labor will rush to embrace the green-teal agenda because they know in three years' time they need to win another election. So I'm, I'm more pessimistic and optimistic than some of the comments here. Where I'm more optimistic is I don't think Albanese is just going to do what the Green Teals want him to. I don't agree that the politics is one in the centre. I just no, no but, okay. I don't. Okay, I think that's what the major parties think. The, the point is, I fair. don't think Albanese is just going to say, "Let me do think. whatever the Greens want," because if he does that, he's guaranteed lost in three years, and I don't think he wants a guaranteed loss in three years. So I don't think uh, the Labor Party is necessarily going to be led around by the nose by the Green Teals. So that's where I'm more optimistic than some on this table. Where I'm more pessimistic is I worry that the coalition in government are always a disappointment, pretty much always a disappointment. Yep. In opposition, they get to pretend they're better than they are by saying, don't worry, I'll be whatever you want me to be. Envisage on me what you think I should be, and I will pretend to be that. Because in opposition, you don't have to follow through. Yep. And so what I worry about is the freedom movement will gravitate back towards believing the bullshit of the Liberal Party, yep. uh, and that might weaken the Liberal, the liberty yeah. movement. And yeah. we need a strong freedom movement. Joel, I personally think that the problem is culture. Um, what I think we're seeing here, uh, and this is something the freedom movement does not want to hear in the echo chamber that so many have constructed, and that is that we are in the overwhelming minority. We, we might have spoken and, and attended in large numbers these protests, and so we should have, and so many people did join us, but there is a long way to go before we are a majority. Uh, mm. before we, we can even form a quota in every state to get a, a freedom senator up. Yeah, um, 
Correct. So I guess uh, projects like the Good Source, Turning Point, um, these are the kind of things I think uh, form an integral part in redeeming the culture over the, the next few years. Um, I know you're a Christian man like myself as well and, and many of the people here on the panel. Um, so what part does redeeming the culture, you know, how are the ways, including new media and religion, uh, Christianity specifically, of course, do you think um, is that part of the solution for for changing what we thought was a majority, what so many of us thought was a, an easy path to at least a crossbench? Um, how do we actually make that a reality now, um, if not the culture? Yeah, you said I was, I'm a Christian and um, my family are, come from a long line of Christians from um, Syria and um, we came to Australia because of the, the Christian values that they had here. Now, the country's changed, um, but unfortunately, we can't just get up and leave. This is our home. And this is the thing. Um, I'm not going anywhere. You know, you can't have a situation where the head of Turning Point Australia runs to America. Um, we have a situation in this country where we can turn this around. We are going to go through a lot of pain, but this is the thing. Sometimes you got to go through it the hard way. Sometimes you can't just tell people. You've got to show them. And look at America. Where are they right now? They're in a situation where they're crying. They're crying for Trump to come back. They're, they're in a situation where they remember how good things were. They remember how cheap petrol was, $2 a gallon. Now it's $5 a gallon. I mean, these are the things that people remember, and they're, they're having a big regrets in making the decision that they did in the big con in 2020. So in Australia, yeah, absolutely. It's channels like uh, The Good Source. It's channels like Discernible, Voice for Victoria, Turning Point Australia, um, and there's a number of other media channels out there. And this is the thing, guys. Um, if there's one thing I've noticed about the analytics for Turning Point, it's I get a lot of the support when I don't need it, and I get a lot, and I don't get a lot of support when I need it. And so um, it's easier for me to um, pitch other organisations. If you're in Queensland, because I know The Good Source has, I think, the majority of your viewership in Queensland. Support the good source. He, you know, if you look at these teal independents, what is it that got them elected? It was the media. It was the mainstream media. Now, if you want to push back, mm -hmm. this is what this is what the story of the last few years has been. The major parties let us down, so we made our own parties. The mainstream media let us down, so we made our own um, ma mainstream media for the alternative audience. The um, the schools let us down, so, so homeschooling started to pick up. You know, we needed solutions in the in the freedom community in terms of lawyers. So we all banded together for group lawsuits. This is the path forward. It, where responsibility has been abdicated, opportunity lurks. That's one of Jordan Peterson's rules in his new book. That is where we need to go forward. And we need to make sure that if there's a problem that we can solve together, we've got to pull our resources together. Um, and, you know, it's really encouraging for me to see this because now it is dead clear for a lot of people that, we have to work together. Like division means death. The um, the whole reason why Turning Point Australia, we came out with the hat of vote cards was because we saw a fundamental problem with the preferencing system in Australia. In New South Wales, in the last federal election, if all the freedom parties at the time preferenced each other efficiently, that was one Senate spot. Well, this election, we also saw a situation where in many um, electorates, there were not pre preferencing between the freedom parties. And that's a major problem. So um, going forward, I'm very excited to see um, the future of alternative media. Make sure you support, and I mean donate to a lot of the alternative media platforms in your state. So if you're in Victoria, donate to Voice for Victoria and Discernible. If you're in Qu Queensland, donate to and support and share, I think, George Christensen's newsletter, which comes out all the time, and also The Good Source. Um, and if you're in New South Wales, I'd love to have your support for Turning Point Australia. We've got some huge plans to go at the heart of the problem being the universities, the factory of all the, the bad ideas and where the long march to the institutions started. And um, and that's that's the way forward, guys. We're getting we're getting better at elections. There's so many people like um, uh, the, the, the guy who ran for the UAP in my area, Julian Fayard, he did a phenomenal job to the point that both major parties were trying to recruit him into their party. And he said, hell no, we are creating some real weapons. And the key here is do not let go. We, we have to keep pushing through this. We've got the Victorian state election in November. We've got the March election for New South Wales in uh, next year. And so um, the fight goes on. We've got a lot of things we need to do. But um, thank you guys for having me on. It's been an absolute blast. And uh, 
I can't wait to see uh, how the results pan out in the coming days. And um, I encourage everyone to take a rest. It's been an intense last few months. Hey, thanks so much, Joel. Really appreciate you coming on and um, and giving us that that insight. You're absolutely right. We we just need to invest in these alternates. Um, well, the, uh, really, their education. That's what the mainstream media does. The lying harlot media. They they educate, um, misinform and disinform um, the the culture that they want to control. And and that's exactly why it's an uphill slog, and it's not going to be. Be quick and overnight so keep up the good work and and thanks for uh, jumping on freedom speaks tonight awesome thanks guys i'll see you guys later thanks dylan um you've got some thoughts on i guess redeeming the culture and and what role um religion um might have to play specific spe uh, yeah l let me leave it at that um what say sure. you yeah, I heard what Joel said there about a wake-up call there in America at the moment to the point that people are longing for Trump to come back. And I see I see a role in that it's been a wake-up call in this country, and I think this election will be that for the church. And I wanted to just turn the gaze to the church for the moment. The church is salt and light in our nation, and what we've had for the last two years has been the biggest assault on individual freedoms and Christian conscience in our nation's history. And by and large, the church was silent during that time. Now, whether it was because they didn't want to get on the wrong side of government, it's funny, the church has a history of being a protesting church. A lot of us are part of a Protestant church. We should be used to protesting against what are uh, overreach, whether it be religious or government or otherwise. And the church largely decided to stay like the Liberal Party, in a sense, on the fence, in the centre. And things like even Scott Morrison's uh, professed Christianity it was never challenged. And so it was a case that whether or not it was because the church didn't want to get out of favour with the government, there was concerns about funding arrangements, whatever was the, the nature of it, uh, our governments went rogue and our churches by and large stayed mute. Now, this is so this is really a prophetic angle I'm bringing in here. I'm part of the freedom community, the freedom movement, and I know for a lot of people in there, they're asking questions. Where was the church at this time? Why didn't they speak up? There's a, there's a passage from... Uh, Jeremiah, it says, if you've raced with men on foot and they've worn you out, how can you compete with horses? If you stumbled in the safe country, how will you manage in the thickets of the Jordan? The church has a chance to redeem itself over the next three years leading up to the next election, and it's to speak. If you thought it was hard to speak with the Morrison LNP government, see how hard it is to speak now with an Albanese Greens government. And I think it's time we did start to address and push back and speak out and call out iniquity, evil, injustice in this land, particularly around what's been in the case of, of myself and many in the churches sitting there. People have lost their jobs. People have suffered. People have been stripped of their livelihood. And they've sat in churches and congregations where it was the elephant in the room and it was not spoken about. I, I truly believe if we had a given voice as a church is called to, as a prophetic voice uh, to these areas, that we would have seen a difference in the political outcome in this nation. Uh, there's a scripture from 2 Chronicles 7, verse 14, that says this, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. And I'm praying and hoping and believing that this, that this nation goes into revival and restoration because that's our only hope. It, it, I'm not looking for Trump to return. I'm looking for the return of Jesus Christ. I 100% um, agree. <clears throat> and again, it comes back to the culture problem. I, I think the reason, uh, and even if you're just a patriot and, and you don't care about religion at all, the fact is that the politicians in our parliaments have basically appointed themselves as God, that they think they are the highest authority in the universe and until they get the humility that is prescribed to them in the Constitution, the people of all these states humbly relying on the blessing of Almighty God, um, an essential ingredient for the rest of the Constitution to work. It's the foundation for the whole thing. It's you're not the ultimate ultimate authority, Jack. There's, there's people, there's God, you are accountable. Um, and, and until there's that kind of humility. But the problem is, the problem is that... Uh, the people are electing politicians that reflect them, and it's the lack of humility in voters themselves. The amount of people that 
rang the police to dob in their neighbours right. for, mm. for having a friend over. Yeah. That kind of arrogance, that kind of, of um, statism, idolatrous statism, was, was absolutely terrible. Let's. Um... Joe, one of the one of the things that hit me the hardest during this lockdowns, and that was when a bunch of Indians, God bless them, were playing backyard cricket. I think it was down in Melbourne or something. I like know that. what you're saying. Just hit me, you know, because I've worked with Indians. I love them, and they love their cricket. You can't take cricket off them. And people dobbed them in for playing backyard cricket on the street. And they weren't even visitors. They were exactly yeah, their own home. Their own home. Yeah. And I thought <laughs> that was. I thought, what's this country come to? And this is the kind of stuff. We needed to be speaking out as churches as well. Just to play reporter about where we're at as a culture with a lot of people because I had a chat with a man just today who was from the Fusion Party. So much in the way that the Greens are watermelons, you know, they talk about environmental causes, but the underlying driver is communism. Mm. A lot of these reason parties will say, <clears throat> well, have you read the science? I've studied physics, blah, 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 so you should have this ideology. And if you know anything about science, it'll give you you know, facts, but not an ideology. As soon as something's telling you how to live your life, it's an ideology, not science. Um, and what he said to me, I, I went up to him and I said, do you believe that vaccine injury is a thing? Or do you think that's a conspiracy? He mm. said, no, I, I agree it's a thing. I said, oh, okay, cool. Well, if you believe it's a thing, don't you think it should be a choice? No, I don't think it should be a choice. And um, and I said, well, well, how can you do that? You know, he said, well, we, we do things every day that carry a risk such as drive a car. I said, well, we're not forced to have it. And he said to me, look, at the, at the core of it, I take a risk on my life, life every time I walk outside my home. Yeah. And right. so the problem is that a lot of people feel that life carries an inherent risk. Like they are oppressed by nature. The laws of nature it, it carry a risk to them and their safety. So they're happy to oppress you in return. How do you appeal to that? How do you get over that? What can you do to sell freedom to somebody like that who thinks that your freedom is going to carry a mortal risk to their life? Yep. I don't have the answer to that. I've tried. So what I said to Green voters on the fifth, they said, what do you want freedom? I said, look, I'll tell you what. This is my little three-line three, three line spiel for you. If another person, we all want something out of somebody else. We all want something out of other people. How do we get what we want? Can we get what we want? in a positive way or a negative way? Can we get what we want in a win-win or at someone else's expense? If the other person that you want something out of is a free, sovereign individual, if you can't bully, abuse, shame, lock down the other person because they are free, sovereign individual with rights, what do you have left? The only thing you have left is cooperation. And it just so happens that the science of human behaviour is that cooperation is the most beneficial thing through time. <clears throat> That's the most profitable, wealth-creating happiness creating way that human beings can interact through time so this is my little spiel for people on the ground freedom and self-determination creates cooperation which creates prosperity wealth and happiness so what i'm trying to do there is look for a an incentive structure a reason why people should care about freedom and i think anyone who's interested in freedom needs to ask themselves that question why should somebody buy what you're selling Figure that out and you're going to have power. Sounds like you should be a libertarian. <laughs> well, I, I, I mean, I'm a libertarian until I'm not. <laughs> that is so true for so many parties out there. Let's, <laughs> let's, let's get to the data. Let's wrap up tonight. Um, we've been going for five hours now. Uh, we've had uh, roughly 2,000 viewers most of the night. We're down to a little bit less than 1,000 now. So uh, I think the writing is on the wall. Mm. Uh, many, many tackle your fasten. You're being weighed and found wanting, and your kingdom's being brought to an end. Well, wow. sorry, it's quoting scripture. Babylon. Yeah, yeah, I, I, Babylon I, I, is falling. <laughs> um, let's get to the numbers of that fall. Well, I, I, I ran everyone through the the house situation before. It looks like a minority Labor government with enough greens and teals to get them what they want. Not sure whether they'll have enough greens, but uh, enough teals certainly. Uh, looking through the Senate here, just running the numbers. Uh, firstly, the it has ended up being a bit more disappointing than I was hoping for for the freedom-friendly minor parties. Yeah. It's around 10% uh, on average uh, across uh, across all the states. So 10.2 in New South Wales, 15 uh, in Queensland where, where Pauline exists, but about about 10 in Victoria, South Australia, 8 in Tassie. Uh, so that, that's not pretty. Is 10, did you say, sorry? 10% total in, in most of the states except Queensland. No, but you just said 15 in Queensland and then what? It was uh, 10 in Victoria, 10 in that, SA. That, that's, that's, really, that's a good combination. That, that, I'm okay, combining okay, UAP, sorry. One Nation and Lib Dems when I do that uh, on the assumption that uh, people hopefully will follow 
That seems like a, a right amount to me. That seems like yeah, that, that, you're counting on people following. You. Yeah, it's, I, I think it when you factor in seat. when you factor in uh, the slippage of votes, yeah. it's not clear that that's actually going to get a senator up right. in those states. No, so fifteen percent in Queensland. I guess I'm hearkening back to the comments about fraud. I mean, if we got ten percent of the vote, that seems about how many people were out protesting. Maybe. Yeah. Well. Yeah. I, I, I don't think there was fraud, but I'm just putting that aside here. No, I was that's, hoping, what, that's what I'm saying. I was hoping there would be clearly enough here to get a freedom senator up in each state. It's not clear that that's going to be the case. Mm. Uh, Queensland, Pauline's actually down to, and I'm surprised by this, uh, 8%. So the wow. One Nation uh, vote in Queensland is now down to 8%. So the numbers early on obviously were more rural seats. We knew that. Uh, but as, it, uh, as the city seats came in, the numbers dropped uh, quicker than I expected. The, the One Nation vote then, the, the next best one is 4.5 in New South Wales, Mark Latham's One Nation, um, uh, 4.3 in South Australia, which gives you gives you a shot. But th those aren't really numbers that normally get you a Senate spot under yep. the Turnbull Greens voting system. Uh, the the best performance for, for the UAP is 4.8% for Clive in Queensland, which still gives him a theoretical shot uh, Here's at the spot there. From the web. Sorry. Siri. Thank you. Thank you, Siri. <laughs> right. um, and the, the best spot for the Lib Dems has been Victoria David Limbrick at 2.5%. Uh, again, not what we were hoping for. You, you put these numbers together, if the preferences flow tightly enough, it could happen. But uh, that, that's been a bit disappointing. The second disappointing thing to consider here is the vote for the Greens have come in consistently uh, at what will get them a quota. So it looks now very likely the Greens will pick up six senators at this election, which will take them to 12 senators. Uh, in total, that won't necessarily get them balance of power. They may still need uh, Pocock from the ACT, the, the Teal Senator. They may still need Lambie, Labor to pass law. But still, 12 Greens will actually make Greens the biggest uh, balance of power party in the Senate ever. That's bigger than the Democrats ever were. That's bigger than the DLP ever was back in the 60s and 70s. Different system back then, but still. Uh, so that is, it's been a very good night for the Greens, potentially picking up three or four total in the lower house and 12 in the Senate. Uh, our parliament is becoming more green uh, with these numbers. Another interesting thing to note here is, is um, the Cannabis Party has become a force, uh, especially in Queensland. 6.7% right? of the vote in Queensland means that cannabis is actually in the running just as much as, as Clive or Campbell could have been. Wow. Uh, now, I don't think they'll make it over the line, but if you look at the total seat, the, the total averages that I think the best way to... How did you not recruit them to the Lib Dems? I was going to say that. <laughs> Well, they don't necessarily believe, like as you were saying before, uh, a lot of people are a libertarian up until the point they're not. Many people believe in freedom for exactly the thing that they care about right now, but not freedom for other people if it's inconvenient for them. So, um, I'll and I think I'm, I'm winding you up a little bit that's there. Not me at all. I'm but winding you, you up. Want, if you want to have the libertarian discussion, <laughs> I'll be there anytime. Put I'm, down I'm, the bottle. <laughs> anytime. Uh, get the man a drink. All right. I, I'm winding you up a little bit, but I think with the That's cannabis okay. party, um, they don't necessarily believe in freedom across the board, so they wouldn't necessarily want to vote for us. But nonetheless, just looking at the size of parties here, and I think the best way to look at the size of parties is the Senate national vote across the board. Uh, we've got Liberal, Labor, Greens. Greens, 13.3%. That's a crazy high number for them. One Nation, the fourth biggest party in the country now at 4.7%. Cannabis, the fifth biggest party in the country at 3.9%. Then your mob at 3.8%, us at 2.2%. So that's the, the top seven. Uh, and that top seven has cannabis in at five, which is an interesting thing to note. So it'll be interesting to see what they do with that. But uh, that's a growing party. Why not? Probably go up and smoke. George, <laughs> oh jeez, um, it's too late. It's too uh, late. Well, we, we are not staying up till midnight. George, why don't you wrap us up? Final thought for the night. It hasn't been a good night, that's for sure. I think that we are in for trouble over the next three years. But look, if we were looking at a thumping re-election victory for Scomo, I would have said that, that wasn't a good result either. Um, so this is the issue, folks. We can't rely on politicians to fix the situation. They're only going to make it worse. So I've got five bits of advice. This is my five bits of advice. It is a bit Jordan Peterson-y. It's one, let's get our own lives in order if we want to live free of the lie. We need mm. to spread the truth to counter the lie. So that means uh, spreading alternative media rather than the mainstream fake news. Ridicule the elites. We want to perpetuate the lie, and that means a lot of memes. 
Uh, I think one thing that the Conservatives and Libertarians and the right are good at is uh, making fun of those in power, and we should continue that because it's one of the best forms of, of attack. Yep. You need to join a movement that fosters a culture of truth within society that is dominated by the lie. And we also need to keep up that peaceful action that we've seen over the course of the last two years so that as <clears throat> we coalesce as many people as possible who have not succumbed to the lie. So that's what I would say. Um, that's what we need to be doing over the next three years because uh, we're going to see the country sink further and further into the mire, sadly. I will just say once again, to repeat, you will get the society that you are prepared to act to defend. Mm. Yep. Not to talk to defend, not to share, like, subscribe to defend, that you are prepared to act to defend. Yeah. And you need to take responsibility for your society and the institutions within it if you want to change the culture because politics is downstream. From you culture. really do. And this is the big thing is we have to we have to focus we have to focus each other and encourage each other to not quit now for for the next three years we've got victorian we've got state elections coming up this fight is never going to stop this is a generational thing and we absolutely have to start thinking about this as just a, a successive amount of repeated actions necessary over the course of our lifetime to hand our children and grandchildren something worth them fighting for um, and wanting to be here uh, and, and you know what, let me just finish with this encouragement, guys. Don't despair. Don't give up. Um, this is just a valley in a very long journey. And, yeah, there might be shadows right now and you might be despairing. Don't, don't be like the Hillary Clinton people just tearing sackcloth and ashes and needing puppies at university before you can cope <laughs> with getting it. Look, the sun's going to rise, the grass is going to grow, the birds are going to sing, the rain's going to fall, it's going to be okay. Um, yes, it's going to be a really tough couple of years for the nation and we want better for our nation. I'm not pretending that it's all going to be a bit of roses, but it's not the end of the world. Uh, we must keep a bigger vision of what's going on here. And, and that is that we've been through Labor governments before, bad ones and, and really evil times in human history. We are blessed to live in incredibly peaceful, flourishing times like world history has never seen. But really dark times in world history brought us to this. Um, and maybe things need to get a little bit worse before they can get better in, in the cycles of history that do go on. So don't despair. Be part of the solution, not part of the problem. Um, and my personal tip is repent. <laughs> put, put God at the top and, um, and uh, things will probably become rightly ordered when that becomes a majority consensus. You, you don't want to let me finish. I don't. Oh, well, I want to let I want to let Charles Finney finish. Here we uh, go. Charles Finney's a good Charles guy. Charles Finney, uh, the nineteenth-century revivalist and major contributor to America's Second Great Awakening. This is a message for the church. He said, "If there is a decay of conscience, the pulpit is responsible for it. If the public press lacks moral discernment, the pulpit is responsible for it. If the church is degenerate and worldly, the pulpit is responsible for it." If the world loses its interest in Christianity, the pulpit is responsible for it. If Satan rules in our halls of legislation, the pulpit is responsible for it. If our politics become so corrupt that the very foundations of our government are ready to fall away, the pulpit is responsible for it. End quote. Mm. What, what do you guys, what do you guys think about peaceful separation as a political solution? Peaceful. Uh, let, let's wrap up the show. Um, <laughs> but there Come is on, there is on one <laughs> there is one headline that we want to do. Um, just so go for it, George. John pointed it out to me, so he should be the one to break it. Well, I just uh, the, the news is coming in here saying Morrison has stepped down. I think we all knew this was going to happen. He's conceded defeat. The Liberals have lost government. The most obvious thing that happens next is that the Liberal leader steps down as leader of the Liberal Party. He has stepped down. Um, so with Frydenberg gone, I can only assume that uh, Peter Dutton is, is next in line, but it'll be interesting to see. <laughs> the good news, particularly, has lost the seat of power. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. So we don't have to put up with her uh, trying to stop our freedom of speech in the future. Yep. All right. Um, 
that's it. That's it for this evening. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, I'd like to thank Dylan Oakley, Freedom Has a Voice, georgechristensen.com.au. Uh, somebody asked, are you Jewish? No, that's not a orthodox <laughs> beard. <laughs> um, that's, uh, this, yeah. Uh, and uh, John Humphreys and Rob McMullen, thank you so much for uh, all your energy tonight. Thank you very much to the volunteers on cameras and switching. Um, there's actually been days of preparation getting this um, sort of you tonight. So we've, we had uh, four cameras in the studio and, um, yeah, just there's so much uh, work and team that have gone on. A huge thank you to the Good Source um, supporters, people who put their hand in their pocket for five, ten, twenty dollars a month, or in some a fair bit more. Um, really, really appreciate you. You guys make this happen and possible, and uh, that's super great. Um, we are a nationwide uh, new media source with roughly the same audience size in most capital cities. Um, we try to look. We're based in Queensland, but you have to be based somewhere. Um, but as you saw, we've crossed all around the nation today, uh, South Australia and Western Australia. Uh, we're, we're doing lots. So please support the new media. This is the way um, to just be out there. And guys, let's try to be intellectually honest and and maybe um, maybe everything we believe is not 100% true. And that's what we want a media to do, not to tell us what we already believe, but to tell us the truth. Um, and open minds are learning. Uh, so, yeah, that's it for this episode of uh, election. Next election is the Victorian election, and we'll uh, make sure to bring you some really great coverage on that. Thanks for your time tonight, and uh, have a great week, no matter the result in the newspapers tomorrow. Today, we need a special kind of courage, not the kind needed in battle, but a kind which makes us stand up for everything that we know is right, everything that is true and honest. We need the kind of courage that can withstand the subtle corruption of the cynics, so that we can show the world that we are not afraid of the future.